Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us here in the new building of the National Museum and also online. Let me welcome you to the Conference on the Nature Restoration Law 2022. There is a thoroughly prepared program ahead of us, starting with a warm welcome, introduction keynote speeches, and then four different panels, each focused on a different substantial topic and consisting of both prepared presentation and also a discussion. My name is Eliška Kolomaznikova and I'm a t former TV reporter focused mainly on science and environment, now engaged in nature conservation. I'm going to guide you through today's packed program, but I'm not going to be alone. Beside me is my colleague for today, Jan Dušek, a conservationist focused mainly in ecology, impact assessment, and the implementation of EU legislation in European countries. Honzo, floor is yours. Many thanks and good morning. Uh, this conference is organized and hosted by uh, the Czech Society for Ornithology, uh, the leading Czech conservation NGO, and by WWF Central and Eastern Europe, a uh, major influential regional NGO. And this is also co-organized by the National Museum. Today's conference is uh, under the auspices of the Minister of Environment, Mrs. Anna Hubáčková, and the Minister of European Affairs of the Czech Republic, Mr. Mikuláš Beck. We must express our thanks to partners of the conference, uh, which are the Ministry of the Environment of the Czech Republic, uh, the BirdLife International, and the WWF European Policy Office, and we want to also uh, give many thanks for the financial support to companies Refugium and Českomoravský Štěrk. And last but not least, many thanks to each and every one of you for coming to the conference on EU nature uh, restoration law today. And now I would to li like to ask three important personalities from among the partners and organizers of the conference to make an opening statement. The first, please, Eva Wolfova, Deputy Minister of Environment of the Czech Republic. Please. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, let me start this conference with greetings from our minister, Anna Hubáčková, who is today presenting uh, restoration law in our upper chamber of our parliament. And with uh, many thanks to uh, all organizers and to everybody in this room who is paying attention to restoration law, which is definitely a very important and ambitious uh, topic. Uh, probably all of you understand the paradigmatic shift from nature protection to nature restoration and uh, that we need much more to focus outside protected areas to extensive use of landscape and to changes in agriculture and forestry, which nature restoration law addresses. Uh, as well, let me mention the, the need of uh, together address climate and uh, biodiversity crisis and uh, to solve them together as two parts of the same coin, which is unsustainability. Um, I think we can present restoration of nature as very important climatic uh, steps to adapt our landscapes to, uh, landscape to uh, climate change. Uh, thank you to paying this attention and uh, we, will, uh, we are running the presidency and uh, because nature Res restoration law was published this June, 22nd of June. So our presidency started just shortly after that. And from July, we run negotiations and we pay big attention to this topic. My colleagues will introduce it later to more detail. And maybe Czech Republic was very 
uh, good in implementation of Natura 2000 and I hope we can continue in this best practice and start to be a leader also in nature restoration. Thank you and have a nice and fruitful day of this conference. Thank you very much. Thank you for these very important words for the beginning. And now let me to invite Mr. Ivo Macek, the director of Natural History Museum of National Museum. So please. So uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's an honor for me to be here and to welcome you here in uh, the National Museum, uh, which is not coincidence that the National Museum is one of the partners of this conference. Uh, maybe one of you noticed that we are not sitting right now in the, in the ordinary conference room. Uh, actually, this room used to be the parliament. And uh, 30 years ago, the members of the parliament voted for the splitting Czechoslovakia into two different countries, Czech and Slovakia Republic. So you can really touch and feel the history from these walls. And I'm really glad that uh, the, the National Museum is the partner, as I said before, because I think the role of the museums in the, in the way of the protection of nature is significant. I'm also very sad sometimes when we are uh, reading some and hearing some uh, talkings about the biodiversity protection and so on, that sometimes the most of the people are, uh, or the museums are forgotten, I must say. And if we compare that around the, around the world, in the, the, all the nature history museum is stored more than 1.5 billion specimens, which were being collected for two more centuries, I have to say. And all the specimens have each uh, e, uh, their uh, information and metadata which can be used. And if you extract the data, you can see some trends according to the, the global warming and uh, biodiversity protection as well. So I would be very, it's my wish that if uh, the role of the museum will be much more significant in the questions about the biodiversity protections. Because unfortunately, the museums are the the last environment that where you can find the most of the known uh, animal species. And unfortunately, most of the extinct uh, animals are found only in the museums. But the museums, and especially the nature history museums, are not only the buildings for the visitors, but it has some uh, scientific value as well. So I think this uh, conference, it belongs to this place and to this room, because as I said before, uh, the 30 years ago, we changed the history, our history. And I think today we can start changing uh, our future. So, uh, once again, welcome here, feel as the guest here, and enjoy your stay here in the museum and here in the Brock. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for this very nice framework in words. And uh, let me invite the third opening speaker, and it's Andreas Beckmann, the regional CEO of WWF Central in Eastern Europe. Andreas, please. Four pictures that I'd like to use, so if we could just get those going. In a moment, you'll see uh, a picture of a beluga sturgeon. Beluga sturgeon migrated, they used to migrate from the Black Sea all the way up the Danube to as far as Ulm in Germany. Hundreds, thousands of fishermen lived off of these creatures. Um, they can reach up to seven meters in length. Uh, no longer. Today, belugas can't make it past the Iron Gates Dam between Romania and Serbia, and of course, there's another 60 dams after that. Due to fishing, poaching, but also the loss of habitats, wetlands, their numbers have plummeted. Worldwide, they are now the most threatened group of species. The ship sturgeon recently was, was confirmed extinct in the Danube, and therefore also in the European Union. This is a species protected under the Habitats Directive, Habitats Directive that is now lost. 
These prehistoric fish, they survived the age of the dinosaurs, but now they teeter on the brink of extinction. Not yet. They present, I think, a potent symbol for our situation. Tomorrow, WWF will release its every two-year health check of the planet, the Living Planet Report. I can't tell you what it will say, but spoiler check, it's not good, and it's not so much different than what we heard two years ago in 2020, which said that in the last 20, 50 years, we have lost 68% of wildlife populations on this planet. This is a crisis, Code Red. We're facing not only a climate crisis, but also a nature crisis, and indeed the two are interrelated, interlinked. Nature, the biosphere reserve, is the very foundation for our welfare, our health, our well-being. Last one. To put it simply, you can't do business, let alone flourish on a dead planet. At stake is the very future of our civilization. So we must urgently not only hold on to what nature we have, but also restore whatever nature that we can. There is no time to wait for scientific data. More evidence has now called for by the state administrations of a number of member states. Significant change must be achieved within this decade. We'll hear today from scientists that we have the data that we need to act. We know what needs to be done. What we need is uh, most is political will uh, to start moving. The EU has made an important commitment within the Green Deal to tackle climate change and na nature loss. And core to achieving these ambitions is the EU law on nature, nature restoration. Now, these are very uncertain times. And they frame the arguments against the nature restoration law. We need to focus on food security, the war in Ukraine, the energy crisis. We don't have the luxury of focusing on nature restoration. Those are valid arguments. They're real challenges facing us and undoubtedly need to be faced. Nevertheless, those challenges cannot distract us from addressing the much bigger civilizational challenges that confront us. We must address climate change and we must address nature loss. Not addressing them will only increase the challenges that we face. Today's conference is an opportunity to bring together a range of perspectives from participants, political decision makers, scientists, practitioners from across the EU on the EU nature restoration law and its implementation. Is it fit for purpose? Are the targets relevant, realistic, achievable? Let's discuss not only the proposal itself, but also its implementation, what will make it successful. Most broadly and importantly, how can it help to create a new paradigm to restore our relationship to nature? How can it help us to live and to work with nature rather than against it? We have examples that this is possible, that by working together, it is possible to pull back from the brink that it can be done. WF has been involved in restoring river and wetland habitats at over 30 sites across the Danube Basin. We've been working with scientists, state authorities, including the Czech Agency for Nature Conservation, the Agentur Vrani Přírody, as well as spatial planners, transportation authorities, to identify and to secure, and where necessary, and possible restore critical ecological corridors. The one before. In cooperation with rewilding and with EU funding, we've been returning European bison to the wilds of southwestern Romania. Our plans to restore or to return bison to the Chernobyl area, the Chernobyl Biosphere Reserve in Ukraine, unfortunately have been frustrated by the war. But this summer, we still managed to remove a small dam in the Carpathian Mountains of Ukraine that freed 25 kilometers of river. Even during a war, nature restoration is possible. A hundred years ago, now we have the right slide, European bison were on the brink of extinction. There were about 50 individuals in the 1920s, all in captivity. Today, thanks to concerted conservation efforts across Europe and beyond, they number something around 6,000, including many in the wild and they've been removed from the list of endangered species. Can the EU nature restoration law help us achieve the same for beluga sturgeon as for the European bison? 
How? That is what we're here to discuss today. On behalf of the organizers of this event, the Czeska Społeczność Onotologicka, the Czech Society for Onotology, uh, BirdLife Europe, the WF European Policy Office, my own organization, WF Central and Eastern Europe, and our fledgling Czech program, I'd like to welcome you here and also thank those who have made this conference possible, including the Czech Ministry of Environment, the Czech Ministry of Fire Foreign Affairs, the National Museum, for kindly hosting the conference in the premises, but also Refugium and Cesko Moravsky uh, Sterk as sponsors of the event. I'm looking forward to discussing important issues with you today and during tomorrow's field trip, hopefully as well. The stakes could not be higher, life itself. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you also for opening questions to this conference and which will be very important for following following sections of the conference now i give the floor back to Eliška, please so that was the welcome it wouldn't be a great conference without some technical difficulties i think we all needed a little adrenaline rush <laughs> And now let's jump into the next part, the keynote, the introduction keynote speeches. Ahead of us is a series of three presentations introducing you to the topic, delivered to you by people with the most relevant insight and also people who have played a substantial role in the process of putting together the nature restoration law proposal. The first one to address you is Virginius Sinkevicius, the EU's Commissioner for Environment, Oceans and Fisheries. He's going to talk to you through a recorded video message as he could not be here with us today. So I invite you to enjoy. Ladies and gentlemen, your conference on nature restoration comes at the perfect time. The proposal for a new nature restoration law, which the Commission adopted this summer, is the first ever legislation that explicitly targets the restoration of Europe's nature. A huge milestone. It is now being discussed by the European Parliament and the Member States, and it will be vital to maintain the level of ambition during these interinstitutional negotiations. Your discussions in Prague are therefore an excellent opportunity to highlight the benefits of nature restoration and make sure the topic remains high on the political agenda. Our generation has two main defining tasks. We need to tackle climate change and we need to repair the damage we have done to the environment. With the nature restoration law, we are addressing both of these issues. One priority is restoring degraded ecosystem with a high potential for drawing down a strong storing and storing carbon. Another is protecting ecosystems that prevent and reduce the impact of natural disasters. And the new law will also build up our resilience by reducing the risk to food security. Today you will be looking at the details of our proposal. At the overarching restoration objective and the targets and obligations for specific ecosystems that need to be, that needs to be restored. The positive effects will be wide-ranging for the good health of forests, wetlands and peatlands, farmland ecosystems on the coast and at sea, and in cities as well, and for our own human health and well-being, as ecosystems supply so many things we need every day, from food and fresh water to shelter and clean air. And I should, of course, not forget to mention their significant contribution to our carbon reduction. Ladies and gentlemen, we are living in unprecedented times. The war in Ukraine, the unsustainable, unstable geopolitical situation, the sharp uh, increase of energy prices and rising inflation rates are challenges we have to face. So I hear those who are asking if in light of the current context, tackling climate change or repairing the damage done to nature should still remain our priorities. Well, I truly believe that the current crisis is not a reason to abandon these priorities. But on the contrary, to reconfirm our commitment to fully implement the Green Deal, including its environmental pillar. When commodity prices are raising and food security becomes a global concern, it's time to address our vulnerabilities. Time to accelerate the transition towards uh, food and energy systems that are sustainable and resilient. When you restore an agro-ecosystem, the effects on food productivity are positive. 
in the long term. Restoring nature is nothing less than an insurance policy. It secures our long-term sustainability and strengthens our resistance to external shocks. Czechia, for example, has already felt the consequences of climate change. The bug beetle in, in, in infestation is a case of point. Hot, dry weather. And we can trees made it easy for the beetle to reproduce. By restoring our forests, making them more diverse and resilient, we strengthen their resistance to climate change. In every corner of this continent, there is everything to gain. From protecting and restoring nature to make it happen, we need to work together. So I hope I can count on your ongoing strong support to make sure we maintain the ambition of our proposal and finalize interinstitutional neg negotiations before the end of the European Parliament's term in the middle of 2024. Best of luck with the conference today, and I wish you many fruitful discussions and encouraging results. Thank you. Virginia Sinkovic, I would thank him, but he would probably not appreciate it right now. The next one to address you will be Ladislav Mikko, who I hereby invite to join me on the stage. Ladislav Mikko is the advisor of the Czech Minister of Environment and a special envoy of the Czech Government for Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, and I will not start with saying ladies and gentlemen, but let me or allow me to say uh, good morning uh, to friends and colleagues. Because I think this conference is a conference of those uh, who actually are not in that audience which we need to convince about the content, but rather part of that audience which is thinking about how to convince and push the other people in our society to follow. Uh, we are going to discuss uh, the nature restoration and nature restoration law as a main theme, but allow me to put it slightly into broader context. And I have to say that it was not easy for me to decide with uh, which uh, hat I will be here because I may easily say I am representing uh, the Czech Presidency. I may easily say I am representing European Commission. I may easily say I am representing uh, WWF. I am not representing Ornithological Society, I'm sorry. Uh, nevertheless, I am a member of the Entomological Society and Arachnological Society. And in relation to nature restoration, I'm quite sure that all three societies will have a very similar, very similar views and understanding about the needs. Uh, we are now uh, in a very particular situation in Europe and in the world. Uh, it was already mentioned, uh, we are facing the crises which are in a way unprecedented. Uh, obviously, that could be said almost about any crisis which is coming, that it is unprecedented. Nevertheless, um, we are in the world where things which we, which we were thinking will never happen again are happening, like war in Europe, the large and, and, and aggressive uh, uh, war in Ukraine. We are in the world where we almost stopped uh, plenty of activities because of the two years long and still pending pandemia, which most probably has some uh, links to what we are going to discuss, which is uh, biodiversity crisis. Um, so uh, it is clear uh, that uh, coming in this time with uh, something what will be really demanding uh, in terms of efforts, capacity, finance, is not a thing which will be easy. Uh, and uh, coming from Czech Republic uh, and, and just very recent yesterday's uh, quote, of uh, our president, uh, there is a lot of people which believe that there is no time now for uh, addressing the environmental challenges because we have to first address other things. And I think that the discussion we will have should show that actually what we face today 
has roots in what we have to address, which is actually the environmental crisis. And I think this is a very crucial thing, and I will speak about it uh, still a bit more. So uh, obviously now for a while, this tie is the Czech presidency. Uh, I would like to mention that Czech presidency is uh, very well aware about the complexity of the problem. And if you look on the program of Czech presidency, you will see one probably uh, interesting element, which is a part of progressing with all the files which we simply have to progress, which, which, which are in pipeline, which need to be discussed in uh, council, in trialogues. Uh, <clears throat> we are trying as a presidency make one clear, uh, uh, one thing clear, which is the individual files, be it climate change mitigation, climate change adaptation, uh, be it uh, biodiversity, cannot be solved in parallel lines without interlinkages. We try to show that uh, one solution in one area will influence the solution in the other area, and it is on us to decide and to proceed in a way which will be mutually supportive rather than causing uh, mutually problems or unwanted or so-called perverse effects, which we have seen and witnessed in the past. So it is not a theoretical construction. We do very well uh, that some efforts which have been directed with a good intention to the uh, implementation in the policy area at the end actually ended up with a problem. Uh, you probably know that I was working uh, four years as a representative of European Commission in Slovakia, and the example which I learned there is an example which explicitly shows what could be a problem uh, when we were discussing about the sustainable sources of energy. The biomass came as one of the obvious solutions, and with all support, we ended up by cutting protected forest in East Slovakia in order to generate uh, energy. Uh, certainly not something with, and I, I think which, which anyone here in this room will, 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 will support. So this is what we need to avoid, and therefore also uh, within the Czech presidency, uh, it was a special effort to show up that the things must be addressed together and in cross links. Uh, I will remind you about uh, the flagship conference of the Czech presidency, which already happened, and, uh, which was about building resilient landscapes, climate resilient landscapes. But that was a conference which was looking on very different aspects of that. So it was not only climate change adaptation as such, but it was also the implementation of existing legislation, like Natura 2000, like Water Framework, but also implementation or adopting a new elements. Nature restoration law is one of very important ones, but also a new forestry strategy, a new legislation on soil. I have to mention it, I'm sorry, those who know me will know that I am a soil biologist and ecologist, and I'm absolutely convinced that if we don't address, there is not many things which are so horizontally present everywhere uh, compared to soil, right? There is water as soil which is everywhere. And we need to address it. <clears throat> and we were discussing that and ended up with, uh, I think, very significant, important, uh, a clear document which is called Prague Appeal, and I invite all of you to have a look on the web page of the Czech Presidency and the conference itself because uh, the Prague Appeal is basically summarizing two things, important things. And his call to the policy makers, to the decision makers, to the opinion leaders in the Europe and in the world, and basically says, look on what is working and multiply that. And look on what is a barrier and try to get barriers away in order to address the problems uh, of our landscapes at the landscape scale. And I think that what will be discussed on this conference will be basically exactly the same. Now, uh, I always see a person, you know, I, when I was speaking about the conference, I see Michal here, who was one of the godfathers, and then I see another one somewhere there, 
which is a person which will be known to all of you as one of the fathers of uh, Natura 2000, not only in Czech Republic, but also in Slovakia and in some other uh, countries. Uh, I think there is, yeah, Peter Roth. Uh, why I'm speaking about that? Because uh, European Union, and I think also Czech Republic and Central Europe and, and whenever in, in Europe we can say we are really proud on having Natura 2000 as a tool and actually step by step implement it. It is something what is uh, unique in terms of the global perspective. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> we could be rightly proud, but also when we look on the assessments of the uh, biodiversity strategies of the past and the, the way of implementation of Natura 2000, the, the results are a kind of encouraging, but also sometimes uh, uh, disappointing at the same time. The Natura is clearly useful, it's bringing some clearly positive results, but at the same time, when we look on this special table with the arrows, you know, which should show that the things are getting better and getting to the green, green color, there is not much of green squares in that table. And I don't think it's a mistake of the approach. I think it is partly a mistake of the implementation, and partly it is because we still miss an important instrument, which is actually acting with Natura 2000 in the context of the overall landscape, which is to work uh, at the landscape scale in terms of looking on it as a functional entities. And this is actually why the subject of our conference on restoration law uh, is looking on. It is uh, the issue of restoration of the functions in our landscapes, taking into account all what we already have, protected areas and all the system, Natura 2000, but also addressing the other processes which are so important. And it is interesting how much it is important for both biodiversity and the climate change agenda. When we speak about the functional ecosystems, be it the farmland, be it the forested land, which will be the two major parts of what we are going to discuss, it is all about the carbon sequestration. It is all about the water regime. It is all about the support to biodiversity. So I think that nature restoration law, as it came, is something what I see similarly groundbreaking as it was the uh, bird and habitat directives in the third quarter of the last century. It looks quite strange, right? It's already a long time, 50 years. But it is something what can be the game changer if, and I would say only if, it is first accepted and second properly implemented. And this is the thing which we will have, and I'm coming almost to the end of my contribution, this is the thing which we will have to get through in the time when there is many reasons to say, let's wait a bit. Uh, we have no time to wait. We have our goals, but we don't do it actually, and this is something very important, because I very often hear the comments, uh, okay, we have a target, we have to do it. Actually, this is not the reason. We have to do it because we need it in order to keep our planet, our ecosystems functioning in a way in which we could still, let's say, dare to say, we are leaving the space, the planet, the nature, the ecosystems in a state <coughs> which will be still, if not excellent, then at least bearable for the next generations. So we do it because we need it, not because we have put just a political target. And, and the political target is for the same reason, because we simply don't see scientists the people which have data, uh, the director of the uh, uh, museum have been speaking about the data analysis. We never had 
as well documented problem as we have today with biodiversity, with the climate. We have all the data, we have very convincing information, we have models, we know what is going to happen if we do this or that or that. The only thing is we still don't dare always to say it full sound. I am always amazed when you have the international panels, be it IPCC C or the IPBES, uh, saying, OK, we have several scenarios. This is the best, this is the worst, this is the um, uh, middle. And we always a kind of stay shy to define the worst scenario as a really worst. And the, the, the evidence is clear. What is actually happening very often is beyond what is called a worst scenario in the previous period. So we should be very clearly aware that we are not yet doing sufficiently well and we need to proceed faster and better. And uh, I will end up by saying that what I said in the beginning. I don't really think that in this room there is anyone who is not sufficiently convinced about what I just said. We are not here to convince each other about that this is important. We are here to find a way how to pass this message to the broader society, how to convince policymakers and opinion makers to raise hand for it, but not only because they feel it is expected, but because they understand and believe that we have to do it in order to be able to live in a rather normal world also for not only us, but our children and grandchildren. So I wish the conference that you will, we will find the answers about not why, not if, but how to approach that fantastic problem and how we can use the nature restoration law. Something what I think could be at the end, again, something where Europe could lead by example, and I hope we can sell it also in Montreal in December this year, where we will be deciding on the global biodiversity framework for the whole world for the next 10 years. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ladislav, for sharing your valuable take on the topic. And I'd like to invite the last speaker of this introduction part, Ariel Brunner, Deputy Director and Head of Policy with BirdLife Europe and Central Asia, who has, among others in the recent years, played a leading role in advocacy around the European Green Deal and the EU biodiversity strategy. Ariel, the floor is yours. I, I have my Your microphone yes. already there. <laughs> okay, uh, I will really start from uh, the the kind of peaceful call to arm that we've just had from uh, from Ladislav. Um, we need action, and we need it now. Um, and uh, we have already been hearing in the debate around the the new restoration law. Uh, political voices saying that, yeah, it's, uh, it's a really useful initiative in principle, but we can't move too fast, it's expensive, uh, what about this sector, what about that sector? So we need to really take a, a step back and go back to, to what, uh, what Ladislav was just saying, which is that we are facing a crisis that risks wiping us out, because that's what the scientists are telling us. The crisis with those two twin evil boys of climate change and biodiversity loss and the disintegration of ecosystems is an existential threat to our existence. And by the way, at this point, not for the future generations, for our generation. It's already happening and it's going to hurt us very, very badly. It's already hurting, hurting very badly a lot of people today. And we don't have now the time to go into the data about 14% of our protected habitats being in healthy conditions or one bird out of, uh, bird species out of five on this continent being at risk of extinction and one third of species declining and so on and so forth. 
Um, the situation is really bad. But some of the examples, you know, the Bison example we've just seen before, and, and other examples, you know, uh, local projects like the one we'll visit tomorrow, show that we can reverse the decline. We, we can protect what we still have, and we can restore nature. If we give nature the possibility, nature does come back. Sometimes it needs a bit of a helping hand, sometimes it just needs to give, us, to give it a break, but it can come back, and sometimes quite fast. So we know what to do. We have a lot of good practice examples. You know, we have a whole generation of life projects funded by, by the EU that have restored habitats and species. The problem is that most of it has happened at scales that are way, way too small. We need to move from tens of hectares uh, projects to tens of thousands of hectares projects. And that's a completely different ballgame. And that's where the restoration law can really, make, uh, can really make a difference. If we get serious about it, we can bring back nature, we can get all sorts of benefits to society, including in terms of health and well-being, but crucially, it can also help us deal with some of the disasters that are already happening and that are only going to become worse in the coming years. The floods, the droughts, the forest fires, the storm uh, surges made worse by uh, rising uh, uh, seawater, and so on and so forth. Nature can be our best ally in fighting climate change. And it can also help us with the mitigation. Now, obviously, we need to get rid of the use of fossil fuels, but we'll hear later uh, about the fact that uh, we can, through nature restoration, transform land that today is emitting carbon into land that can absorb carbon. Um, and there are, uh, just in peatlands restoration, there is a potential for yearly emission savings which are about half of the emissions of the Czech Republic or, or something like taking 11 million cars off the roads. So it's big, it's big impact that we, can, uh, that we can get. You will hear that it's expensive, don't believe it. You look at nature restoration projects, you know, really big ones that have a huge impact have costs of in the tens of millions of euros, sometimes in the hundreds of millions of euros, think about the damage that we get from degraded ecosystems. Uh, the country where I live, Belgium, last summer we had terrible floods. This year we've had the worst drought in 500 years. So this is not about the future generations, it's about now. The floods last year, the Walloon government estimate uh, of just the economic uh, uh, damage has been of 2.8 billion euros, just in Wallonia. Imagine how much nature restoration you could buy with a fraction of that money. And those floods were coming down from the Ardennes, from areas, that, from peatlands that have been drained, and planted with forestry plantations that don't hold any water, with clear cuts, with very intensively managed grasslands, with uh, loss of landscape features. And a modicum of nature restoration above those towns would have avoided the kind of images that you've seen of cars being piled up to the top of, uh, of, the, of the roofs of the, of the houses. Uh, and of course, we would have saved also lives, not, not just money. So, the restoration law. We have a good law on the table. We need to get it adopted. We then need to get it implemented quickly. Time is of the essence. Um, the law on the paper is good, but it can still be improved on a number of, uh, of points, and we'll uh, talk about it more uh, later in the day. Uh, it's really important that the targets we have there, starting with the headline 20% target, really drive real action. The EU has a little bit uh, a, a history of targets that sound good, but are then filled with crap in certain cases, if I may I allow. I mean, the new common agricultural policy is a set example of how, uh, you know, we pretend to do things rather than actually doing them. We cannot afford pretending anymore. So we need to make sure that those targets are actionable. 
We need to have the right governance that ensures real involvement of local communities, NGOs, stakeholders, scientists. This cannot be just about um, government bodies ticking boxes to keep Brussels happy. It really needs a, need to be a law that mobilizes society. We need to make sure that uh, this restoration uh, law has its impact also in the marine environment. Not a huge priority for the Czech Republic, maybe, but uh, marine restoration is half of the story. And for marine restoration to happen, we need to make sure that the restoration law can work alongside the common fisheries policy and is not blocked by mechanisms that currently exist, which de facto make marine conservation and restoration uh, very difficult. And then we need to make sure that uh, the targets act fast. Some of the uh, targets uh, are uh, for too far into the future. Some of the targets are too weak particularly the one around uh, peatlands restoration. So there are things that uh, can still be improved and, uh, and we should work uh, with the Parliament and the Council to improve them. To get those improvements, we need to mobilize everyone from nature lovers and NGOs to scientists to politicians who care about the future need to speak up, because there will be uh, lobbies that will push back on this. Unfortunately, some people make big money from the current degradation of ecosystems, and they do not want the change. And in particular, we will need to win the argument with uh, the uh, fishing, farming, and forestry communities, because there is a lot of toxic propaganda out there that says that every hectare of land taken out of uh, agriculture and put back into nature is damaging food security. The opposite is true, and we have the data to show it. The real risk for farming is the collapse of ecosystems. This year, France has had the lowest maize production since 1990. In Italy, production has been cut by half because of the drought. So when we restore wetlands and we keep more water in the landscape and we create ecosystems that allow better water infiltration and so on, we are creating the insurance for our food production and the livelihood of our farmers in drought years. And you could have similar examples. You know, we, uh, one of the most exciting um, marine restoration projects in the Mediterranean, actually outside the EU, has uh, increased the revenue of local fishermen four times after they have closed fishing in part of, uh, of, the, of the area. Because if you close the fishing, the fish become big, they produce a lot of eggs, they produce more fish, and you end up fishing more. So this is really vital for the future of our food production and our local communities, but we need to convince people that this is, is the case. Thank you very much, and looking forward to uh, digging deeper into uh, all of this uh, later in the day. We have some really good speakers coming. Thank you. Thank you, Ariel, for sharing your point of view. Ariel will actually take also part in the last fourth panel, so you get to enjoy him twice today. Now on to the first discussion panel with presentations. Jan is going to guide you through it. Thank you, Eliska. Uh, a great advantage of uh, European approach to nature conservation is the tradition of using scientific knowledge. And uh, for this reason, the first panel discussion is devoted to the scientific basis of nature restoration. Four representatives of uh, the scientific community will help us now to answer the key question. Why do we need nature restoration from the scientific point of view? The, the introducing keynote uh, presentation will be given by Rudy van Dijelen, and uh, he is an expert in the field of uh, vegetation ecology uh, and with a special emphasis on restoration ecology at Antwerp University. 
and he was also the president of the European section of the Society for Ecological Restoration International. And I think that he will now present the last developments in the field of nature conservation, restoration, and also landscape planning. So, Rudy, please, the floor is yours. Thank, Thank you. you. Can I manage the slides myself? Yes. OK. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Thank you very much for the invitation. Of course, the problem if you are the third, fourth in a row of speaking, most of what you want to talk has been said before by our previous excellent speakers. And so is the case with my title. I thought I had a nice title. Unfortunately, yesterday I learned that Greta Thunberg had used this as well. However, it is a title, it is a, a, a statement that describes the situation very well. If we as humans have some kind of conflict, we try to, to solve that conflict by negotiation. Anyway, most of us try to do that. Uh, you cannot do that with ecosystems. The problem with ecosystems is that it is about relationships, you can describe it as relationships between organisms and their environment. You cannot negotiate with, with, with chemical, chemical processes. If you change something in nutrient availability, you can say, well, a bit more, but you must stay the same. It is not possible. Things will change. Luckily, most ecosystems have a kind of resilience. They, they have some kind of buffer against changes, but now we've come over the turning point. So that's where <coughs> restoration comes into play. And restoration is a nice buzzword. It means repair things. Everybody is happy about that. But of course, you have to be sure what to repair and how to repair it. So I start with, with, with a definition, definition by the Society for Ecological Restoration in many of their uh, publications, in the most recent one a publication, very readable publication about how to do, what is restoration, how to do it, etc., etc. And it's the process of managing sustainable recovery of an ecosystem that has been destroyed. We're talking about the recovery of an ecosystem, we're talking about managing it, not doing it. We are talking about setting the constraints of the whole, uh, of the whole thing. Nature must do it himself. Yes? Now, this is one of the things we're talking about. This is from the Living Planet Report 2020. I'm very curious to see what happens in a new one, but I expect it will be more or less the same. This is what many people think about restoration. Restoring ecosystems, restoring population, restoring nature. But it also, there's also something else, yes? This is an old picture, but it is nevertheless depicting exactly what we're talking about. The degradation of soil, this is a picture from 1990, well obviously it has not changed since that, since that time. Most of the soil in the world is degraded or heavily degraded. And we're talking about food production. Realize very well, yes, <coughs> that the decade of ecosystem restoration the United Nations have declared, 2020 to, 2021 sorry, to 2030, is not only about biodiversity, a lot about it is food security for people. We have destroyed our soils, we must restore them, yes? Now there are different levels in, in, in restoration. And forget all these words, that's not, that's not important, but what you should see is that there are levels. If you have a situation where the, where, where the, where the system is, is in a very bad state, you're not interested that much in, in, in uh, in biodiversity. You're interested in getting at least something in the system. And the better the system gets, the more functions you get about it. And at the top you have something like, like the, the, the restoring of biodiversity in Natura 2000, in Natura 2000 uh, uh, regions. Yes. I want to give you two examples of restoration. <clears throat> people always ask me, and we've heard it today as well, people always ask, well, yes, of course we know a lot about restoration, but do we know enough? Better study sometime. Well, I want to give some examples <coughs> where we do know, that we do know enough. This is one, 
peatlands. All of you know where the wood has been fallen before. All of you know where the peatland is. It's an organic soil with the remnants of dead plants that has, have not been decomposed. They store 30% of all the soil organic matter on this earth, despite the fact that they cover only 3% of the earth. <coughs> yes? What happens if we drain them? Oxygen comes in the soil and carbon goes in the air. Peatlands are responsible for 5% of the CO2 emissions on this planet. 5%. And here at the top layer, you see the, to the top figure, you see how different countries and the EU, how much they contribute to that. EU is the second largest contributor in the world. Second largest after Indonesia. But real realize that Indonesia has already done something to it. In 2017, Indonesia started a restoration program, and in that year alone, they've restored more peatlands than Europe, than the EU, in its whole history. So it's time to start. And at the bottom line, you see something of the different countries. And you see that if only four countries would rewet peatlands, you would, could reduce emissions already with 50%. That's a lot, yes? Well, here's an example of a practical, a practical uh, program, a practical uh, <coughs> uh, 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 internet uh, program, where they, where they restored, I don't know, eight or so sites. Total, not so much, yes. But what they did is they reduced by restoring these sites, only 650 hectares, not much. Reduced emissions with more than 8,000 tons. And to make it more visible, that's about 60 million kilometers with an average car. So you can imagine what happens if you restore a bit more than these six, uh, 600 hectares, yes? Another example, if we're talking about agriculture, we're talking about monotonous environments with hardly any flowers left in it anymore, unfortunately, which means we get problems with pollinators, we get problems with a lot of things. Um, in this example, people restored in a, life, uh, in a life project, they restored a former agricultural system, a heathland. Uh, this line in the in the in the national park in the, in the Netherlands, and in the middle of it is an agricultural enclave of I think it was about 200 hectares. They restored it. Uh, they wanted to turn it back into heathlands, <coughs> but it got three problems: drainage, the area, the site was drained, so it is difficult to restore a uh, wet heathland there. Farmers had been quite active, and there are a lot of nutrients in the in the sites, and the remnants are still in the soil, obviously and the species were absent in the new site. Yes? What you can do, you can block your drainage systems, you can remove all the nutrients. I have to admit that's an expensive thing. They cut away all the soil, the upper 30, 40 centimeters of the soil of it, and they build uh, sound barriers uh, from that, and you can introduce species, yes? And this is what you see after only five years. Expensive, 12 million euros. Part of it paid by you, part of it paid by the regional government. Realize, however, that this area receives 1.8 million visitors a year who spend on average 50 euros. In other words, the revenues for, such a for, for this national park are 90 million euros per year. So compared to that, it's not that much. And tourism has increased, actually, in this, in this site. So in other words, <coughs> yes, it works. Next. So I hope with these two examples that I've shown that do we have enough knowledge to restore a degraded ecosystem? Well, I think yes. You can compare it, for instance, to, to science in, in, in agriculture or economy. Despite that these sciences are, con are going on, getting more and more knowledge about agriculture, getting more and more knowledge about, uh, about, uh, about economy. Still, we have an economy, we produce food, etc., etc. Yes? 
That does not mean <coughs> that science cannot help to, apart from improving the local programs or the regional programs, to, to help setting priorities. And by, by doing so, if you start from this, the book at the right, State of Nature in the EU, 2020, I think, or 19, when was it? If you start with the most degraded ones, obviously a high priority is rewetting drained peatlands. I already showed that to you, said that to you, realize that we lost, we estimate we lost between 90 and 95 percent of the peatlands since the Second World War. I'm not talking about what we lost before the Second World War. If you do that, we lost 99.9 percent. .9%. So that must have a high priority. The same one is agriculture. <coughs> I already told it to you, there is no infrastructure, in, no, 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 ecological infrastructure in agriculture anymore. We're talking also about soil restoration. We're talking about flower strips for pollinators, etc., etc. Third one, uh, forest restoration is of course nice. We know, I know, we know that forests are increasing in Europe. The surface of forest is, 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 is enhanced. However, if, we, if, if it is increasing and we only use it for planting trees that we cut after 30 years and to make toilet paper something else that is used up very quickly out of it, it does not help us much. <coughs> Urban areas, the same story. If we have nice biodiverse restored areas in and around our, uh, our cities, people do not need to go so far anymore to see nature. For that, I urge you to go to some American cities. The, state of New the city of New York did that, for instance. Chicago is doing the same. And finally, it has been said before, I think, yes, we can make a policy. We can generate money for it, perhaps. However, it must be implemented. I not only go to conferences like these, I also go to the field, and this year, this spring, I, sp I was in five countries doing different types of field work, and always and I meet managers, local managers. And with them, I discussed about their expectations of such a nature restoration law. What would they expect of it? What would they do with the money, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. And they all, had, in all these five countries, had the same answer. They said, yes, we would be very happy to have more money, because obviously they shot out of money. But then when I said, well, you can get 10, maybe 20 times as much money as you have now, if you are a bit, uh, bit uh, clever, he said, we have no way of handling that. We don't have the people. <clears throat> and that's a very important thing. We must have the people on the ground. We must invest in education, and we must uh, mobilize all the people that are available, because otherwise it will not work how much money and how much policy we put in. I would like to end with that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, the second speaker uh, will be Karel Brach. Uh, he is a scientist in the uh, Institute of Botany of the Czech Academy of Sciences. He is a, let's say, guru of uh, Czech restoration ecology and also he is now the president of the Czech Botanical Society. So, Karel, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. In the limited time I have, allow me to stress several points which are very often underestimated in uh, you know, real restoration and also in many national legislations. So, uh, I would like to say that we need more emphasis on natural processes, and that would be good to include this also to the new uh, nature restoration law. Uh, there, is, there are many advantages of uh, using natural processes in restoration. They are inexpensive, it's very important. Uh, better uh, adapted species are naturally selected just for a site we like to restore. And uh, it results into higher resilience and usually into higher diversity. I would like to say that not only restoration of woodlands, it's rather uh, uh, 
supported, uh, and uh, we need to consider also on the restoration or on the importance of initial and early succession stages. They are really uh, sometimes essential for uh, keeping uh, biodiversity because, uh, for example, the sites disturbed by mining are usually nutrient poor. Avoid returning uh, topsoil, organic topsoil back because you spoil. Usually, that's not always, but very often you spoil the potential uh, of young uh, nutrient poor stages for uh, diversity. The rest of the landscape, European, European landscape, is usually uh, eutrophicated, and we, we are glad that we have some uh, un-eutrophicated sites. And the last point, uh, secondary grasslands in Europe uh, harbor the highest proportion of biodiversity, not only plants, but also insects and birds. So that would be also good to consider uh, more the restoration of secondary, traditionally managed grasslands and pastures. And you have there some uh, obstacles which I think uh, limit the using or to support these points. I think you can read it by yourself. As Rudy already said, uh, we have uh, rather good knowledge, scientific knowledge, what to restore. Of course, and it would be nice to know more, and in the future we will uh, know more. Uh, I see the limitations in education, and as I already said, uh, I see limitations in uh, national legislations. Next slide, please. To support uh, the, uh, the points, only briefly, so, um, not going to the details, but uh, the arrows indicate the process of spontaneous succession or spontaneous restoration, if you wish, and the points above indicate uh, potential natural vegetation. So you see that the direction of spontaneous natural processes uh, usually uh, directs just to the potential natural, natural vegetation. Next slide, please. And uh, here I would like to illustrate the importance of initial and early successional stages. Uh, here you have uh, early, middle, and late successional stages in various uh, disturbed sites, human disturbed sites, uh, mostly by mining. And here C1 means uh, the critically endangered species, the proportion of critically endangered species. Of course, uh, I, I must stress that uh, that's the logarithmic scale of, of the axis, but still you see that the highest proportion of critically endangered species is just in the early initial uh, nutrient poor uh, stages where the species have a chance to establish and not to be outcompeted by uh, more competitive species. And the last one, please. So I would like uh, to remember that uh, SER Europe, the Society for Ecological Restoration, recently launched uh, the declaration, which is rather important, I think. And if you are more interested in uh, some in uh, restoration ecology in this country, you can see the website. The, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Karel, for brief but important notes. And uh, the next speaker will be uh, Rockfield, the senior conservation scientist in, uh, at RSPB. Uh, Rob is current, currently working on ecosystem-based climate change mitigations through improved land management and conservation. And, Please, now, if you can introduce uh, your ideas. Thank you. Uh, 
Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for inviting me to talk here uh, today. Uh, I just want to talk to you a very quick run through uh, some of the work that we've been doing in the UK looking at the climate mitigation consequences of uh, nature restoration and semi natural habitats. So, very quickly, uh, just to introduce the topic here. Uh, if we, are, if we want to maintain our climate below uh, an increase of two degrees C above um, pre-industrial levels, we, it's not just enough to cut our emissions. We have to start reducing uh, the amount of CO2 currently in the atmosphere. And this is uh, a, a so-called greenhouse gas removal technologies. On the right here, you can see that there are a number of different uh, methods by which you can do that. The first three at the top here in black are those that rely on natural or semi-natural processes, so afforestation, wetland restoration as we've heard already, and soil carbon uh, storage. Uh, the ones below that uh, potentially have high uh, capacity to remove CO2 from the atmosphere, but they all re rely on technology that is completely or partially not yet operational. Uh, they're likely to be expensive, require a lot of expensive infrastructure, and they uh, potentially conflict with other land uses and land covers, uh, and may have an active detriment to other methods of removal of CO2 from the atmosphere. So if we concentrate on these uh, so-called nature-based solutions, the top three, these have the potential not only to provide very rapid uh, CO2 removal, but also uh, relatively cheap, and we know that they work. They rely on natural processes. But furthermore, they give us the opportunity that these nature-based solutions can give us an opportunity to provide some climate change mitigation and some nature conservation value. So if we look at the UK, first of all, if we consider our nature-rich areas, the UK is already relatively poor in, in uh, nature uh, and semi-natural or natural biodiversity. The remaining areas that we have are only partially protected. If you look here on the right, that is an indication of those red and yellow colours of the areas of semi-natural vegetation that are protected. If you look on the left, that's the total. So only about 50% of our nature-rich areas have any kind of natural protection. And a good 50% of those, uh, it varies slightly across the habitat categories, but a good 50% of them are ecologically impaired, uh, slightly, but mostly heavily ecologically impaired. Uh, and what we also have is significant carbon stocks still at risk. So the, within these nature areas, the colours in the map relate to how much carbon there is stored in the vegetation in the topsoil. And in Scotland, some of these areas have over 900 tonnes of CO2 equivalents per hectare of, of carbon stored in those habitats, which is a potential to be lost. Uh, which equates to around, in total, 2.6 gigatons of CO2. Uh, and if you put that in context, that's the equivalent of about two years' worth of the UK, -wide, UK economy-wide emissions. So that is a lot of stuff that could still be lost into the atmosphere to make things even worse. Now, our annual emissions from these habitats, so the amount of CO2 that goes in or out, the net amount of greenhouse gases, is around 0 0.008 gigatons of CO2. So that is removed from CO2 equivalents, greenhouse gases that is removed from the atmosphere every year by these habitats. But if they were in better condition, we could almost double that, that, that greenhouse gas removal. Uh, and those numbers, if you compare with the annual total of emissions from uh, the, the UK-wide economy, is about point, just under 0.5 gigatons of CO2. So this, we have currently about... 2% being removed, 2% of our annual emissions being balanced by our semi-natural uh, nature-based solutions, if, if you will. We could double that uh, if we got our habitats in better ecological condition. 
Um, we then looked at the potential to increase that through nature restoration. And initially, we looked at uh, creation of new woodlands uh, alongside peatland restoration, which is covered in the first slide. Um, and potentially, uh, whether there was space without harming any other natural habitats, any of our current nature-rich areas, to increase our area of woodland. Uh, this is primarily driven by UK policies for climate change mitigation through tree establishment. So whether there is indeed even enough room to reach those targets of 70,000 hectares established per year, it turns out that there is just about enough room without endangering soil carbon in areas that are currently uh, low agricultural land calcification. So they are essentially uh, low intensity, low productivity, low biodiversity grasslands for the most part. Uh, we could potentially add an additional 0 0.01 gigatons of CO2 equivalents by establishing, uh, filling up that area with woodland over the next 30 years, which would give us an extra 2% of uh, CO2 mitigation to balance our, our, national, uh, our national emissions. So we've got land-based climate change mitigation that can essentially mitigate between 4 and 5% of our UK-wide annual emissions across all sectors. So that doesn't sound a lot, but that has to be done alongside our reducing our economy-wide emissions. So in the UK, where we have a very small land area, most of which is used for other things already, and we have a very large economy which emits a huge amount of greenhouse gases. So with a limited land area, there's always going to be a trade-off between land-based mitigation uh, and food production and, critically, our existing uh, natural habitats and nature-rich areas. So within the UK, our message is definitely nature restoration should be primarily for wildlife conservation. We will get significant added climate benefits from that by doing the right thing for nature in the right place, as well as continually protecting and improving what we already have. We will get significant added climate benefits. Climate mitigation of restoration is important. I'm not saying that it's not important. And in countries where you, which are much bigger uh, and have relatively smaller populations, you have more percentage, more potential for climate-based mitigation through nature-based solutions uh, at a national scale of having up to, uh, research recently has shown that up to 30% potential emissions uh, offsetting by nature-based solutions in large countries with small economies. So the final message is climate restoration is an important con contribution to climate mitigation, but it's not a panacea. We need to cut all the other emissions as well. So the more we cut our emissions from transport, from industry, from agriculture, the less land-based mitigation we need. And therefore we can target that land towards nature restoration for nature's sake for all the other ecosystem services and co-benefits that it provides. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for sharing these examples with us. And now the last presenter will be Tania Shumrada, the researcher of the uh, University of Ljubljana. Uh, Tania, unfortunately, can, can join us personally today, but uh, we are really happy that uh, she can join us in, uh, online on Zoom, so hopefully we will connect with her soon. Oh, yeah, we've, we've got you here. Good morning, Tanya. And please, morning. if you can present us briefly uh, your view on uh, or, and uh, um, experiences with the uh, linkage of uh, nature restoration, agroecology, and uh, food security. Please, Daniel, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, so, do you hear me well? Yes. Okay, perfect. 
so first of all, I'm very sorry, sorry I couldn't join you in person uh, due to COVID, um, as I was really looking forward to this event. Um, I don't uh, have any slides today, but I will still try to add a few thoughts uh, to this discussion. Um, I would like to start by pointing out the need for action. Uh, although this is probably not new for the audience, I think it is important to have in mind uh, the current state of biodiversity in agriculture ecosystems, uh, because this is actually our starting point. Um, in the literature, including the IPBS assessment report, it is well established that agricultural production today is one, is one of, if not the most important driver of biodiversity loss, both globally and regionally. Uh, and according to the recent State of the Nature report in the EU, agriculture was also recognized as the only pressure category that affects the full list of habitat and species groups. It also represents the highest source of pressure for most of them. And furthermore, only about a quarter of species and habitats under the Habitat Directive have a good conservation status, many of which depend on agricultural ecosystems. Uh, so this is really worrying and justifies, I think, the many urgent calls for action uh, which have been voiced both by the scientific community as well as increasingly the scientific society and business sector. Now the good news is that um, after decades of dedicated scientific research, we also know relatively well what should be done to reverse these trends. Um, in the recently published paper in Conservation Letters, which was led by Guy Peer, we used insights from scientific workshops in most EU countries to establish some guiding principles for effective biodiversity conservation. And the easiest uh, way to explain this is that if we want to preserve nature in agricultural ecosystems, we need to give it some space. Um, this is important to understand because in contrast to environmental protection issues where a lot can be done by, for example, introducing smarter production technologies that reduce the use of inputs, for biodiversity the key requirement is to provide at least 10% of non-productive features on all farmland. However, much more should also be done, of course, in certain high nature value uh, farming systems, which, still, uh, which can still be found in many parts of Europe. Um, this recommendation not only aims to tackle biodiversity loss by itself, but also addresses um, the need to create more resilient agricultural production systems. Um, as Ariel and also many other speakers today, I need to highlight this because um, in the increasingly insecure world, we often see the issue of nature restoration portrayed by some organizations, also part of interest groups, um, as a kind of trade-off, right? So either we work on food security or we invest in uh, tackling biodiversity crisis. Uh, but this point of view does not take into account the full scale of consequences of biodiversity loss and the interconnectedness with the climate crisis in particular. Um, in recent years in Europe, we see increasingly frequent natural disasters like droughts, um, historically low water levels in rivers, floods, wildfires, also increasing wind erosion due to dry winters and low snow cover. And all of these events significantly impact agricultural production, and the question is, what can we do to increase the resilience of such systems? So although it is true that by restoring nature in agricultural landscapes, inevitably we need to use some of the land uh, now used for production for the re-establishment of natural processes, um, the costs of these measure, measures should also take into account their contribution to the climate adaptation of agriculture. Um, I would like to finish this first input um, to our discussion today by adding a few more thoughts on the um, implementation of nature restoration measures uh, in agricultural ecosystems in particular. Um, so, what we see now is that a lot of existing non-productive features, like hedgerows, for example, are still not included in any of the instruments of the Common Agriculture Policy. 
in a recent study by Irish colleagues, uh, which was published in Ambio, um, and they found that the large share of semi-natural habitats on Irish farms are currently not covered by neither cross compliance and EFAs, nor any of the voluntary measures. And this share is particularly high on extensive high nature value farmland where the share of semi-natural habitats per farm can reach as much as 40% of farm area, but currently 10 to 15% at best um, is covered by the CAP instruments. So this means that the conservation of a lot of the existing habitats is still left up uh, to the goodwill of farmers and thus um, is not, uh, we, we do not make sure that um, they're actually preserved. So um, I think uh, in, um, I think this is one important point to make. So we should make sure that these habitats are included in the, in the measures better than they are, the, that they are so far. And also restore them where necessary, um, including by finding ways to re-establish agricultural use because um, in many of the HMV areas, um, we see that they are currently facing land abandonment. Uh, on the other hand, in more intensively managed landscapes, I think that um, there are two key approaches that should be used. Um, there are currently already a lot of instruments available within the CAP uh, that member states can use to support farmers to restore and preserve semi-natural habitats at the individual farm level, including, for example, uh, non-productive investments and agro-environmental measures. Unfortunately, um, the first evaluations of the adopted national strategic plans showed that uh, most member states have not used these options in scales needed uh, to reverse the biodiversity declines. And on the other hand, I think we also need restoration projects that actually go beyond the individual farms. And this is especially important in regions with very fragmented land structure. Um, these include, for example, small or large scale revetting of grasslands, um, restoration of peatlands, um, and also repl replanting of hedgerows, of hedgerows to effectively uh, mitigate wind erosion. Now, for this kind of projects, I think uh, it would be beneficial to think about the targeted fund, uh, perhaps similar to, for example, life program, but where projects would not focus that much on uh, demonstration and innovation, but rather replication of the good practices to new areas. Um, given the situation in many member states, I think that without such dedicated fund, um, it will be very hard to expect the ambition needed. Um, finally, um, given the experience we have both uh, within the CAP and also the EU environmental policies, um, I think it is necessary to make sure that the implementation framework includes uh, quantified targets and clear milestones in the national restoration plans, um, as this was recognized as one of the key um, um, drawbacks uh, or problems in the, in, the, um, in the policy implementation so far, and of course also effective monitoring that takes into account the baseline. Um, so, uh, thank you. I think this uh, this uh, should suffice for the first for the first input. Thanks. Thank you, Tania. <clears throat> thank you very much. And now let me to invite all speakers. Uh, all, unfortunately, only three of them. Sorry, Tania. Uh, but I hope that you will stay with us uh, virtually. But uh, I, I invite again all three. Uh, speakers to, to the panel to sit here and uh, to discuss with you, with all participants. So, uh, Rudy, please, if you could also join us. Um, please prepare your questions uh, which you have for um, uh, all these uh, panelists. And uh, uh, now we've got around half an hour. Please, please. And um, uh, so prepare your questions. There is also the, uh, the opportunity for these participants who are present only online to 
Um, can I, they also can, can I ask the question via Slido? Uh, they've got the <coughs> link, um, uh, they can see the link in the stream. So please, if you also got some questions, uh, you, can, uh, you can write them into the Slido. Uh, before we start, probably, um, uh, I, because now it's very difficult to see all the participants if somebody is asking anything, so I will start. Uh, and the first question is for Rudy, if I can. Um, Excuse me, it's possible to decrease yeah. the light? It's These lights? Not very yes, uh, and we don't see you. And it's a little bit bad. Thank, thank you very you, much. Thank you. Uh, so, um, we heard, and also Ladislav uh, Miko said that uh, the understanding of uh, decision and opinion makers will be crucial for uh, nature restoration and nature restoration law. Um, so, but we, we know that um, nature restoration could be understood in uh, very different ways. So, uh, what do you think, what should be the role of scientists uh, for the right understanding of nature restoration? Yeah, okay, you hear me? Yes. Well, I think an important role is a practical role. Uh, I've seen, it has been mentioned also by several people before, under the name of restoration, I've seen many things that go wrong. One example that we all know probably is the biofuel uh, issue. That's a big, big, big mistake in my, in my opinion. But I see that also on a small scale. So, um, for instance, when I lived in the Netherlands, uh, we did an analysis of restoration projects uh, of, of success rate. And it turned out that the restoration projects that had scientific advice were, I think, 50% better, a uh, higher, uh, how do you call it, uh, success rate than the, than the ones that, that were not done. What you should realize is that we're living in a dynamic world, in a changing world. People often want to restore something that was there 50 years ago. Well, if one thing is sure, we will not get back what was 50 years ago. We will go to a new situation. To, to, to understand how we get there is that we need knowledge of how the system is working. That is where scientists can help. The other thing where they can help is by setting priorities. I, type, I try to do that a bit. And of course, they can be debated a lot, but that is where we can help, by, 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 by adding data and, 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 and putting, putting scientific knowledge in the discussion. Thank you. Uh, and I've got another question because nobody <laughs> is raising the hand uh, till now. So for Karel, uh, if I can, um, uh, the science is all about the data and information. And we've got very good knowledge, but for sure we will never know everything. And there is now the tension for urgent action regarding uh, nature restoration. So. Uh, how can we, or the science, how can the science deal with the tension to ensure rapid action and uh, also, but uh, at the same time qualitative uh, in regard to frustration? Yeah, uh, you said that data are important, of course, but uh, I think that in ecological restoration, the practical ecological restoration, it's also important uh, to display and, and uh, apply our field knowledge or field experience. Uh, and uh, uh, I think in this way, we can immediately say what would be probably the best solution. Of course, we are not always sure. We must be critical, but I think we very often uh, know what would be good to do in practical restoration. But Unfortunately, uh, we are not so frequently asked. <laughs> <laughs> so hopefully you will. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, that was a really important point. And um, we are still waiting for raising hands. Uh, but uh, till now, uh, I'll do another question for Rob, if I can. Um, you spoke about a very important point that uh, uh, the more emissions we will re reduce, uh, the less mitigation we will need. Uh, that's quite important message. Uh, but that's clear that we will need some uh, mitigations in, uh, in the landscape. So what, is, what can be your advice uh, 
uh, how to uh, scientifically ensure that nature restoration contributes to both biodiversity and the climate at the same time? Uh, primarily, uh, good planning. So uh, the, 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 the work I spoke about in the UK was basically looking for an area of opportunity where the trade-offs, the, the reduction in other services would not be too great. So looking for areas which wouldn't harm current areas of high nature value. So avoiding all those areas of land, avoiding areas of land that are highly productive for agriculture, avoiding areas of land that are highly productive for fibre and, and timber. So what space do you have between that that you can use to uh, restore nature. So uh, we're currently engaging in some more work that's looking at this in more data to quantify those trade-offs. So including more things like grassland restoration uh, as well as peatland restoration and woodland restoration. But on the basis of classifying land and its suitability uh, to not reduce other services and also its capability of what it is capable of doing. So obviously land like that on the side of a mountain with high rainfall and high winds is not going to support a forest or low input grassland, but it might support a bog. Uh, so classifying the land in those kind of ways to produce realistic estimates of what's possible and then look at those areas of land in terms of connectivity uh, and how they connect to areas of current high nature value to build on those to protect them to buffer them so i would say planning so that you reduce your conflicts with other land use and uh, looking at the greatest restoration utility so buffering the areas we still have so it's producing not only new habitat but protecting the the stuff that we still have that's good and Rob, maybe if I add to that, uh, also being very clear what is possible and what is not possible. Yes. For instance, where I live in now, and that's one of the of the, the examples I was talking about, uh, there is the idea to uh, combine uh, uh, restoration and, uh, and CO2 uh, capture mm -hmm. by planting peatlands with trees, which yes. in my opinion is the most stupid idea that you can have. And if you look at the, the data for that, you show that... that, that that uh, you'd have to be onto your third rotation of trees yeah, before, of you, before you were climate negative, yeah, even exactly. using forestry yeah, zone exactly, figures. Exactly. Uh, and so that's, but that, that we are, uh, going back to the question that you asked, Carol, uh, uh, in, in terms of when can we start, when can we say there's enough science? There is already enough yeah. science to stop making these egregious errors um, uh, and to say with reasonable certainty this is likely to work so often people think that the, the perfect is the enemy of the good we know enough to get on with it uh, being told that we don't know enough yet is usually a stalling tactic by vested interests um, so i would say you know there are what we would in, in english call low-hanging fruit the stuff that we can do straight away like peatlands restoration like removing trees from drain bog that kind of thing that we can do straight away, which is not going to harm anything that we still have, and is only going to make stuff better. Yeah, thank you very much, and I thank you also to Rudy that, uh, for, for the additional additional point. Um, uh, I see that the first question, but to be fair, uh, I get also one question to question to Tanya. Uh, are we connected? I hope so. I'm not great, sure. Great, great. Yeah, we can hear you. So, uh, I, because you uh, were speaking a lot about this uh, agricult agricultural landscapes, um, uh, I wanted to ask you if, according to your view, is um, restoring uh, nature, uh, uh, if in restoring nature can also ensure farmers' resilience, you know, uh, how, how it can help uh, for a farmers' resilience? Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I think uh, this. Uh, I think this is closely connected. I absolutely agree with what Rob said um, in in his answer that definitely when we are combining um, 
climate, uh, climate targets and biodiversity conservation targets, um, good planning is key. Um, but still, um, but, but still, at, in agricultural landscapes, a lot can be can be done uh, to achieve both um, to achieve both targets at the same time. So um, there are lots of examples. For example, uh, so um, a lot of a lot, uh, uh, many parts of Europe are now are now facing uh, increasing threats or because of the irregular distribution of water. Um, so the the weather um, weather events the the weather systems are are changing. So the, there are inc increasing problems with the droughts, and definitely restoring nature in in terms of uh, trying to um, keep the water in in the local areas is one of the uh, one of the things that could be done to reduce the uh, the impacts of droughts at the local level. I also mentioned uh, the problem of wind erosion, especially in winter area, in during the winter. Um, here, for example, um, like tall, tall landscape features like hedgerows, uh, solitary trees, and so on, can help a lot at reducing uh, this problem. So, in Slovenia, for example, this is um, increasingly uh, a problem that farmers encounter with a lot of soil, soil erosion, uh, erosion present. Um, and there are actually a lot of um, um, also both life projects, but also other initiatives uh, thinking and working in this direction. Right. So this, these are usually areas that were subject to um, ameliorations um, and conversation projects uh, already back in the 80s and 90s. Um, but now, uh, due to different weather, weather conditions, um, we, we increasingly see the problem that we actually need to, uh, need to go back to, to the situation where we were. So where, where there was more water retained in the area, where there were more landscape features that helped with mitigating this kind of, this kind of problems. Um, so, yeah, there, there is a lot that, that can be done to also help farmers uh, to increase their resilience. And of course, there are also uh, agri, agri ecological impacts, right? So, by um, by, for example, um, uh, having semi-natural um, habitats uh, within within the agricultural landscape, you, you also take care of uh, pre different predatory species. With their take care of pollinators, um, and this is also very important for the uh, agriculture production. So. Um, there is a lot of research on this, um, and it's very and it's well established that uh, that this um, these measures are beneficial. Thank you. Yes, Carol, Carol will uh, Carol will add uh, some some comments to it, and uh, I think that we thank you very much, Tanya, and we really appreciate all ornithologists in the room appreciate placing this uh, bird choice behind you. That was nice. Uh, so, Carol, if you can. Okay. Uh, talking about the restoration of agricultural land, I think that European Union has a really very powerful tool, and there are subsidies. And if the subsidies would be more spent just to support small-scale farming and uh, neonature farming than it is now, I see it in this country. We have very big, large uh, parcels, large fields, and uh, the owners get the same support, or more or less the same support, uh, as the small farmers. I think this, this should be uh, improved. Yeah, uh, the common agriculture policy have to change, and it's changing a little bit, but uh, it's for uh, another discussion. So the first question, please, uh, if you can give the mic. Jaromir Blaha, Friends of the Earth, Czech Republic. Uh, I would like to uh, ask a question probably uh, towards to Rob Field. Uh, uh, he mentioned uh, on his presentation and afforestation and reforestation as uh, very important tools to 
So what I miss there is what's, uh, to mention also proforestation as a method how to catch the carbon um, because uh, the mature trees and old trees um, can uh, in many uh, many stands catch even more carbon than the young trees. And also if we don't cut the mature trees and old trees, we prevent the, the, uh, the, the emission also. So, I would like to ask whether, I know that, that that's not a case of UK, uh, but in Europe, uh, I suppose there, that there is quite a um, bigger potential for to use the proforestation as a, as a tool how to catch the carbon and uh, decrease the climate crisis. So I would like to ask whether the, the, uh, the targets of uh, uh, the, the restoration targets count also with this method. Thank you. Thank you, Aromir. So, Rob, if you can react. Yes, so the work that we did uh, as, as was prompted initially by the UK government's uh, desire to get their economy to net zero by 2050. Uh, so that's uh, emissions balanced with sequestration. Um, and so we were looking at the, the kind of ambition that you would need to put in place, so up to 70,000 hectares a year of tree establishment. And what that's really showed us is, is, is that we get to that, the rapid sequestration of young growing trees will get you a very high level of sequestration for 40 or 50 years. And then, as you say, those sinks start to saturate. And very much, I think, what this does is buy us time to cut our economy-wide emissions without things getting any worse. But I agree with you, in the long term, in future, uh, obviously when trees reach maturity, the, 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 those sinks saturate and they're fairly much in equilibrium with the atmosphere again. So in order to increase the amount of uh, sequestration capability, uh, you would want to remove some of that wood uh, to allow younger trees to grow again, to, to, to restart uh, an additional sink. But the question of what happens to the wood that you've removed then defines whether that is a continued sink or is balanced with the decomposition of that wood. Uh, and this is an argument we have with Clearfell Forestry in that they're claiming a certain amount of sequestration because they're replanting after tree removal. I think what you're talking about is something different in, in terms of the traditional management of habitat uh, through uh, what some might call continuous cover forestry. And I think there is a place for that in the longer term, yes. As long as you can make sure that the, the wood that you remove remains sequestered, i.e. goes into building and that kind of stuff, which would be the ideal for it. But in terms of promoting the habitat, that kind of stuff traditionally in the UK, and I'm sure other ways, the traditional management of woodland is, is, is now uh, treated as a conservation management for promoting habitat diversity. Do you mean coppicing? Coppicing, yes. Thank you very much. Yes, it's important. You see, you see here as well the, 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 the tension eh, between the, the, two, the two targets, the biodiversity target and the carbon target. Yes. I want to emphasize that as much as I can. Uh, putting all your cards on, on, on carbon as nature conservation does, mean, does not mean you get uh, old, wood, old woodland back. It means you get short-term rotation of woodland back. Yeah but only if you know what's going to happen to the, 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 the sequestration of the harvested wood products. Yes. Uh, and for the most part in the UK, that sequestration is very short-lived yeah. because it goes into things, as somebody said earlier, into toilet paper and, and pallets and packaging that has a lifespan of less than five years. Yeah. So it's not sequestered. Yeah. Thank you. And also for this interaction, that's great. Uh, there is still no questions on Slido, so uh, I, I want to ask all online participants that, um, uh, for, for asking there. But we've got uh, questions here in, uh, in the room, so please. Thank you very much, uh, Laura Hill from the European Environmental Bureau. I've got a, quite a general, much, much broader question. Um, Robbie said earlier, we know enough to get started, we, we know we have the arguments, but where the difficulty really is, is getting those out there, countering the really harmful sort of lobby perversion, 
um, of the arguments and, and convincing the wider, the wider public. So I was just wondering if you maybe, to all of you, who has some good examples of where this has worked well, um, what we need more of, what you maybe need from others in the room here, because I think we're very much talking among friends, as someone said earlier also, so it's really how do we break out of this bubble and how do we get this more out there to counter the really harmful lobby narrative? Thank you. Thank you, so you are asking everybody. <laughs> I, I mean, yes, but also I'm asking whoever wants to, to, to speak to this uh, uh, from, from the panel, from, yeah. from different examples, yes, thank you. Thank you very much. So Rudy, if you can start. Uh, I'm the one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's of course, it's of course a, a very important question, it's of course also a very difficult question you answer, you, you know that very well, uh, as good as I know. Uh, I think an important thing is education. That that is that is one thing. That is one thing. The other thing is uh, you have to be in in in, um, in um, how do you say it, prime interest uh, 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 things. So you have to be in newspapers, television, etc., etc. And that's a bit of a, of a tricky business, especially these days with wars like Ukraine, etc. People tend to put to put this apart. But the only thing you can do is to make the thing to make the thing clear, and and it's it's uh, it, it, it's it's pity to have to say it, but it always happens after a disaster. In the country where I live, Belgium, you live there as well, I suppose. Yeah, of course, there was suddenly a lot of uh, a lot of uh, uh, public interest in, in in sustainability after the floodings in Valonia last uh, last year. This summer in Draught, there was all over Europe, there was interest uh, because we really saw the thing that was predicted already 30 years ago. Uh, so I, I don't think I have an easy answer to you. Um, I think an important issue is this restoration, restoration law, not only for what is in it, but the fact that it is there. That alone is very, very, very important. It cannot be emphasized enough, the fact that it simply is there that an institution like the European Commission says, hey guys, this is going wrong, we need to do something about it. And uh, it, it, it puts the, 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 how to say, the interest groups that uh, have less interest in, uh, in restoration, puts them in the defense. That's a very, very important issue. I cannot emphasize that enough. And that is, a, that, is a, that is one thing. And the other thing, yeah, like I said, continue going on uh, what else, what else can you do? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Tanya, if you hear us and if you've got any idea to present or some example, please. Yeah, thank you. Um, thanks also for this question. I think it's very important. Uh, so um, I agree with uh, other panelists that um, I think we can, say, we can safely say that knowledge is there, so um, it should not be a problem. Um, however, I think it's also important to point out that although there is knowledge there and also experience with restoration uh, projects, uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that this knowledge is equally distributed uh, across the EU member states. So, uh, and this is particularly true perhaps at the regional and um, local level. So I think uh, within the framework uh, of the nature restoration law, um, it, I think it's very important also to think about uh, actions, uh, measures, activities to uh, increase um, knowledge transfer between the EU member states, between uh, uh, member, member states, also between inst institutions. Um, because what we see, for example, um, in, within uh, the CAP implementation and also the ambition of member states um, in implementing uh, for example, novel, novel approaches to uh, biodiversity conservation in agriculture, for, for example, result-based schemes and uh, similar activities. Uh, it is often the lack of knowledge, uh, lack of data, and this uh, institutional context that is the problem, uh, or one of the key problems. Uh, why at the national level they don't decide to be more ambitious than perhaps they could be. Um, so this, this does not, of course, mean that, um, the, um, that there aren't other issues as well, but I think that we should also um, include this kind of activities uh, and have them in mind. 
Uh, I spoke before um, about the idea of perhaps setting up a uh, nature restoration fund or something similar, so a dedicated instrument within the EU policy framework that is um, available for funding restoration projects, but also part of this uh, fund could also be, of course, a knowledge sharing um, activities. So, yeah. Thanks. Thank you, Tanya. Thank you very much. And uh, Karel, if you also can briefly react. Uh, one uh, remark. Uh, I think more people uh, should be engaged in this uh, to disseminate the ideas on political restoration. Uh, for example, uh, we are scientists, we teach, we try, of course, uh, as much as possible to disseminate the ideas, but our time is limiting. And uh, as so more people would be engaged, that would be the way. Yeah, this mobilization, mobilization. Is, is quite important. Rob, if you want to add also. Um, I was going to say, uh, in answer to your question, t two things, and they're going to sound slightly combative, but they're not meant to. Um, know your enemy and get close to your enemy, and then your enemy becomes your friend. So what I mean by that is if you're looking at vested interest lobbies and that kind of thing who are using science to justify the idea uh, of, of climate mitigation come from afforesting dry peat and that kind of stuff. Is, uh, I've found that recently in projects that we worked with is basically my postdoc knew forestry science inside out and could quote their own numbers back to them so be knowledgeable in those vested interests so that you can say, look, your numbers don't make sense. Uh, and then from that collaborate, from that instance of working with, uh, with the forestry research people, we are now entering in collaborations with them because they know that we know what we're talking about in their sphere. We're collaborating with them and changing the way that they think. So it's not all about tree production, it's about tree production and ameliorating tree production with, with, with nature, with forestry environment and that kind of thing. So it's about engaging on a human level with the people who have vested interests and that does actually change them. Thank you very much. We've got the last question before the lunch, please. If we can give it a micro there. Thank you. Hi, thank you. Carolyn Jewell from Heidelberg Materials. Um, Rudy mentioned that one of the priorities is around urban restoration. Um, and I wanted to get a scientific point of view. Um, in the UK, they now have a planning, well, they're introducing a planning requirement for biodiversity net gain uh, in development. Um, and you've seen the, the housing industry suddenly have a mass recruitment of biodiversity people to, to manage this. Um, and this, this has great potential for introducing uh, more habitats into particularly built development. Um, and I wondered whether this could be a tool that could be kind of brought in across, across the European uh, region. And, and does, this, does this create an actual mechanism for being able to, to address this urban restoration, or do you think it's going to be too piecemeal? The question is to whom, please? Um, to the to the panel. Oh. <laughs> but, I mean, Rob, Rob is probably best placed from a UK perspective, but it would be good because, to get Rudy's perspective too. Yeah, yeah, thank you. But because of the time, I, I would like to ask only one. So who is feeling that? Yeah, Rob. <laughs> yes, I think it is an opportunity. I mean, clearly, uh, urban development uh, is removing the potential for primary habitat restoration and that kind of thing. So it is not necessarily uh, a win for nature, as it's obvious, as, as it is often touted as being. This is a housing development that's good for nature. So it's not. It's just less bad for nature. But I agree with you. What it is good at doing is getting people living close to nature again, which in the UK is is, is increasingly rare. Uh, most, most of the population lives in cities and, and they are not exposed to nature very much. 
uh, and the, the, certainly in the UK there is a lot of work going on with within a, within the organisation that I work with, uh, and also uh, within the statutory conservation bodies, looking at the nature benefits for people, so health and well-being, uh, and even to the point of nature being prescribed by doctors for people with mental health problems. Um, and this is something that's growing, and I think. Uh, house builders are realising that it's something they can sell their houses on. So I think the benefit is not direct nature conservation, it's connecting people with nature to see the value of it in the places where it still can be uh, a, a whole rather than a, a, a slightly less damaged thing. Thank you very much. If you, uh, what, yeah, well, you can what I want to emphasise is, <clears throat> even if it does not add to biodiversity, it adds to nature, it adds to the, the connection of the people to nature, and that's the important thing. Uh, thing. Yeah. I have a question as well. What's the conclusion of this round? <laughs> <laughs> the, conclusion, uh, the conclusion was uh, uh, included in our, all your answers, and uh, I think that uh, um, colleagues from WWF are making notes, and uh, it will be summarized in the final, final work, but I have to say, that uh, uh, this um, call for a mobilization and a mobilization of um, uh, uh, human resources, it's, it's not a nice word, uh, human resources, but we need it now. Uh, and uh, we need to push really uh, the, uh, the decision makers and opinion makers. And uh, we've got enough data to start, as Carol said, uh, if we don't need now to start with optimal, but we uh, with, uh, with optimal solutions, but with solutions we are expecting that could be working uh, in uh, in the field uh, and in the nature. So yeah, Rob, please. Sorry, I was just going to say one thing that's just occurred to me of what Carol said about uh, the potential for subsidy, common agricultural yeah. policy, and stuff, not just for promoting nature-friendly actions and subsidising those but to stop subsidising yeah. detrimental things. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it, propping up systems of production and land use that don't work even for the people doing them. Yeah, we have to do it in, uh, in Europe because, uh, uh, as Aladis Lamico uh, mentioned, the uh, Global Biodiversity Framework, one of the targets of the Global Biodiversity Day, uh, Framework is oriented to the, uh, that it's necessary to stop these subsidies and it's necessary to, uh, to change this, uh, the system. So hopefully it will. So thank you. Yeah, Karel? Brief remark. Uh, practical ecological restoration is excellent feedback for our scientific uh, knowledge. Uh, monitoring. Monitoring. And also to practice uh, yes. the restoration. Yes. yes. Yeah. So it's a mutual uh, connection and it's very nice feedback for us. Thank you. That, that, that was perfect ending of, of this panel. So thank you all. Thank you for this panel. And uh, I want to invite all of you uh, to the lunch, uh, which is now Good. in the foyer. Of, uh, and uh, uh, I hope that you will all return back at 1 p.m. for another panel discussion. So thank you very much for this morning session. So I hope you all enjoyed lunch and thank you for joining us here again, both here in the building and online. I hope there are still some people watching us online. 
the first panel, in the first panel, we try to focus on the science behind the proposal. Now we're going to zoom in on the different key aspects of the proposal, covering terrestrial, marine, agricultural, and forest ecosystems. As the first one is going to be a keynote speaker, Michael Hoshek. But before that, I'd like to just briefly sum up how this panel should unfold. Again, there will be the 15 keynote presentation, as I mentioned, followed by three shorter speeches, and then a debate, which we, which we are going to kick off with my questions, and then there, of course, will be space for your questions, which is why I encourage you now, maybe you'll be inspired in the course of the different presentation you're about to see. You can submit your questions online as well. You don't have to wait for them to do it here in present. And you can do so at slido.com with the hashtag natrsconf. I can spell it. It's going to be a little uh, spelling contest. <laughs> That's N-A-T-R-E-S-C-O-N-F, natrsconf, hashtag at slido.com. So please. If there's anything that will, you know, come to your mind, you can just submit it there. Okay, no more words for me, and I would like to welcome our keynote speaker, Michael Hoshek, a landscape ecologist by education who has worked in the field of nature conservation for more than 20 years. Currently, Michael serves as the president of the Europark Federation. He has a wealth of experience working for international nature conservation organizations, as well as representing the Czech Republic abroad. Also a passionate beekeeper. <laughs> the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Eliška. Yeah, I hope that it will work now because I have a lot of animations. So thank you very much, hosts, for inviting me uh, for this very inform uh, <laughs> to this very important uh, event. My task in this panel is to introduce the frame and targets under the nature restoration law. So during the morning sessions and speeches, we heard a lot about its importance. My task now in 15 minutes is to go through this, to show you what are the targets, what it should mean. My presentation, therefore, will not be uh, really exhaustive because it's impossible to go into the detail, but I would like to show you the overall picture. And there is also a lot of interlinkages in, uh, uh, among those targets. It should be something like a base for a later discussion about what should be there improved or strengthened and what is, let's say, less important. Because as you are know, this is just the proposal uh, that will be now negotiated or that, that is negotiated already with member states and that will be approved during the next year if everything is going well. And uh, I hope that what I will present today will stay as it is, more or less, and it will be only improved if there are any changes. So let's start now. I hope that I will use the... Yes. A bit about the evolution. <clears throat> because you know that 30 years ago, uh, we started very strong legislation. It was EU Habitats Directive uh, uh, that was, uh, let's say, uh, complementing the BERS Directive. And based on that, we, uh, we uh, implemented Natura 2000 Network. After 30 years, Natura 2000 Network is almost completed, but not fully. And we are mainly focused on protected areas as Natura 2000 Network. Uh, the bigger challenge is with marine. The, the less uh, uh, challenging is the terrestrial. It is almost completed, as I said. Now, 30 years later, we have still a significant decline in equality in a state of species and habitat types. So. We were somehow successful, but only partially. But the overall state is very bad, as you can see. And this is just a quotation of the first uh, sentence from the preamble of the proposal of the nature restoration law, which is not definitely the positive sentence. So now we have the nature restoration law, which is in fact the regulation as it is proposed. So it should be directly applicable and implementable in member states. This is quite strong legislative tool. And I hope that it will help us to reach targets as they are written for deadlines in 2030, 40, and 50. What is also important, and I didn't tell that, uh, is that uh, the nature restoration law, when we talk about uh, species and, ecos or, and habitats, is really linked directly to Habitats Directive because 
Uh, it's focused on those habitat types and those species that are listed in annexes of the Habitats Directive. So that's why I have it in one slide here. The approach, it was said during the first session, um, the scientific one, we are somehow going through the evolution in the nature conservation. From protection, it was 50s, 60s, 70s, the last, last century, through conservation, uh, and now we are in a restoration, although uh, a difference between conservation and restoration would be a bit fuzzy, but I would add one thing that is important, and it was also mentioned already, there is also adaptation, and mitigation is also a part of it. So when we talk about restoration, I think almost everything is inside, everything that is really needed for the improvement of the state. We are not just talking about restoration. If there is a need, a protection approach, non-intervention, let's take it is, as it is. If there is a need for active management measures, then it's also a part of it, adaptation and mitigation also. And now, let's go through targets. The first, and somehow the most important, uh, it's, it seems to be at least, is the restoration of habitats. There are three different deadlines uh, till 2030. 30% of area of each group of habitat types under, should be under restoration measures that are, improving, that are improving the state of those habitat types. There is a certain space for member states because we are not talking about each habitat type separately, we are talking about groups of habitat types. So each member state can somehow select what is the most important selection of habitat types for them. In 2040, 60% of those habit areas, 60 of areas of those habitat types should be under restoration. Until 2050, 90% should be restored, resilient, and adequately protected, which is quite important because we are also talking about the legal protection. If that time, there is no some better tool for it. We talk not just about protected areas. We talk about the entire, each member state landscape. So we are talking about so-called uh, reference uh, areas of each habitat type, which is something like a potential natural area where it should, have be, where it should be naturally if we uh, didn't uh, modify the landscape. So the geographical scope, as I said, is, this is not just, that, just about wilderness or very natural areas. This is also about uh, managed landscapes. It's also about heavily managed landscapes. But we are also focused, and we will talk about it a bit more in other targets. It's also focused on agricultural land as well as forestry and, and forests. Uh, please enjoy this slide because this is the only with some nature on it. Uh, I have all others just with some information. Information and data. We talked about it. The main source of information and data for us when we are talking about monitoring and reporting success, hopefully success in the future is reporting under Article 17 of the Habitats Directive. I'm sure that a majority of you, if not all, are aware about what does it mean, how it looks like. It's reported in six year long period by member states to the European Commission. And the current state is that 80% of habitat types and of course species are in a poor status. So this is just to add how we will measure it. Uh, the information is quite nice. If you look at the situation about data and uh, information about biodiversity globally, this is definitely one of the best, one of the best uh, data sets that are existing. And th that exists for the whole, let's say, continent, or for, not for the continent, but for the European Union countries. Uh, unfortunately, some of those uh, reporting data are based on uh, expert opinions, but even though this is not so accurate, it's very, very, uh, very uh, detailed, or it's enough detail or sufficiently detailed to use it for the nature restoration law uh, planning and, uh, planning and uh, uh, monitoring. The next target, and I didn't say, of course, uh, sorry, there are, because when we talk about this, uh, uh, those habitat types and their restoration. There are some specific habitat types with specific goals. We talked about peatlands. This is one of them. And we also talk about species. So this is not about, let's say, uh, management of species themselves, but we also should talk about uh, improvement of state of biotopes of those species. This is not here in the slides. Restoration of urban areas. This is quite new issue. Uh, what is the task for member states is to somehow stop the loss of green space and urban tree canopy uh, 
till 2030 compared to 2021, so the year ago. And what is important is the geographical scope, which is in all cities and in towns and suburbs. There is also a task to increase a total national area of urban green space at least for 3% till 2040 and 5% by 2050. And in addition to that, in that target, a minimum of 10 percent urban tree canopy cover should be covered or in, in each or in each city and town and suburbs uh, uh, 10 percent should be really created or be, should be covered by tree canopy till 2050 and uh, a net gain of urban green space that is integrated into existence yeah, and this is the task that is really to integrate this approach this urban greening approach we can call it also green infrastructure approach to let's say urban planning and spatial development in short Restoration of rivers. Uh, there is a task to restore and to, let's say, improve the natural connectivity of rivers and natural functions of the related floodplains. We saw the picture of uh, Beluga Sturgeon. It could be a very nice indicator because the task is to restore at least 25,000 kilometers of rivers into free flowing rivers. What does it mean, free flowing state? This is a question. Still, this is under development, and we should talk about it later. We are at the beginning. Of course, one of the main tools for us is to remove barriers, but in not all cases it's possible. Also, we need to harmonize it with some other needs. But the task is here, and we should divide it among member states. Restoration of pollinator populations, which is quite important. And the task is in short to reverse the decline of pollinators' populations till 2030, also by improving the agriculture methods, uh, not using so much chemicals in it, etc. Uh, and another task is to um, increase the net of pollinator populations uh, that should be measured that should be measured every three years after 2030. We are also at the beginning of this task, so now I think this is also not only for the nature conservationists, but also for scientists and researchers to help us to, to somehow uh, propose how to tackle with this. And uh, I'm really happy that now, after 10 years of negotiations, we are not talking just about honeybee, but we know that the pollinators, it means all those hundreds and thousands species of insecta that are important for us in this. Restoration of agriculture ecosystem. When we talked about ecosystem, um, uh, ecosystem target, uh, eco habitat types, uh, groups, ecosystem uh, target, we talked about area-based uh, conservation measures. Now we are going to two targets uh, that are indicator-based. You will see it. The task for the agriculture ecosystems is to uh, enhance biodiversity of agriculture ecosystems. Of course, it's simple to say that, but it's quite hard to implement it. Those are the indicators so far developed or proposed to be, uh, a, let's say, measure for the improvement. All those indicators should be um, increasing or showing in the future uh, improving uh, improvement of the state. We can go back to the slide if there is a need, uh, but the same approach is uh, proposed for forest ecosystems, where you see a longer list of indicators. But those two list of indicators, they are still under development, and I believe that they will be uh, somehow completed in the following months or the next year based on the scientific uh, and technical discussions. What is also important, how it will be implemented, what is, the, let's say, what is, let's say, the, the, the managerial frame or the, the governance frame for the implementation of nature restoration law? Every member state should propose so-called national restoration plan. This national restoration plan is submitted to the European Commission, and the European Commission assesses that in six months and sends that back to member state. Uh, of course, it's expected that the member state will complete the job and will uh, amend all those comments that are really important. And it's also in a period in, of six months, so after one year, uh, every member state should have really approved uh, nature, national restoration plan. We don't know 
in which time exactly this period will start because the nature restoration law is still not approved. So this is something that is unclear, but we can talk maybe about 2024, probably. And then this uh, national restoration law should be valid for 10 years and reviewed, of course, regularly. Uh, because there will be some reporting, uh, some reporting exercises as a part of this. So we have also a timetable for the task. So here is the full list. Uh, as you can see, we are combining uh, area-based targets as well as indicator-based targets. Some of them are developed quite well when we talk about habitat types, when we talk about species. We also know a lot about agricultural ecosystems, forests, about rivers, but there are also some areas that are still under development and we need to talk more at the technical level about how to really implement it. Uh, so we have also the indicator approach here. In my last, very last slide, there is just uh, one or a few, few thoughts about preconditions that are important for us, although this is not a part that shouldn't be a part of my presentation. I need to say that, that and it was also said already, the biggest problem is capacity, and I don't believe that we talk about money, because money are there, and some of those measures are not so expensive. We are talking about human capacities. This is not about the number of hands that we have, this is also about technical capacity. So we don't have enough experts. In some countries, there is a huge lack of experts, and we need to train them before we will really start to work in the whole country, and, and we will, if we want to be successful in this, this is a really uh, but something like a bottleneck. Stakeholders' participation, it cannot be based just on the state administration activity. It really must be done together with owners, corporate, etc. Otherwise, we are really not successful. Those uh, stakeholders, they really need to be a driver together with us. Political will, of course, and in my view, the mainstreaming. When it's just a separate sector, we will not be successful again. It must be a part of the agriculture forestry and other activities in the future. So thank you very much. Just as an introduction, uh, and that's all from my side. Thank you, Michael, for the, let's say, overall perspective on the issue. And now we're gonna zoom in on a few of the aspects you got to see. Now, Pavel Litera is going to address you. Pavel Litera works at BROS, an acronym for the original name of the Slovakian Regional Association for Nature Conservation and Sustainable Development. Pavel is the vice chairman of BROS and a senior site manager of several projects. Having grasslands as his favorite working topic, Pavel has years of experience cooperating with local farmers and site managers. And as you probably all expect now, he's gonna talk us through the issue of agricultural ecosystem and the proposal. The floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I would like to present some uh, practical results from the field and uh, some experience from cooperation with local farmers. And my favorite topic is restoration of grassland habitats and especially restoration of grazing. So let's go for it. Uh, so as we know, uh, the grassland habitats uh, throughout Europe are in uh, most cases in unfavorable or uh, unfavorable bad conservation status. Uh, many uh, or large areas of them were uh, uh, lost or destroyed in the past uh, by turning to arable land, afforestation and intensive use. But this was uh, especially a matter in, of past. Uh, but now I would say uh, the biggest challenge, is especially in Central and East, Eastern Europe, uh, is uh, their degradation uh, due to abandonment and overgrowing. As you can see on this picture, that's a typical state uh, of grassland. Uh, uh, you can see it's overgrown by shrubs. You can see the spread of dominant grasses and invasive plants, which is really not good for the target species. Uh, so to tackle this process, the main challenge is to restore grazing on uh, or these traditional types of management on these abandoned grasslands. 
Of course, the easiest task would be uh, to buy some sheep and graze them by, by ourselves, but in this way, you could restore one or two sites, but not so many, yeah? But if you want to think about uh, on a broader level, then uh, you come to a point that you have to focus on cooperation with local farmers, because if you establish successful models here, uh, then you can do it on much more sites. So we come to a point that the cooperation with local farmers is crucial if you want to succeed. Of course, this is easily said, but not that easily done, because uh, as our project started, uh, I spent like weeks and months uh, meeting with local farmers, discussing, uh, trying to persuade them to cooperate, but they didn't, uh, somehow in the beginning, they didn't trust and they, they thought it wouldn't work because the sites were fragmented, there was no grazing infrastructure, they, their state was really bad, so it was really difficult to gain their trust. And uh, here I would like to emphasize that the work of site managers is very important and we need good people in the field. And uh, I mean, you cannot make uh, decisions on the paper or some maps uh, from computer. You have to meet with the people on the ground because each farmer is different. Each farmer has a different situation and each side is different. So, I mean, you have to talk with them a lot. You have to have many meetings. And based on that, you can come to solutions which can work. So really, it involves a lot of work in the field. But if you succeed, uh, you can turn a site from a state like this. You can see it's really overgrown and the habitats are in a very bad status. Uh, status. It's actually one of the, or I would say the most precious salt marsh site in Slovakia. So this is how it looked before the project. So you wouldn't be very proud of it, although it's a Natura 2000 site. And this is how it looks after two years of grazing, which was done uh, by Life Project. So. You can see there the managers, it's the water buffaloes, and of course the local farmer. And uh, so you can see now the site looks much better. And on these grassland sites, the, uh, the rare plant species could thrive. And thanks to this project, uh, this life project, uh, we could increase the populations of uh, several critically endangered plant species in Slovakia by multiple fold. Even some, like the one on the right top, uh, was uh, close to extinction in Slovakia, and now its population is much, much bigger, so which is a very encouraging result. This is all thanks to the restored grazing and the restored management. And also the status of these salt marsh habitats and uh, uh, trend and future outlook has improved. And also, of course, uh, uh, there were very positive impacts on birds and insect biodiversity. So we come to a point that, of course, grazing works very well for nature and biodiversity when it's set in a nature-friendly and sustainable way. But what is important uh, when you set it properly, uh, grazing works very well also for local people. So it can be really a win-win situation. So it's, it's not that people lose from it, but local people uh, can gain from it. And what is important, this is very often uh, isolated villages which are not centers of industry or some IT services or so on. And uh, you can see that uh, from this uh, same site, we did the restoration of the site, but the local people in the village, in the village nearby, uh, made themselves a visitor center, they make tours on horse carriages, they even organize a village festival, a, a grey cattle festival, where they make products uh, from these cows which are grazed on the site, and then they invite all the village, the aunties, the women make traditional cookies, they have mu music, music, so really Really nice event and a way that uh, local people can benefit from nature restoration. Uh, of course, this was example from one side, uh, but we have already now uh, restored grazing in a similar manner on more than 80 grassland sites uh, throughout all Slovakia, and this covers some of the most valuable sites uh, of grasslands, be it uh, salt marshes, dry grasslands, or sand dune habitats. Uh, and uh, mostly, like close to 90% of it, was in cooperation with local farmers. Which, what is important, uh, 
from these projects, we do only the initial investment. So we help them with uh, permissions and all the infrastructure they need, for example, like electric fencing, uh, watering wells, or small shelters for the animals. But all the grazing is up to them. So they are rest responsible afterwards, and we never pay them for grazing. So then they stand on their own feet. Uh, so this this is here you can see it on the map So it's rather a big radius of maybe 400 kilometers and you can see the sites here So it's quite quite many already uh, And still we would like to do more and there is really Possibilities to do more because when this system works it can be replicated also on other sites But what we need for it of course is effective funding this means uh, uh, but uh, it's not a kind of waste of money. It pays off because you do only the initial investment and if the system is set properly, then uh, the farmers take care of the habitat management th themselves and of course under observation of experts. Uh, but uh, uh, it produces uh, these local products, uh, these ecosystem services, so it does pay off on the long term. But what is important is funding has to be flexible open and result-oriented, so uh, also open, for example, to NGOs and uh, active stakeholders. And in this case, I think uh, the way the LIFE program is working is a very good example, because you have only the target set, and you have uh, enough time, like let's say five or six years, to meet it, and it's up to you what way you choose to meet it. But the results, of course, have to be sustainable, which is important. So I would say uh, to meet all these targets of the nature restoration law, uh, we need on, not only the targets of themselves, but we, we also have to think about the source of financing and especially uh, about setting it properly so it really works for nature. So I think this is also a point to think and talk about. So this would be all from my side. So thank you for attention. Thank you, Pavel. Thank you. And now on to forest ecosystems. I would like to invite here on the stage Tomáš Pospíšil. Tomáš Pospíšil is the deputy director and economist of the University Enterprise Masaryk Forest in Křtiny of the Czech Mendel University in Brno. For more than 20 years, Tomáš worked for the State Forest Enterprise Lesy České Republiky, where he gathered experience from various positions, from a ranger to a forest district manager and regional director to the top management. Here to talk more about the nature restoration law proposal and forest ecosystems. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I need to edit. <coughs> uh, hello to everyone. I need to edit that I'm a member of uh, CSO, also <coughs> as, as a vice president, and uh, uh, not uh, so intensive uh, beekeeper. That uh, mean I <laughs> support the pollinators also, like not uh, only a bees. Yeah, uh, uh, my task is uh, if uh, the forest ecosystem are included in the national uh, in in a uh, natural restoration law. And uh, I'm not sure if I'm a right person here because uh, I am uh, <clears throat> I am inv involved people as you are here, and uh, I think that we need uh, to talk uh, with other uh, people which uh, are uh, in the forestry uh, community, uh, which are not uh, included in our community, and they. Uh, give us uh, the questions uh, that we need to uh, answer, that we, if, if we need to find an answers for these questions. And, uh, but I will try to be a devil advocate and I will try to think like that people which are, and in my opinion, it's a, it's a mainstream in forestry, not even in the Czech Republic, but uh, uh, even in whole Europe mostly. Yeah, that's right. Uh, I'd like to talk about uh, broadly layer of the forestry and the connections uh, of the forestry uh, industrial, which is connected to the forestry. And uh, um, the first, uh, I would like to say that uh, we have uh, lots of forest in, in the in the UA or, or uh, on the whole continent, uh, but. Uh, 
why I mm, present this map, not only uh, because uh, there is uh, 182 million hectares of the forest and uh, it's important uh, area for us uh, uh, as, as a part of a landscape, but uh, it's uh, very important for the forest land owners and uh, for, uh, for the uh, in industry which is connected to the forest. And uh, you have to mention that uh, uh, there is a lot of money in that and we need to talk to the all the participants were uh, is connected to this uh, part of the uh, sector uh, uh, forestry and wood product community which is uh, very enhanced and uh, it's uh, very strong uh, and uh, the lobbying in this uh, community is it's uh, very big uh, uh, EU average is 37% uh, of forest covering, it's uh, more than one third, and it's the same situation in Czech Republic also. More than one third is covered by the forest, another third is uh, covered by the agricultural um, landscape, meadows and, and uh, cropland and this stuff. And the uh, third, uh, the last part is uh, covered by the urban and uh, infrastructure. Yeah, and uh, it, it's not... Uh, uh, it's, it's a very important uh, number, but uh, why I uh, talking about uh, the agricultural uh, has uh, uh, in the EU uh, the common policy of agricultural, and the forestry doesn't have the uh, common policy f for forestry. Uh, I don't know if it's good or bad because uh, we see what. Uh, the common policy for agricultural could do, could, um, uh, what is the impact of this uh, policy in the past time, yeah? And uh, sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad, and we have to discuss. But uh, the forestry uh, uh, on the one third of the coverage of the uh, uh, EU uh, has uh, not only, but has a strategy 2030. And uh, I'm thanks that we have this one, and uh, this is the, uh, uh, the topics which are uh, inside uh, this f f forest strategy. And uh, you see that uh, it's connected uh, to also to nature restoration targets, which it's connected to uh, sustainable forest management, but it's a still strategy. And we need to uh, put it in the practice, uh, put it in the uh, in the forest uh, and uh, to make a sustainable uh, forest management, not only on the paper, but in a practice. And it's a, it's a main target that we need to do, but uh, my ask is how we can do it, because there is a lot of money, there is a connected industry, and it's not easy uh, to, to, I think, um, convince uh, the forest land owner that uh, this way is uh, for them a uh, better way uh, that give them uh, benefits that uh, it's not only a way that uh, uh, get some restrictions for them and we need to convince them not restrict it and I think it's a, a main message what I w would like to say about uh, uh, the future communication of nature restoration law in forestry there is a lot of money, there is a lobbying, there is a industry, and we need to convince the uh, uh, landowners that uh, brings us not only for public or for society, but to, uh, each, uh, to each owners uh, the benefits, not only in a economic, but in other ways. Uh, the last slide is uh, with uh, uh, questions. Uh, there's a lot of questions uh, what I'm thinking about and I think that we couldn't read it but uh, we uh, could just discuss it uh, after after these presentations uh, because there is a lot of way how we can do it and I think that we have uh, uh, lots of examples uh, around the Europe where we can see it and we can when we can uh, demonstrate it to the foresters that the closer, close to nature forestry or closer to nature forestry or 
uh, uneven aged forestry uh, or uh, ecological forestry system uh, or uh, continuous cover forestry. We could call it in many ways because there is uh, lots of types uh, this management system and, uh, and uh, uh, silvicultural that it's uh, very close to uh, mm, uh, biodiversity to very close to uh, economic effectivity and also bring us a lot of another uh, synergic uh, effects. And I think that uh, uh, the, this type of ma maintenance of, uh, of the forest is much better for landowners and for the society also. Uh, I don't know if we use this question maybe later because uh, the time uh, goes uh, runs uh, very fast. But uh, I would like to uh, say uh, the last uh, sentence because uh, one of my friends uh, from Switzerland in, in Switzerland said that uh, the mm, close to nature forestry is uh, uh, for all the type of the forest. And it just doesn't work where it's not tried. Yeah, and I think that's a main message to forest owners. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for sharing with us your perspective on this. And now the last piece of the presentations of this panel should be presented online, I would like to welcome Vera Coelho. Hi, Vera, nice to see you virtually again. Hello. Vera is a senior director of advocacy in Europe at the Oceana, Oceana nonprofit organization. Vera is a political scientist with 15 years of experience working with national, European, and global environment NGOs to protect both fresh and saltwater ecosystems. She is quite intimately familiar with the EU decision-making processes, which is why she leads Oceana's campaigns and policy, communications, and science work in Europe. Vera, the floor is yours, and I hope I'm really pronouncing your name correctly as I need to work on my Portuguese, so. <laughs> that is absolutely perfect. Thank you very much, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. I am really, really sorry that I cannot be with you in person in Prague, but thank you for giving me the opportunity to bring up marine ecosystems. Um, so. As you may notice, I chose a bit of a provocative title for this presentation because the ocean tends to get forgotten. But I wanted to remind you that it is in fact the largest ecosystem on Earth and it is essential to all of our survival. The ocean and the life that it harbors underpins our climate system and it has absorbed 90% of the excess heat that we have pumped into the atmosphere. So if we have escaped the very worst consequences of climate change so far, we can thank the ocean for it. But the ocean is in trouble and so much so that it may, st it may soon stop giving us that buffer. So decades after the adoption of key environmental laws that we already heard about today, such as the Bird and Birds and Habitats Directives, but also the Marine Strategy Framework Directive, most assessed marine species and habitats in the EU are in poor or bad status. So we are in urgent need of restoration action at sea and the Commission's proposal for the nature restoration law is very welcome in this regard. But why is the marine environment in such dire need of restoration? Well, the biggest pressure on ocean biodiversity is fisheries. And it's not only the over extraction of fish and of other living marine resources, but it's also destructive fishing methods. For example, bottom trawling, which is when you drag a heavy weighted net through the ocean floor, catching everything in its wake and also destroying seabed habitats. And the thing is that fisheries are an exclusive competence of the EU. So they're managed through the Common Fisheries Policy, the CFP, which means that for fishing activities that take place outside 12 nautical miles from shore, member states cannot do anything on their own. They need the other member states and the commission to agree. 
And as you can imagine, this is a perfect recipe for very, very little action to tackle the environmental impacts of fishing. So the key message that I want you to leave this conference with today is the following. The nature restoration law will fail in the marine environment unless it addresses fisheries adequately. However, the Commission's proposal simply assumes that the CFP will deliver the necessary action for restoration, which is baffling, to say the least. So, in our view, if the nature restoration law is to succeed in the marine environment, it needs to include three key things. Firstly, it needs to give a stringent deadline to member states to come up with these jointly agreed measures under the CFP to enable restoration at sea as part of their national restoration plans. And this does not mean changing the CFP at all. It simply means saying, you have this tool in the CFP, use it. And if you don't use it by this deadline, there will be a consequence. Secondly, it needs to recognize that the most effective and cost-efficient form of restoration at sea is passive restoration. Leaving an area untroubled by fisheries and by other destructive activities is straightforward, and it should not take years to decide upon. We don't have time. We are in this climate and biodiversity emergency. We need to act now. And thirdly, and finally, the non-degradation provision that is inscribed in the nature restoration law needs to be operationalized. And how can this be done? Well, by granting protected status to the restoration areas at sea. It really makes no sense to restore a marine area and then just bottom troll it again. The nature restoration law really gives us an opportunity to operationalize the 10% strict protection target adopted in the EU biodiversity strategy. So those are the key messages I wanted to leave you with. I hope you appreciated the pretty pictures of marine life. I thought by this time you would be quite done with graphs and words. So thank you for your attention. I look forward to the debate. Thank you, Vera. Thank you, Vera, for joining us online, and I hope you stay online. And now I would like to invite all the speakers who were present here during this panel to come back on the stage and join me in the discussion. So that would be Pavel, Tomáš and Michal. Before we start with the discussions and gentlemen figure it out here, <laughs> you can also use the seat there if you want. Oh, okay. um, I would like to encourage you again to submit, both you here and those of you watching online, to submit your questions through slido.com using the hashtag netresconf. So, but as for now, I would like to kick things off with a overall question aiming at Michael, because I would like to, since I'm a journalist, uh, which means I basically don't mind bothering people, I would like to <laughs> try to question it a bit, your presentations and the proposal as well, as from a perspective of a normal woman or man, okay? Not from your community. So, um, as for the overall level of the ambition of the proposal, even with the bulks of action postponed to 2040 and 50, is the level of ambition high enough? I cannot imagine to have higher ambitions. Uh, because in 2050, we should really live in a paradise if we follow all the targets and if we really implement everything. So far, the experience is clear. Uh, we felt in many strategies, when we talk about biodiversity strategies, etc. so decline is clear, and I think the result of it, uh, I mean also a problem in the agriculture and forestry sector as well as fishery, as we heard now, is, uh, is a problem for everyone. This is not just for scientists or technicians or for our silos. So just look at the situation this year, uh, how fragile the whole economy is, 
and how dependent we are on the natural resources. So if we really need to be more resilient, yes, this is ambitious enough, and I wouldn't recommend to be more ambitious because then we are going behind 100% in fact. Pavel, now on to the agricultural ecosystems. Um, well, what about, you mentioned the importance of a proper communications with the farmers and with landowners, if we put it in general, let's say. Um, what of the arguments you used when approaching them worked best for you? Because, you know, some may say this is just about, it's not just about restoring peatlands, it may, it's maybe also about taking some of the land we are currently using for food production and turning it, re-establishing it for something else. So what arguments would you then use so it's not received in this way? Well, I would say that in terms of these grasslands, uh, which are in most cases abandoned, it's not that putting them aside, it's vice versa. It's uh, kind of uh, ap applying the traditional management on places which, which were not used before. So, I mean, it can be a win-win situation. So, uh, basically, it can be, can be very good also for the farmers. Uh, but first, you have to win their trust, and th this comes to the beginning of your question, so how to kind of motivate them. I wouldn't say there's uh, one universal recipe. I mean, uh, first you have to listen to them. First you have to, it's not uh, a thing of one meeting. You have to meet with them multiple times and first listen. Don't uh, listen and understand their situation because as I said, every farmer is different. Every farmer has different situation, the baseline, and every farmer has different motivation. And as you talk with them, you somehow explore what is motivating for them and where are the kind of uh, barriers that you have to help them to tackle. And uh, so when you like pick up the motivation, which is different in every farmer, then uh, you can succeed. I mean, then you can have them on board and you can have them motivated in the long term because we need to kind of, they are those who take the, the care of the grass on sites. We can only monitor it or kind of set some, uh, some maintenance for it, yeah. Mm. Tomáš, well, probably the similar goes in principle for forests and for wood production and profit revenue. Um, are there any specific examples you use or can use when approaching forest owners and explaining that maybe close to nature forestry isn't the worst way to go in terms of revenue and profits. Okay, <coughs> definitely yes, <laughs> that I would say. But uh, I mm, just um, um, give some reaction for your first question because the forest, it's a, it's a uh, long-term uh, management system. Then, uh, for example, uh, so agricultural and uh, the other landscape. But uh, I think uh, I view it in, in a two different ways. One is uh, that uh, you ha we have uh, the system, how we can do it. It's close to nature. It's uh, not necessary to enlarge uh, the uh, area of a forest land. Yeah, that says Rudy. Uh, also, that we have enough uh, forest, but in a, in a not not good uh, uh, um, uh, different uh, uh, structure and texture and uh, the, the the tree species in there, and we need to change the mind of the forest owners and for the uh, forest managers. Then we could uh, this uh, plan is very ambitious, and I think it's not. Uh, uh, real for uh, forestry, not in a, uh, in a knowledges, but uh, to uh, uh, to say all the forest owners that we know the way, and th this way is brings the only benefits in all the other ways, ecosystem function, economics, and uh, all the other. Yeah, and I think uh, it's uh, there is uh, six indicators. 
if, uh, uh, but it's not uh, the finally um, adjust. Yeah, but uh, these indicators, uh, the half of them has uh, some uh, measurable level, but some of them, for example, how we could uh, measure if it's close or closer to nature or uh, another forestry management system. Yeah, it's, it's not easy to, 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 to find a measurable level uh, for, this, for this type. But I think uh, it's ambitious and I will be very pleased if uh, we reached it. But as for the arguments, because I get it, you mentioned that we don't need a bigger forest area. We already mm. <laughs> have enough of that. It's about the quality. And so, but what are the arguments when you approach forest owners who are, at least in the Czech Republic, very conservative, very used to planting spruce monocultures, and they know there is the revenue. So how, what are the initial arguments for you? Uh, Mm, yeah, that's what's your first question. That I was the it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's right. Sorry. Initial so that, question. Uh, yeah. But we have, uh, mm, for example, the net of the uh, close to nature forest uh, uh, managers around the Europe. Uh, for example, one of these units called uh, Prosilva uh, Europe, and uh, there is a unit uh, uh, where it's uh, close to nature forestry. Uh, which uh, it practiced uh, for more than 10, 20 years uh, in, uh, around the Europe. And it's a model system that uh, the foresters can see how can do this another management system. And it works for 10 years. And uh, it's, uh, I think, the, the best way to uh, convince them. Yeah, for example. Thank you. Well, now on to marine ecosystems. Vera, are you still with us? We, ho we yes, certainly I hope so. Yes, you're there. So, um, as you mentioned, we should not forget about marine ecosystems and the targets outlined can be a real game changer. However, there is some criticism that they risk being not implementable because they are dependent on the, some say, ineffective procedures of the common fisheries policy. So um, what is your take on that? Yes, absolutely. Uh, I think it's important to say that it's, you know, it's not that some say these mechanisms are ineffective. Um, they are, in fact, ineffective. So out of the more than 3,400 marine Natura 2000 sites that we have, and after, after almost 10 years of implementation of the CFP, only six joint recommendations have been adopted by member states to manage fisheries impacts in marine Natura 2000 areas. Uh, and most of these in the Baltic and North Sea region. So the mechanism has been ineffective. That has also been acknowledged by the European Court of Auditors in a report that they released um, in 2020, where the court really emphasized that this mechanism of so-called joint recommendations by member states has not worked to protect the marine environment and often just prioritizes fishing interests. So this is a real challenge that we have in the marine environment because we can adopt the most ambitious targets with the most ambition type, ambitious timelines, but if we don't provide member states with the tools to actually implement them, or if we don't provide member states with a reason to use those tools, um, then all those targets will simply not be met as they haven't been met in the last few decades. So I think this is really the crux for, for the marine environment. The targets are ambitious. The timeline is too long. Uh, I think waiting until 2050 to achieve restoration outcomes um, for all of the areas that we need to restore is is not commensurate with the crisis that we are facing. But at the end of the day, what we really need is action by member states. And right now they have no reason to take action. They can simply block action, even in the waters of other member states, if that affects their fishing interests. Uh, and this is a, a recipe for failure. Thank you. Well, we've gathered some questions online but first are there any questions here in person okay i see a raised hand there so please oh yeah we've got so many volunteers here 
Incredible. Uh, Moi Lachin, I have a question to, uh, for Thomas. Do you really expect a decreasing of biodiversity due to bark beetle? Because I expect just the opposite. And the example from Shumova says that uh, after uh, bark beetle attack, uh, biodiversity increase, especially in the field of insects and also in birds species. Thank you. Yeah, I don't expect uh, that the biodiversity uh, decrease. Uh, I think that, uh, for example, uh, the bird index, not only the um, forestry bird, uh, common forestry bird index is growing up because uh, there's uh, lots of clear cut and uh, there's uh, uh, grass and, and the brushes and uh, other tree species. And uh, the, the biodiversity, I think, will increase a little bit uh, uh, in, in, in this uh, limited time. But uh, if the forester uh, doesn't make the changes uh, with this management system and then plant uh, uh, again uh, the monocultures or just uh, the stand uh, covered with uh, two or three uh, different tree species, there we have uh, the same layer, uh, the, not the monoculture, but even aged forest, and we have a uh, the same problem after, I, I don't know, seven decades. Yeah, and uh, then uh, I think that uh, the biodiversity uh, we could lose again. Yeah, and we have, to, we have to change the management system to even aged forestry, where is the uh, different layers, different tree, tree species, uh, different brushes, and uh, uh, this bring us biodiversity more than the only a plantation with a three or five uh, tree species. Gentlemen, would any of like you to react on this or can we move on to... Okay, so then let's try the online questions. There is one aiming at Michael, I'd say. How do you think payment for ecosystem services can strengthen our restoration efforts? E.g., for example, payment for carbon removal from the atmosphere. I think this is quite a difficult question for me. Ecosystem services evaluation and, uh, let's say, payment methods, this is something still tricky because we uh, experienced a period in which it was quite famous, popular, and a lot of politicians, they wanted to get such big numbers, what is the evaluation of the ecosystem services and monetary value, for example. But I have no any case or experience with uh, something else than just local examples when it was really implemented well, when it was used. Because just imagine you are a politician, you will get such a big number that some ecosystem services in some area has, have some value. What you will do with this? If it is really not developed like a local community or something like uh, since the beginning uh, as the economy uh, system that is really self-sustainable, then I don't believe that the, uh, the method itself will help. Uh, because what we are talking here is not just the ecosystem services, let's say, value, the monetary, um, uh, that is somehow counted monetarily, but we are talking about an uh, intrinsic value of biodiversity too. But if I may just add something that is not directly about this question, I think what we are talking here is, and what is quite important about the implementation and ambitious, ambitious, uh, we are talking about the, the regulation. We are talking about legislative tool. This is something that is really imposed by the European Commission, by states, directly to, to landowners, to, to public, etc. And I believe that this is something that can help us to improve the state in the future because strategies that are with pledges only, it doesn't help a lot. Uh, but if, if we really want to be successful in the implementation, we, we, we need to start as soon as possible uh, to communicate it well, to start the participation process with landowners, but also with the public. Otherwise, it will be just a legislative piece of paper, nothing more. So, and this is the same about ecosystem services. It's still a bit theoretical approach. Gentlemen, would you like to add anything? Maybe, mm. Pavel, from your point of view? My question to, to, to Michael, how we can uh, communicate it? It's not easy. Uh, uh, could you imagine what, what the way? 
in general, this is quite difficult, but I think you can use examples of, of, of this year and for the last few years, the, the, the climate change that is going to be faster and faster. Mm -hmm. Of course, what is the impact to reproduction in agriculture and forestry, because this is something that touches the, the, the public and also our society, uh, something that is connected to, uh, to, to, to economy itself. When we talk just about the nature and biodiversity, we won't be successful because we need to somehow uh, communicated people what is important for their lives. Yeah. And I don't believe that for majority of society, the nature and biodiversity is one of the, mo of the, of the most important priorities. I would agree that uh, communicating uh, these positive results, especially because I think we have many uh, of positive results, and especially not in just in case of numbers, but really showing, let's say, in media, on social networks, uh, the results in the field with real people, not just numbers or graphs or something, but the real stories of real people who could benefit from the restored habitats, because there are many. And I think this is what works on like common people, not just the experts and like the public opinion. So, because there are really many positive news and especially in this world of many crises and war and so on, I think we also need positive news to keep above the water level. So yeah, I think there's a lot, I, I, I think a lot is done, but still I think a lot more can be done. I believe there's time for one last question, and I've got several online, but I also want to inspect if there would be any raised hands in the audience as well. None whatsoever? Great. So then I'll take one last. Um, Tomáš, how should we finance protection of forests? Should the costs fall on forest managers? the forest industry or governmental institutions or some others? Yeah, it's not uh, the easy question. And uh, if I say <coughs> the, mm, uh, the truth, I, I, I think that uh, the forestry doesn't need a subsidize anymore. I think that uh, the forestry could be uh, sustainable with the economy uh, balanced and uh, the other as a social as a, as a uh, biodiversity uh, the, all the three pillars which makes the uh, uh, sustainable forestry uh, could be in a balance without any subsidize but we need to uh, understand we need to uh, follow the natural processes and uh, the use these natural processes and uh, we couldn't uh, we couldn't expect uh, more than the the nature can bring us in a, in a wood in a timber and also in other uh, benefits from the from the uh, this this type of landscape this, this type of habitat yeah but uh, if you ask me if there be some subsidies i think uh, that we could um, uh, make a, some type of subsidies uh, that uh, 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 decrease the pressure on production function, yeah, and I think could be ecosystem function and uh, subsidize this, but I am not sure how we can do it. It's not easy uh, to uh, set the indicators that you're in the right management system and you bring to society, to uh, uh, forest owner and to the foresters and other sectors which is connected to this uh, that brings uh, all the benefits that need it. Yeah, but it's not easy question. Sorry. If I would just may add because uh, following my previous answer about ecosystem services because this is connected to what, you, what Tomáš said now. I wouldn't like to throw everything out like the ecosystem yeah. services, etc. There are some schemes that really work well, something like carbon offsets, etc. But you need to have a partner for it. You need to, to really have some cooperation since the beginning, because if you do it just for the political sphere, then there is no a real customer. You need a society inside. So I can imagine that some of those methods work when we talk about forestry, agriculture, etc. But we need to somehow redevelop them themselves. Yeah. Time passes by quickly, but if it's a short one, <laughs> then we'll try. I think that 
There was one first, but. Maybe a question, maybe a comment. Um, I, th I think what I'm, what I'm missing to a certain extent, I might, you've talked about integration and needing to have to have a holistic perspective, especially on the forestry. I think it's one case where we need to go, need to go beyond that. Uh, we're talking basically about the supply side. Uh, how much forest can you cut? Under what circumstances? What do you leave? Et cetera, et cetera. I think we also need to look at the demand side in terms of how can we ensure that we need less wood or we make rather better use of the wood that we have through cascading use of the wood, for example. Because as we, I mean, there's already high pressure, that in pressure is increasing for biomass for energy, for example, and it's only going to increase in the future, for example, for chemical feedstocks, plastics, all these things right now that we rely on fossil fuels for, they're gonna look next to lignin from, from, from forest, from, from biomass. So how do we, change the system so that we have not just uh, the current situation where we cut down trees, we turn them into wood chips, we cut down trees, we make houses out of them, but can we actually make a cascaded use of wood? And for that, I think we need to start talking not just to the foresters, I totally agree with you, but we also need to talk to the supply side, uh, to those that are working on that. Thanks. Okay, I think we need to let that be a commentary and discuss it <laughs> over a cup of coffee because right now, the time is due, um, and I invite you to the coffee break, which is all set up in the foyer. And I thank all our participants here, and also to Vera Coelho, thank you for joining us online. And see you in, let's say, 30 minutes, 30 minutes for the third and the fourth panel. Thank you so much for joining us. Mm -hmm. Thank you to coming back. Uh, I'm really happy that uh, you stay with us also for uh, this section. I've got good and bad news. Uh, bad news is that it was the last refreshment for today. And uh, the good news is that now we've got more than two hours for discussions and we can be happy for this. We have already heard that uh, science can show us the way for nature restoration and we also saw some very useful examples for, for the good practice. Uh, this knowledge could and should also um, contribute significantly in the planning of implementation of nature restoration measures. But the work doesn't stop here. This third panel is oriented to all challenging issues connected with the implementation of the nature restoration. So now let me to invite the first speaker, uh, Janika Borg, uh, who will introduce us uh, uh, the topic. Uh, she is the coordinator of the European Environmental Agency's work on biodiversity protection and restoration. And uh, she is originally the marine biologist, but she gradually moved into the policy world. So we can be lucky that she, she will say, tell us now the presentation. Floor is yours. And thank you. All right. Thank you so much. And if I could get my slides up on the screen, please. So let's start. Hope you had a good coffee break and are eager to hear some more. The world we live in is not an easy place. And this describes more or less the reality for most of us in the room for the last two years. First, we had a global wave of the COVID-19 pandemic. That is followed by a wave of recession, and looming over this is the ever-present climate change. 
And not to make things easy, we have biodiversity collapse uh, moving towards our way. This picture doesn't even mention the terrible war in Ukraine at the moment. And what are we told to do? To simplify the message, we're told to wash our hands and stay safe. Well, I hope there's more we can do than that. Let's focus on the biodiversity crisis. I work for the European Environment Agency, and we produce the States and Outlook report every five years. And here is a outlook from the last report we had. You don't need to see the nitty-gritty text, but if you look overall at this picture, you can see that the past trends show that we have done so-and-so on the low-carbon and resource-efficient economy sector, so moving towards a more low-carbon economy. But we have been largely unable to make a significant impact on the degradation of nature. And when we couple this with the outlook towards 2030, it's not a pretty picture. If we continue this way, we will not reach our goals. We have to do more for the environment in Europe. So what is happening at the moment? If you look at the far left there, you see the, the results from the IPES report, summary report on biodiversity, which shows that over uh, five, 600 years, in all uh, of these selected species groups, we have species going extinct. In the middle, you see the conservation status of habitats at the EU level, and that's not very good either. Neither is the conservation status of species, and these two graphs are from the same report, the state and outlook of the environment in Europe. Only 15% of our habitats are in good conservation status, and 45 are in poor, 36 are, are seen to be bad. The same numbers for species are 27 uh, in good conservation status, 42 in poor, and 21 in bad. This is results we have based on actual data that we collected, and we also know where these habitats are. Here you see the habitats marked by member state level, and you see them going from good to poor to bad, and you can actually see that there's quite a bit of red on this map in Europe. We have the same map for species, uh, a little bit greener here, but you've got to remember that species do need habitats for their living. So the biodiversity crisis is real, and what are we doing about it? We're looking to the biodiversity strategy for 2030 to make a change, to guide us towards the change that we need. Um, it's based on these four pillars, protecting nature, restoring nature, transformative change, and the global agenda. We're here today to talk about the nature uh, restoration part, but of course, as we've heard the whole morning and, and in the previous session, we need a transformative change in our thinking to be able to implement that well. And I'm thanking the colleagues at the Commission for this slide and some of the graphs in the next slides as well that they have produced. Okay, a little bit of recap, since I think you had a good coffee break and maybe you don't remember all of this anymore. So, overarching targets of the nature restoration law. By 2030, restoration measures will cover 20% of EU's land and sea. And by 2050, measures will be in place for all ecosystems in need of restoration. And I like the fact that somebody described this as utopia um, before the break. And we really need to get that. We need the utopia. The work is taken forward under these eight work streams that you can see here. And since we had such a good presentation before the break from Michael on the different targets, I'm not going to repeat that for you. But I am going to talk about what does this actually mean? What, what, are we talking about just restoring nature? Actually, we're not. We're talking about something so much more. So we're talking about ensuring urban green spaces for people who live in cities. We're talking about our ecosystems, that they should be functioning, and that they should sustain our livelihoods. We're actually talking about our future as humans. We also talk about building environmental resilience. Just think about the past two summers, you know, forest fires. Before that, we had floods. It's, it's an annual event now to have something like this happening, and we need to do something about that. On a political level, the nature restoration law helps us support the Green Deal and a sustainable transition towards this. 
So really, we're not here just to restore nature. We're here to restore the way we live on this planet and ensure that we can continue doing so. So what do we do at the EEA for this? EEA works to provide actionable knowledge and we support both the Commission but especially the member states in this process. So we're a supporting role. It's important to remember that once the law is implemented, the decision on what to restore and where it is restored is always taken by the member states. So we have no say in that. What we do is we guide. We provide guidance, we provide knowledge, we provide support. And we are the ones who are gonna try and ensure harmonization between the plans. On a more detailed level, here's, here's some of the tasks that have been planned for the European Environment Agency. The law has not yet been implemented, but as it reads now, we're going to support the development of the national restoration plans. We're also going to support the Commission uh, in the assessment of these plans. We're going to develop IT infrastructure and support reporting and data flows. We're going to monitor the progress towards targets and data visualization, and we're going to report every three years on the EU-level progress. There's also plans to have a IT help desk for member states once they start implementing this plan. We already have a few tools in place, a few knowledge providing sites for our biodiversity work, and naturally, since this is about biodiversity, at the end of the day, this will help in the process of the nature restoration as well. We have what is finally known as BIS, FIS, WISE, and WISE Marine. So BIS for Biodiversity Information System, FIS for Forest Information System, WISE Marine for the uh, Water Information System for Marine Part, and the corresponding one for Freshwater. We already have a Climate Adapt place, and we are working together with the Knowledge Center for Biodiversity. So here are some of the tools that we already have that can help in this process. So the ambition is high. It is really high for this nature restoration law. And I guess that's one of the discussions today. Um, but we have to start seeing it as what it is. It's not a high price. It's a good investment. And it's something we really need. Uh, the resources that we put into this, for every one euro, we will get 8 to 38 euros back in economic value through the ecosystem services. I've listed some of them here. Um, food security, climate resilience, good impacts on human health. And these targets are ambitious, but they are achievable. And the question remains, is there the political will to do this? Um, at the end of this year, in December, we will finally have the COP15 in Montreal. Many of us have been waiting for that for two years now. And this is the time to step up this action also on a global level. So we really need to have uh, a global restoration agenda as well, a global call for biodiversity. And personally, I'm hoping that this will be the Paris moment for biodiversity uh, that we need, uh, counting on, on the global work to take this forward. But let's get back on EU level and on the nature restoration law. We know there's a biodiversity crisis. We know what is causing it. Climate change, pollution, invasive alien species, over-exploitation, habitat loss, humans. But humans are also a part of the solution, and the nature restoration law will be an essential piece of this solution. So we have to flip the narrative. It's not really about how much does implementation cost, um, how much do we lose if we implement nature here. That's not the question on the table. The question on the table is, what do we gain when we have healthy biodiversity? What can it give us? And as you can see here, healthy biodiversity ensures our food, ensures our food supply and security, and it does not hamper it. In fact, we cannot go on with the current way of producing our food supply, because business as usual will not be sustainable for many more years. It will protect our water, it will break down and absorb pollution, increase climate stability, help recovery from unpredictable weather events, like the ones I mentioned before. It will help minimize the risks to human health, and it will be the core of the strong sustainability. Thank you for this. Thank you very much, Yannicka. 
Thank you. How should monitoring contribute to ensure the quality of uh, nature restoration? Let me to invite Alena Klvaňová, uh, the professional ornithologist and uh, the head of international monitoring and research at the Czech uh, Society for Ornithology. Alena, please, the floor is yours. First of all, thank you very much for inviting me uh, for this important meeting in Prague and uh, for letting me introduce the monitoring scheme and the role of monitoring in the nature restoration law. Uh, I personally think that the nature restoration law proposal is a very good one and could be really efficient. However, uh, to reach the targets of the law, we definitely need to monitor and measure the progress uh, during, during the implementation. It's really crucial, not just uh, leave it on the paper, but really look if it works. And what we need uh, for monitoring and measuring the outputs is uh, to use proven methods, scientifically based methods, and also what is really important and what is crucial, I would say, is to use existing tools and methodologies. In the morning, Ladislav Miko mentioned uh, the Prague appeal message saying, look what's already working and multiply it. And it's exactly also my message to you. Uh, let's look on the methods, the methodologies and the systems and the, and the tools which are already here and which already are proven. Um, another point, really important one, would be the citizen science. Today we call it citizen science and as I will show you uh, later, it's something, it's not a modern thing, it's something quite old and uh, in respect to birds, it has quite long history for many decades already. And what is the main, main advantage of citizen science? Definitely, it's about money, as always. It's really low cost. Um, if you wish to have such a large coverage, a large coverage uh, and also long-term data sets, which is crucial to cover large areas in, during monitoring and to do it repeatedly for very long time. If you would like the scientists doing this work, you will never pay enough for it and you probably won't, lo won't find uh, too many scientists to do it. But there are many citizen scientists who are doing it already and uh, what is also important, it's low cost, but uh, I uh, really want to mention that it's not for free. Uh, such schemes need to be co coordinated and need to be supported with some funding and uh, the citizen scientist uh, must stay motivated and it costs something. Um, why I am talking about birds, uh, not only because I represent the Czech Society for Ornithology, uh, but the birds are really brilliant examples how we can monitor and how we can, uh, they can give us really good uh, answers about the wider environment. And why? Because the birds are really ubiquitous. They, they inhabit all the habitats across Europe. So uh, they are also very popular, which maybe seems not so important uh, from the st scientific point of view, but it's, for us it's really important because many people really do love birds. They know them very well, so they can be helpful. And uh, the output of this love, bird love, is that they are also well studied and we know very well about their lives, about uh, their needs. And because of all these, uh, all these uh, points, the, the birds really can mirror the state of the wider environment and we can use them uh, as the indicators. 
Now briefly about the project which I do represent here. It's called Pan-European Common Bird Monitoring Scheme, which we call PECPEMS. Uh, quite <laughs> funny, funny. Uh, but yeah, it's PECPEMS and this project uh, um, is one of the projects of European Bird Census Council. And what we do is that we gather data from all over Europe. You can see it. now we, uh, we gather data from 30 countries and 34 schemes all together and we are able to produce uh, bird population trends for 170 common bird species living in Europe. Uh, what is important, the third number in, in the third row, uh, today there are more than 15,000 15, volunteer counters across Europe who gather the data annually each breeding season for in several countries more than 40 decades. For example, in the UK, it started, uh, the, the program started in 1966. So this uh, data set is one of the biggest, uh, most long-term data sets on biodiversity, which is, which is here, which we have. Um, these schemes are quite well established already, having uh, a good, uh, good coverage and we also can use this project, this scheme, this, this huge network as a very good example also for other taxa. Not only birds can be, can be monitored like this, in this way, using citizen science. Uh, for example, the butterflies, because uh, I'm sure all of you are aware uh, of the bird in indicators delivered by PECBEMS, but there are also uh, quite recently the bird butterfly indicators. And we've been in touch with butterfly people, let's say, and we, we shared uh, our experience with them. And yeah, it's, it's the very crucial point to share the experience. We are here and we can share our experience, which is uh, now quite long term. We started the project in 2002, so we have 17 years of history. And uh, the main output of the PECBOMS are the birth indicators, which are shown on the graph and uh, the most appealing uh, indicator is the farmland bird indicator. I'm sure all of you have ever seen such, such graphs showing uh, that since 1980s, we've lost all or almost 60% of farmland birds in Europe. We also tried to uh, count the, the individual birds, and so we know now that we lost 60, 60 million, uh, 600 millions of individual birds since 1980s. Um, you may ask me, and I quite often get such questions from the public, the journalists and other, other groups, is the data reliable, the data uh, gathered by the volunteer counters? Can we rely on such data? And my question would be definitely yes, because this is uh, today so-called citizen science, but it's real science. Uh, it's uh, the data we gather are structured data. They are gathered uh, following strict methodology. And yeah, they are gathered mainly by the volunteers, non-professionals, but by the way, I also count the birds and many of you perhaps do. But the data then are uh, gathered by the professionals. Uh, the national coordinators of the schemes are professionals, usually ornithologists, but also people skilled in uh, statistics and data analysis. So there are professionals uh, in, in this, in this, in this uh, project involved, of course. And uh, how, to, how to convince you that the data are reliable? We have some science, we have some uh, outputs uh, in research papers, and our data were used in more than 40 uh, scientific papers published in independent peer-reviewed journals and uh, quite many international bodies um, get, get our data and they accepted our data. 
uh, what I'm proud to say is that uh, the birth indicators have, have been accepted by European Commission as the EU's indicators of sustainable development and also structural indicators, which was quite a huge output. And the data also are uh, accepted by Eurostat, uh, European U uh, United Nations, or for example, BirdLife International and other organizations. Um, maybe I would also mention that uh, the, the very good advantage of, a uh, very big advantage of birds are, is that the birds are really uh, popular among the people. So we can use them uh, also uh, as, um, they, they can spread the message, spread the word, because the people, the public uh, understand. So. My message is let's listen to birds. They can really tell us about the wider environment. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Elena. And uh, how can the private sector contribute to the uh, nature restoration? Uh, Caroline Jewell, uh, the Biodiversity Senior Manager at uh, Heidelberg Materials, will introduce it. Uh, her professional role includes also developing and implementing a company-wide strategy for biodiversity at Heidelberg Materials, and she is uh, active in uh, un uh, industry biodiversity working groups at European, but also at the global level. So happy to have you here. Thank you, thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for the invitation to come and, and speak. I guess I'm bringing a slightly different element uh, to the discussion than the, that we've heard so far. Um, I think probably private sector and nature restoration aren't, aren't always the words that you see together, but hopefully uh, by the end of, of my, my little intervention, you'll, you'll think maybe something different. So just to give you a bit of a background about Heidelberg materials, up until two weeks ago, we were Heidelberg cement. So if you don't recognize recognize Heidelberg materials, that, that might be why. So what, what is the company? We're one of the largest manufacturers of building materials in the world. Uh, we operate across five continents. We have about 3,000 sites. So from a biodiversity uh, perspective, that means we interact with a huge number of habitats and species. Um, and of course, uh, being a land manager, we have about 300,000 hectares. That means that we really need to understand what our impact is on, on the environment that we operate in. And uh, biodiversity protection and management has been a core part of our strategy for well over a decade now. Um, so in terms of, of, of restoration, so of course we have a lot of quarries. And what do you do with a quarry after it's finished? Well, there's a fantastic publication called A Thousand Things to Do with a Quarry. Uh, but today I will focus particularly on nature restoration. Um, and I just wanted, I've just got the one slide, I just wanted to share some, some pretty pictures with you um, to kind of show my point that, that, you know, anything's possible in a quarry. Um, and uh, for us, particularly restoration to nature is, is one of our, our key elements. Uh, we've been an active participant in the Society for Ecological Restoration for, for a number of years because, again, we understand that um, we're working in a natural environment. We, we have the opportunity to do land use change which is not always so common uh, as many forces are, are putting pressure on land. But we really do have the opportuni opportunity to take, uh, for example, agricultural land or commercial forestry and turn it into something which can really deliver for nature. And it's not just us. So if I, I kind of come out in, into more of a private sector and certainly the extractive sector, um, we, we understand as a sector that, again, quarries can provide an opportunity to put nature back. So um, in terms of the nature restoration law, we've been a big supporter. It's just about a year ago that we published a joint statement with BirdLife Europe supporting the nature restoration law and asking for bold, ambitious targets, asking for good governance. Um, because we see that you know, it, it, it's so clear to business now. We've had so many publications, whether it be what ITBES is working on, whether it be the Dasgupta Review, whether it be the World Economic Forum publications. It's really clear that, that you know, for business to succeed, we, we need nature. And this is very much where, where we're coming from. 
So, um, yeah, we've been supporting the nature restoration law, um, and when there were the delays uh, back in the springtime, uh, we also teamed up with SEM Bureau, which is the European Cement Association, UEPG, which is the European Aggregates Association, and Eurogypsum, to actually write to the Commission and say, come on, we, we really support this. As a business, as a business sector, we do support this no nature restoration law. So, um, in terms of, of implementation, so this, there are some really great examples, these are just a few, um, but also looking at how we can use our sites to, again, support some of the climate mitigation work. Um, we have a couple of sites where uh, we're actually a byproduct of a larger scheme, so uh, one in the UK and one in the Netherlands, um, both areas that have been heavily affected by flooding. Um, and um, various parties in that area came up with an idea to actually recreate the floodplain. Um, and how do you recreate the floodplain? What, what's in the way? What's in the way of sculpturing? Usually gravel, sand and gravel. Um, so we've actually been able to come in um, and support by extracting the, the sand and gravel and actually reshaping uh, the, the, the floodplain to allow for, for greater flood storage. So again, ways in which we can actually support um, the creation of, of some of these habitats. So I think just to... Um, just to, to finish up, you know, we're, we're a keen player in, in helping implement this, this law once, uh, once it's uh, adopted. Um, but we, are, we do face some, face some problems. So firstly, I think in terms of the implementation, implementation and the development of the restoration plans at member states, um, you need to involve business. You need to look at how we can actually support this um, and it not be like this. I know a lot of the... Uh, the policy and regulation discussions in the past, you know, business hasn't always been a, a kind of a, um, a, a trusted partner, but I think we've moved on from there, and I think particularly from our sector, we, we can contribute a lot. Um, but also for us to be able to, to maximize our, um, our, our contribution, there are some policy barriers that we need to get over. So in some of the member states that we work in, there's very strong uh, regulation that we have to put back what was there before. Um, and this actually can create the scenario where the active quarry is far more biodiversity rich than then what we have to put back, which for us as a company is, is actually quite disappointing that, that we've created all these beautiful, uh, you saw all the red list species that, that we can support in the early stages of succession, and then we have to eliminate this because of what's in the, in the policy. Uh, so that's one area, and, and another is, um, you know, again, there's often the requirement to, to go back, even including invasive species, which again, invasive species is, is one of the actions in our policy that we, we really take care of because quarries can be um, a perfect place for invasive plant species to develop. So to then have to put in robinia, because that's what the authorities have, have required in our reclamation plan can be very contrary to, to what we as a company want, want to do. So just, yeah, to wrap up, great opportunity from the private sector. Um, we're at a time when the private sector has, been, has never been so engaged with, with biodiversity. I think, you know, there's many initiatives, both at European level and, and certainly in the run-up to COP15 with, with Business for Nature, where business is actually lobbying for nature. And I think it's really important to capitalise on this when, when we get to, uh, to actually implementing some of these restoration law actions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Caroline. You can stay here. If you can stay already here, and I will invite again Alena and uh, Yannicka to the, if you can arrive, and we can start the panel discussion. Thank you very much again for all these three great presentations and for opening, uh, opening the issue. Thank you also for technicians for, for the light here. Uh, so um, please, again, um, ask your questions, raise your hands, but uh, first round I will, uh, I will ask uh, maybe to motivate you more for, for other questions. So I will start with Yannicka, please. Mm -hmm. um, 
You have been speaking about need for this utopia, yeah, for uh, what what is really needed. But there are, there will be many steps needed to to approach the the utopic uh, situation. Uh, do you think that uh, member states of European Union uh, will receive enough additional guidance and support for developing for the first step national restoration plans and then to implement it? Yes, I do, I do think. Um, we have to remember that restoration is not new. The nature restoration law is new, but restoration has actually been taking place for many years already. We have really great examples starting from you know, the 70s and, and so on. Um, so I think one of the key aspects is once we have the law in place, we have to learn from progress that member states already have made. Uh, we have what's called the IONET network. It's a network where we collect member states and also states outside of the EU, who are based in Europe, um, to, to support each other. And once we have the law in place and we know exactly what's required, we're going to start pushing this forward, having the IONET members helping each other so we can, we can take what's learned in one country, uh, lessons learned on how it works, and, and bring that, this to the other countries. So that's one way we can do that. And um, in, if the commission draft goes through as it's written now, we will also have more staff coming to the European Environment Agency working specifically on this. Great, it's great promise uh, to uh, have this support from EEA. Uh, uh, I want to repeat that uh, also uh, online participants can ask the questions on Slido. Uh, Eliška already said that it's this hashtag NatresConf, uh, it means N-A-T-R-E-S-C-O-N-F, like Nature Restoration Conference. So this under this hashtag on Slido, please uh, ask the questions to our uh, our part uh, our panelists. Um, if I can now go to Alena, um, you described very well this uh, monitoring system for birds and indicators which we can uh, obtain. But what do you think? Uh, uh, the, are the current uh, monitoring systems really enough for uh, monitoring? Uh, the success uh, the, uh, in the progress of uh, nature restoration according to the nature restoration law, please. Thank you for this question. Uh, definitely, I, I, am, I cannot be sure that uh, the monitoring which is running already is enough. Uh, in respect to birds, I think it is really well established and functioning and it brings outputs as we saw. Uh, but there are, of course, many other taxa, um, starting with the insects and um, soil insects, for example, and uh, other taxa. Uh, so definitely, I think we should improve the monitoring schemes also targeted to other taxa and even whole habitats across Europe or European Union. And what we definitely would need is to support the capacity because uh, even the monitoring scheme, the pan-European common bird monitoring scheme, which is running quite well for many decades now, is not supported well, to be honest. We are still are struggling with long-term funding, and in many European countries, uh, many member states, they struggle with lack of funding, lack of skilled volunteers, lack of professionals. So there is still a lot to do, a lot ahead of us, but I think it's achievable. We really know how to do it. We just need some more support to, to enhance uh, the capacity. Thank you, Alena. Uh, Okay, uh, I really hope that uh, all these costs for monitoring and all uh, other resources needed will be counted in, uh, the, in this one euro for, for every, which was shown uh, by uh, in the first presentation. And um, uh, please, um, the, the last question to Caroline, uh, the last question for now from uh, from my side, please, uh, and then we will continue from from uh, from uh, uh, from the public. Um, Please, Caroline, uh, you have presented a little bit uh, also the motivation of your company. Uh, why are you participating on uh, nature res restoration? But if you can say something in more, more in details about this motivation and mainly how can we motivate other companies to, to join us? Sure, sure. 
can I get that? There we go. Um, so I think for, for businesses that are land managers, um, it's easier to grasp. So we have um, direct risk associated with, with nature in our quarries. So for example, if San Martins come and nest in our, our faces, our extraction faces, you know, if, if we destroy them, we are breaking the law. There could be fines, there could be prison sentences. So we, we very much understand that, that risk. Um, at the same time, um, we also know that our next planning permission, our next permit, um, can be based on our previous performance. So we have a great example in Australia, um, which is probably one of our biggest restoration schemes in Western Australia. And um, the commitment and the success that we've had in this site has actually helped us get six other permits because they know um, that we are successfully turning um, degraded landscapes, um, it's, it's pine plantation. Once we've finished extraction, we have proven that we can actually recreate the, the original Banksy habitat. So, you know, for us, there's, there, there's a clear, clear business case. Um, I think it's harder for business that are further up the value chain. So when, you're, when it's your suppliers that have this direct interaction, I think it's slightly harder for them to understand why they have to suddenly start taking into account of nature. But having said that, the dialogue has changed um, immensely. You know, it was always about impacts. What are your impacts? And now the conversation has changed, and it's looking at dependencies. So well, how is a company dependent? Um, and this is suddenly, I think, making it easier for particularly the chief financial officers to start to understand that actually um, if, uh, if um, I think a great example is um, uh, if we have no pollinators, how are you going to get the, the food that you need to make, make your product? Um, but I also think it's very, sometimes it's difficult to actually grasp um, how nature can affect because it, it may not be on your, your direct patch. So, for example, um, if you're... Um, if you have, I, I don't know, if you have um, uh, an agricultural field downstream and forest is being cleared um, upstream on, on, a, on a hillside, um, and so that when it rains, the water comes off, fills up the, the uh, river and your, your field floods and you lose your crops, it's sometimes quite difficult to understand the actions further away can actually impact your business. So I think that's a message that, that needs to be um, detailed a bit more. But, but like I say, this, this talk of dependencies, I think, is, is very useful for, for those businesses that do not have such a direct interaction with nature as, for example, the extractive sector. Thank you very much. Uh, we've got the first question here. And please prepare for the others. And also on Slido. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Gaspar van Gutem. I am from uh, working for Aggregates Europe. Uh, the association representing the aggregates extraction sector in Europe. So I'm a colleague of Carolyn, if I may say. <laughs> and um, my sector is keen to see how they can contribute to biodiversity. And they have also recognized uh, experience in restoring nature in quarries. Uh, but my question is, what exactly uh, will be meant by restoring land in good conditions? In, in other words, will, which criteria will be used to assess the extent to which nature has been restored or not, because um, the monitoring techniques are very important for the local businesses, for the SMEs on the spot, and uh, they want to contribute, but they have to know how concretely, because when, when you have all the objectives laid out, they only agree, but sometimes the criteria are as important as the objectives. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, to whom oh, do sorry. you like to address the question? To, to Janissa, please. <laughs> Thank yes. you. Yannick. Thank you. Uh, yeah, we always make the crime of just uh, throwing around good environmental status without actually defining it. Um, this is something that has been defined already in the Habitats Directive when that was coming out. So that's the defi defi definition used here as well. So what is good environmental status will depend a little bit uh, from, uh, on, on how the country has developed. We're not looking at restoring to you know, pre-industrial ages or, or, or something like that. Europe has been quite heavily impacted by humans for a longer time already. So, so good environmental status, there's some country by country uh, definitions as well here. So that's what we're looking for. Thank you. Uh, does anybody else want to add something? No, not for the instant. No 
questions? Yes. Fortunately, we've got one now for the, in the Slido, and it's uh, oriented to Elena. Yeah, you already got your micro. So, um, uh, how can the environmental research projects uh, make better use of the citizen science? And how can we better encourage citizens to participate? Yeah, so it's oriented to citizen science. Thank you for the Thank you. Okay. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Uh, yeah, thank you for that question because it's really uh, a key message, one of the key messages here today from my, myself. Um, how can we use the citizen science? We, we need to distinguish uh, the different projects of citizen science because recently it becomes um, quite a fashion to, to incorporate the citizens uh, into the science. Oh, but it really needs to be science, which means it needs to be scientific. It needs to be based on scientific methods. Um, on the other hand, uh, also the non-professionals who are probably not able to follow strict methodology, uh, they are also important for us uh, because it's, uh, it's the public, uh, it may be the, um, the, the um, representatives of uh, opponents of some agricultural lobbies or forestry lobbies, also there are uh, the citizens among them. And if these people are somehow involved, they will, they will get in touch with the nature, they will uh, experience their own experiences with nature, they can become more helpful, they can understand us better. So if we involve them, I would say science is really important and we need to base our methods of science, of scientifically proven method, methods. Uh, but in this audience, I don't have to convince you that uh, once we publish some, some outputs in renowned journal, that you can rely on it. You, you would believe it because it's how it is. If we publish it in a renowned journal, we, we, we all believe it's fact. But there are many other uh, groups of people, public and, and the lobbies, who just don't believe science as we do. Mm -hmm. So we need to find some other way how to influence them, how to talk to them. And perhaps uh, birds are, again, good for this because they are uh, connected with uh, human emotions because um, a lot of people really like birds, uh, go birding. So we can, we can tell them, look, if you wish to watch uh, the green finches in your garden, you need, um, you need to start to behave in a different way, perhaps. Perhaps treat your garden in another way because uh, the green finches are in trouble. So perhaps uh, not only science, but also emotions and ma make it personal. Uh, involve the people more uh, in, in this personal way, let's say, could be helpful to, to get the message to, to the uh, broader audience, not only the scientists or professionals. Yeah, thank you very much. And please. Uh, yeah. I, well, I have a question actually for Caroline, if I may, because it's so rare to get to talk to somebody who implements these things on, on, on uh, the, the, the baseline level. Um, is there an example where you've had to, or your company has had to change a plan you have because of, of, of these uh, restoration projects or, or the laws governing? Is there an example that you can give that actually happened and, and you had to make the change? And what kind of change did you then make? Very good question. Uh, I have to rack my brain through all the reclamation plans that we have now. So um, it's, not, it's not preferred by the company to change a plan because there's a massive load of work that, that goes into that. However, um, given the nature of our quarries, you know, some might be 100 years old. So um, there we, we do, we're implementing a review process. So every five years, our reclamation plans are reviewed to make sure that A, they fit with how the extraction is working. You know, when we've had um, uh, kind of economic downturns, of course, we're not selling as much, so you don't extract as much. So we do have the re regular review to see um, how, uh, how the plan sits with our operations, but also how it sits with, with wider, um, wider legislation. Um, we have had the cases where um, 
plans have been changed, um, particularly from a more agricultural, again, if we, you know, 20 years ago, um, things just went back to what they were. So we have had the um, examples where we have been able to radically change. Um, and one of the examples on my slide was that should have originally gone back to agriculture and, and now it's a, a beautiful reed bed. So mm -hmm. there, are, there are cases and I think um, in those cases we have had a lot of support from uh, third parties. So we have a lot of NGO partnerships. Uh, we also have partnerships with um, botanical gardens, with universities, um, and we we need that support because um, otherwise, you know, why why would we want to change to have that that kind of reinforcement um, from from a body working in in nature conservation is is always very useful. Um, I don't know if I could come back on the citizen science. Okay, okay. So <laughs> yeah, no, I, I just want to say that um, f I, I totally echo from an engagement perspective. I, I think it's really fantastic, and, and we hold a few kind of citizen science um, uh, events within the company to engage staff within the company. Uh, we have you know, 51,000 employees. That's a lot of people to engage around the topic of biodiversity. And um, and again, birds has been a, a great way. We um, we have an annual bird race. Um, across the company, which engages people um, and gets people looking at actually what's living in our quarries, which gives us data. Okay, we can't create a scientific publication, but it does help us learn how to to start to manage these quarries to to support these species further. Um, and uh, we've currently got on our, our internal social media um, a kind of a bragging um, who can see the coolest bird in their quarry. Um, so again, it's it's a really good way of engaging, and, and they get the communities in to support them. So. Thank you, and uh, thank you for your dis discussion, and uh, Yannick uh, <laughs> replaced me for the instant, and that's great. Uh, I only want to react to Alena, because I think that there are also other groups which are playing with our emotions, and thank you, Andreas, that you uh, started before with, uh, with the fish, yeah, of course. Uh, it's also a great group, but not so good for uh, citizen science, that's clear. Uh, okay. Uh, if I can um, go ahead with these motivations of the private sector. Um, uh, so do you, need, do you think, Caroline, that uh, um, some support uh, from the member states, European member states, uh, can motivate more private sector? Can you imagine how member states can work with this, meaning ministries and state agencies? Yeah, no, definitely. So. Um I know when the nature restoration law proposals uh, came out in June, and um, despite the fact that the extract non-energy extractive sector have been supporting the um, the proposals, there was a lot of nervousness about actually what this is going to mean on the ground. Um, there's so much um, pressure on on land from various different um, different sectors, and certainly from ours, um, with with the it raised ambition of 30. 30 by 30 protected, you know, are we suddenly going to have then an extra 20% that, that we can't, uh, can't extract from? And at the end of the day, sustainability is economy, social and environmental. So there, there was a lot of nervousness. So I think, you know, going forward to, to make sure that the, the, there's a really good conversation between the private sector and the member states, particularly in developing the restoration plans at member state level, and continue this dialogue. Um, I think that that's, that's really, really important to have um, a very good spatial planning system that, that looks ahead, looks at how all the competing land uses are, are going to work. And then, of course, that will give, um, that will give the private sector some of the, the certainty that they're always, always striving for to know that we can, we can continue. Um, and also, um, the member states, one thing that hasn't been mentioned here is, is circular economy. The, the more we integrate circular economy into our business model, the less land we're going to need because we're going to recycle more. And um, I think you know other other departments, of course, the Ministry um, of, of Environment is the key one. But, but bring in other other ministries um, to ensure that that you know circular economy is allowed. Recycled content is allowed, for example, for us in concrete. Many member states um, have, have um, very limited acceptance of being able to have recycled content in, in concrete. So bringing all these together, I think, is, is really key. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, 
you can you can see that when ladies are here, how many questions we are dealing with, and we have enough time. So please, another question, Moimir. Thank you. Uh, uh, I am not an ornithologist, but I have a question to Alana. Uh, we have um, in Europe there is uh, uh, some nonsense, historical nonsense. We have uh, uh, Habitat Directive and Bar Directive. I still not understand why we have these two uh, directives. Isn't uh, time to make it uh, together to, to prepare a new law, let's say Habitat and Species Directive? Or why especially birds are so important to have a special directive? Maybe it was because uh, UK was a member of European Union. Now it is not. So maybe it's a time to change it. <laughs> Thank you. A little bit provocative question. Alena, please. A bit surprising question. Well, to be honest, I was not uh, there when those directives uh, were <laughs> published. And, and uh, so um, I am not sure if I am the right person to answer the question, but definitely birds are unique because we have such a big uh, body of knowledge about the birds and they do inhabit all the habitats and they, as I already said, can serve as indicators of the overall ecosystems. So perhaps this was uh, such a, s s the reason, but maybe Janika can, can continue. But what I would recommend is uh, less law and more practice. Yeah, Janika, please. Yeah, I was also not there. Uh, this was in 79 and 1992, if I remember correctly. 1992, I was already there, but I was 10. Um, but it, the, the Birch Directive, it, it, it was a starting point. And we have, in the Habitats Directive, we have an annex which lists habitats, but there's also a list of all other species. So it's not just birds that are important. We have a lot of species listed under the Habitats Directive that are gaining the same kind of, of uh, traction. It's, it's just a historical reason, more or less, that we talk about the Habitats and Birds Directive. They're commonly known as the Nature Directives together. So that's what encompasses all of these things. And to your answer, a question on, on why we don't make a new directive, uh, it, it's a bit of a um, dangerous process opening up these directives. Because if we open up negotiations we have already done and succeeded with and built on, there is a big risk that they will be weakened down. So this is something that we, we rather, uh, from a political perspective, uh, it's, it's, it's not favorable to do that. Rather build on the good basis we already have and come with complementing uh, laws and directing directives like the nature restoration law. Thank you, Annika, for this realistic point of view. <laughs> uh, Karel, please. Birds are important, of course, but for restoration, the plants are the best indicators. They don't fly, they don't run, they don't swim. So we can identify most of them rather easily, or even all of them. So for restoration, plants are the best indicators of the success or failure of restoration. Do you agree, please? I cannot disagree, definitely, but uh, what is the difference between the, the plants and the birds, for example, is that <laughs> sure, sure, but let me let me introduce another di difference uh, from the monitoring point of view, let's say. It's much more difficult to cover large areas and gather the data in long term because uh, for this you really need many, many more people than, than even we have uh, the professionals in, in Europe. We don't have so many professional botanists. I, I, I guess, uh, yeah, there are people who like botany and they are non-professionals, but I would doubt if, if they uh, can identify precisely the plant species. But perhaps why not? Let's, let's try to establish such a uh, pan-European monitoring scheme based on uh, 
citizen science and target it to plants, or maybe we can we can um, at least monitor some species, not all of them, but perhaps there could be some key species selected. Why not? Thank you. <laughs> well, I would, I would, Thank you for I would the want point. to argue that birds, Yannicka, are, uh, sorry, <laughs> birds are a little bit, you can call them a gateway drug. Uh, I'm sorry for the bad connotation here, but it, as you said, it's easy to get people in, in interested in nature things via the birds. I know a lot of people who then have started to, to become interested also in plants, picking mushrooms. Uh, it, it, it's really a starting point. And they are not plants, <laughs> that's not what I was saying. <laughs> But that's also, I mean, birds are the reason I'm a biologist, and that, I, I wasn't a bird watcher, but my father was. And the only way to spend time with the man was to go and join him when he was counting birds. <laughs> so I've been joining these, uh, these trips since I was three, and I, I didn't become a bird biologist, but I became a biologist. Thank you, thank you. We can, for the instant, finish this uh, monitoring and classification issues. Uh, even it's a very, very important issue and uh, it's a little bit funny because we have to return back uh, according to the questions to, uh, sent to Slido uh, to this implementation issues. So, so um, we have to discuss uh, the, um, the potential troubles in implementation and um, there is the question how to make uh, nature restoration law attractive for the food production business. So, any ideas? Sorry, can you repeat the question? Yeah, uh, how to make the nature restoration law attractive for the food production business? Hmm. That they understand advantages of the restoration, yeah. I mean. If I start off. Um, uh, it's about showing them the trajectories of where we're going. Where we're going if we're continuing in business as usual, and where we're going if we're doing something about it. And yes, systems have to change, they have to adapt, um, but that's inevitable. I mean, it's, the nature restoration law as such is not, it, it's sometimes seen a little bit as the villain in food, food production, but it's actually not. It's the solution. The villain is uh, overpopulation, overexploitation, um, climate change that causes environmental degradation. That's the villain. And, but it's, hard to, it's a hard concept to see, and it's sometimes much easier to point to a law that feels like yet another thing we have to do. So, you know, I would say to the food production that we need to work together on this. We need to see how, how we can change the business so that we can go forward together. And can we speak also about the real the business, so about the numbers, about the profit uh, in relation to, to restoration? Yeah. Alina, you wanted to say something, Caroline. Okay, so um, I think some of the, the global initiatives will help here. So I think the Task Force for Nature-Related Financial Disclosure is a really big instrument that, that will start to help this. When you start to realize what the financial risk of not having nature about, I think that's going to be a really big wake-up call. And for, for the food sector that's so reliant on the land, uh, on pollinators, on water supply, um, I think it's going to rapidly become very evident that we need a healthy natural environment to support their business and therefore we have to start restoring. Protecting is not enough anymore, we have to start putting back. I just, I just would add that uh, maybe the, the food producers are often afraid what happens when we in, implement uh, the nature-friendly agro-envy schemes or um, yeah, what will happen to our production and, and our money, let's say, easily. And uh, I could recommend conservation evidence, which is a great body of uh, evidence and of experience. Uh, and it shows uh, really nicely uh, how these schemes uh, involved in, in some farms, in concrete specific, uh, specific examples, 
how, how they affected uh, the production. And you'll see that there are many such schemes which really work and they don't, uh, they don't uh, the farmers don't lose their money. They can, they can manage um, as usual, but it was this uh, nature friendly schemes. So we really, again, we, we already know what works and we can look in, for example, in conservation evidence or um, elsewhere for, for the experience, look for the experience and yeah, see it, it, it can work. Yeah, so, so we've got enough uh, good practices, examples. Yeah. So. At least some. <laughs> At least some. Great. Um, another question is oriented to the, let's say, uh, resistance of uh, some landowners, uh, mainly um, powerful uh, associations of land landlord landowners, and especially in countries like the Czech Republic, uh, there is a broken relation to land uh, use uh, due to the collectivization. So, um, how to work with it? How to work with uh, resistance and um, this understanding? of uh, uh, landscape management. So um, one, one thing that we're currently looking at as a, a land manager with our partner BirdLife International um, is um, incentives behind having land for nature. And, and I think we can learn a lot from what's happened in the US with the conservation easements, um, where the landowners actually get um, financial benefit for, for having their land for nature. Um, and we're, we're starting to look at how, how that could potentially work in Europe, particularly focused on our, on our quarries. But I, I think, you know, um, uh, people always prick their ears at cha-ching. Um, so to have some kind of incentivization, I think, will, will certainly help, uh, help the discussion. Of course, there's a lot more behind, but, but that's one, one possible tool in the toolbox. Thank you. And any other ideas, please? Uh, I also think that once we get to the point of implementation, when we have the law, passing through and we start implementing this, it is crucial that the uh, na national restoration plans are developed in a, in a co-creation process together with the stakeholders, the local stakeholders. So this cannot be a top-down exercise uh, as such, but we have to bring the people together and, and have an opportunity to hear them out. because. Since the power of the implementation lies with the member states, they also have the power to decide how it's done in each member state. And I would really hope that all the member states take this uh, challenge seriously and, and listen to their people to make it a, a plan from everyone. And how can we prepare till the adoption of the law? You know, now we, uh, we have one year approximately. Yeah, we have the draft in place. It is pretty detailed. I would say that there's no reason to hold back. Um, if I would be were doing this work in a member state, which I'm not, but if I would be doing that, I would start gathering people, uh, NGOs, landowners, uh, other interest groups, business sectors. Um, in some countries, even the military needs to be involved and talk about where to restore and what to restore and start building this collaboration so that it is in, is in place once we have the law uh, adopted. Thank you very much. Alena, if you want to add something. No, no not for the instance. So, uh, the last question, please. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Svein Botvik, coming from the Norwegian Environment Agency. And my apologies for not being a member state of the EU. Uh, but a commentary to uh, Janneke. I think uh, every implementation of nature restoration must be based on sound science. And I give you one example, a warning example, from my home country, Norway. Uh, as many of you know, uh, the coastal part of Norway is the heaviest populated. Now, today, it is mainly heathland. In the very old time, when people started colonizing the Norwegian coast, it was a forest there. The forest was cut down for animals, and soon they wondered how to heat the houses in the winter. The only solution was peat. The peat in the Norwegian coast is almost gone now, due to these hundreds of years of burning peat. But then after the Second World War, some forester came uh, to the bright idea, now we want to restore the forest in the Norwegian coast. Fur grows slowly. Spruce will not stand the salty environment. So the solution was to go abroad. In Alaska, you find Sitka spruce. 
growing fantastically quickly and uh, nicely uh, tackling the harsh environment in the Norwegian coast. After 30 years, with uh, heavy reforestation, to call it that, even if it took 500 years, of the Norwegian coast, the spruce is taking over the environment completely. It's becoming a spruce desert. And now we are spending millions of Norwegian crowns to try to eradicate it. This was not based on sound science. So I really hope that the uh, EEA and other good uh, forces will guide this law when it comes into practice in 24 to base it on sound science, not to use invasive species. There are so many places in Europe, particularly around the Mediterranean, I know the Czech Republic have problems as well, with invasive species that really take over the native biodiversity and destroys more than restores. Thank you. Thank you. For sure, we have all worked not only with uh, good practice examples, but also with bad practice examples. Janika, please. I just want to say thank you for this example. It's a very sad story, but a very good story on what can go wrong, very much wrong. Uh, and science is, of course, at the core of everything we do. And um, I think I forgot to mention it in my list there on who to involve in the development of the plants because it's just so evident for us that science is the basis of this. And we're involved, for example, in, um, in Bioclima, in BioAdapt, in bi uh, Biodiversa Plus project, which are these projects to bring together scientists uh, around different themes. And I'm actually going in two weeks' time to Oslo to uh, join the Biodiversa Plus workshop there to learn about uh, um, that's nature-based solutions. So we are, we are following this and we are making sure that this is making us made in a sound way. Thank you, Anika. And uh, thank you all. Uh, we made uh, together with colleagues many useful uh, notes from, from this discussion about involvement of public sector and uh, also other stakeholders about the uh, need for methodological support, about uh, the evi uh, conservation evidence and financial benefits. And all these issues we discussed, we make the, the notes and we will summarize it. So thank you very much. Thank you for this panel, and I give a floor to the last panel section. Thank you. Thank you very much. So now we're really entering the very last hour, the very last panel of this PAC program, so I hope there's still some scraps of energy <laughs> left in you. Uh, we've got all great speakers prepared for this panel. There's going to be no keynote presentation nor any <laughs> shorter presentations, only opening speeches, and then it's going to be more oriented on the discussion. So I hope that you all will manage to participate both here in this hall or online using Slido with the <laughs> with the beautiful hashtag <laughs> netresconf. Okay, so we've got three gentlemen and one lady joining us for this fourth panel. And I would like to invite as first the lady. And the lady is Eva Wolfova who's now <laughs> talking to Jan, but please <laughs> come sit with me on the stage. So Eva, I believe that all of you know, but maybe there's a chance some of you don't. Eva is the Deputy Minister of Environment of the Czech Republic. And holding a degree in environmental protection, Eva has worked in the field of nature conservation, specialized in habitat mapping, Natura 2000 network, nature and biological assessments, forensic expert opinions, field service, and expert studies. So a pretty, pretty wide range. Here today to represent the perspective on the issue of a member state. So is there any opening statement you'd like to give us? Or uh, yeah, maybe there, there is. Uh, it, it's difficult to say something uh, new after this big uh, day full of information. 
uh, but uh, exactly my expert I, I am expert uh, in a role of politician today and uh, first I want to mention is uh, bridging from the first section from scientific uh, towards policy and uh, that's something what I brought to the ministry and I'm living every day uh, to promote science-based decisions and to a uh, little bit skip the policy as usual and these old-fashioned battles between politicians which are based just on ego and very low competence. And I want to be open and bring experts to the table and discuss everything and uh, really decide uh, effectively and uh, based on good, good knowledge and uh, um, decisions which can really solve problems which we are facing uh, because we didn't do it for a very long time and we need to change this. And this may be one uh, crucial issue. Another one is we uh, need to go to implementation quite quickly because we already lost a lot of time. Uh, we were many times very happy about new strategies and uh, like Natura 2000 later on water framework directive, um, later on adaptation strategy, biodiversity strategy and restoration law could uh, do some umbrella for all these issues and we can be I think quickly uh, thinking very deeply about all these issues, how to connect them and how to bring them to praxis to uh, really uh, influence local planning, uh, to build some policy of landscape, to coordinate adaptation, restoration, biodiversity, but also renewable sources of energy uh, to put them to, to really landscape because if not we are we would stay on the paper and we would have nothing so this is something very crucial and we uh, prepare the strategy of implementation and we have a lot uh, science-based uh, data for this and uh, we have habitat mapping all over Czech Republic so regarding article 4 for example we can uh, select uh, where we push our energy into and uh, where we start with restoration so uh, also during uh, negotiations and before the restoration law will be uh, fully adopted we can do a lot of preparations and time schedules and to address each article individually and to prepare tools for implementation Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. And as the next speaker representing the European Parliament's perspective on the nature restoration law will be Mikuláš Peksa. Please come join us on the stage. Mikuláš Peksa is a pirate member of the European Parliament from the Czech Republic. He is a member of the Committee on Industry, Research and Energy and a substitute member of committees on budgetary control, economic and monetary affairs, and tax matters. One of his key political topics, transferring the European economy into a sustainable and, ecolo and o Sorry. ecological model that will get us out of the climate crisis. Miklas, thank you for joining us today. And should you want to share any opening statement, we'd be happy to hear it. Thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, first, the opening statement is a disclaimer. I'm no expert in this field. Uh, I'm by training the biophysicist, so in this regard, I absolutely do rely on the experts, but I believe there is a full uh, hall of experts here. So uh, I think uh, most of the people are uh, better in uh, ecological uh, or uh, in the science regarding ecosystems than I am. Uh, my role is very much political. So politicians, those are the bad people who are supposed to say, this shall happen, despite not always knowing what is it all about. But I mean, like, this is our role, and that's what we are, uh, what we are here to, to actually do. Uh, when it comes to the uh, nature restoration law, uh, this is actually, actually a piece of legislation that was already uh, envisioned in, uh, some years ago. I mean, like, uh, it sets uh, state of play that we actually uh, came to the point that we are no longer talking about preservation 
but rather about restoration. Unfortunately, it is needed. Uh, so uh, I think there is now broader political consensus uh, going, let's say, behind uh, the, the Green Group, which I'm a member of. I mean, like, a disclaimer for those who are not following Czech or European politics, uh, pirates are part of the Greens IFA group within the European Parliament. But uh, there is a broader consensus on this issue uh, going uh, farther behind to, let's say, social democrats, liberals, as well as uh, the moderate conservatives, that something like that shall happen. I mean, like, uh, if you are following the, the Czech politics, uh, actually, you have probably realized that most of the parties uh, that are currently sitting in the government have stated to actually uh, impose or willing to impose such uh, such measures it's even like in the uh, working plan for the government so i mean like this is supposed to happen uh, when it comes to let's say the construction of what is supposed to happen i strongly believe there should be some let's say a general overview of goals what are supposed to to, to happen but of course there should be also like the implementation which means like a clear way how to measure the outcome and how to control whether the outcome is fulfilled because i mean like what we have uh, quite like uh, experience with so uh, are various forms of like greenwashing when the european institutions or the member states are actually uh, pretending that they have achieved particular like climate or environmental protection goal but in fact, uh, this is not happening in the reality. So the important part is also to make, the hap uh, make those things that are uh, scheduled or planned uh, to become the real reality. I mean, uh, now we are having a lot of discussions about because there is the proposal that came to the parliament, that came also to the Council of the European Union, to, to, to the member states. So now we have discussions in the both in the, in the institutions, and at the end of the day, we need to have a final like common ground for both of them to agree on. And I mean, like, uh, they're, they're in the process that, that this, is, this is really becoming political. How to make it happen that this is not only just a wishful thinking, but also a real concrete uh, delivery to the citizens and to the nature. Important indeed. Thanks for sharing. As the next speaker is coming to the stage, and I, I invite him to come, Stefan. Leiner, representing the Commission's take on its own proposal. Stefan Leiner is the head of the Natural Capital and Ecosystem Health Unit at the Directorate General for Environment of the European Commission. Stefan is dealing with the development and implementation of the EU biodiversity strategy, including the restoration of ecosystem, green infrastructure, business and biodiversity, the EU regulation on invasive alien species, and the EU pollinators initiative. Stefan, thank you for joining us today. And the same as for the speakers that addressed the audience here before you. Do you have any opening statement to share with us? Well, first of all, big thanks for organizing this conference. And I think one takeaway is that I'm pretty relieved that apparently we didn't get it too wrong in the proposal that we have made, <laughs> uh, because a lot of the issues that have been stressed today, what are the priorities going beyond conservation, but having a wider landscape restoration, the notion of urgency, the notion of combining co-benefits with climate, the notion of having a participatory process in developing the national restoration plan so that everybody gets involved, the notion of promoting monitoring and knowledge. Uh, I think, for example, the fact that we say that if an ecosystem is unknown, it is deemed to be not in good status will oblige member states to get better in getting all those unknowns resolved so they have a better incentive also to get uh, these, these uh, areas restored or the fact that we are trying to also uh, install a new monitoring scheme for pollinators or that we are using the bird monitoring scheme to set up very concrete targets to be improved on that. All of that will also generate more knowledge uh, throughout the EU and I could go on and on. So I think that is, uh, um, I think, important. I would say because I think the, the, the heading of our panel today is how we can generate uh, an engaging political and policy uh, framework and support for, for the next steps. Uh, and indeed, this is just the Commission proposal. Now uh, we are in the hands of the Member States and the Parliament. Um, and I think one of the key things is indeed political will and political leadership. And I would like to take this opportunity to thank uh, the Czech Presidency because I really they have showed 
excellent political leadership uh, since they, they took the presidency by uh, really organizing conferences, co-organizing conferences like this, by uh, steering excellently the discussions in the council. And, and I think that is one important, and I count on the next presidencies, the Swedish presidency, the Spanish presidency. Hopefully by then we will have adopted the law, if not then the Belgian presidency, to, to make sure that uh, this flame will be carried on uh, because they really did, did an excellent job there. So this is what I wanted to say as introductory yeah. remarks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining with, uh, sharing with us. Last but not least to join us is Ariel Bruna. He is the Deputy Director and Head of Policy with BirdLife Europe and Central Asia. Ariel coordinates work on a wide range of policies, ranging from nature and biodiversity conservation to climate and energy, fisheries and agriculture. In recent years, he has played a leading role in advocacy around the European Green Deal or the EU Biodiversity Strategy. Closing this series of opening speeches, if you have any, but I hope you do, <laughs> Ariel will present his view of what now is crucial. Thank you. Well, you, I guess uh, quite a few of you have uh, heard me this morning already, so I won't bore you further. And, uh, and I think we, we, we've, heard, uh, we've heard the story. But in a nutshell, uh, my conclusion also from this day is that we have everything we need to get going with this big challenge of nature restoration. Um, we have the science. Science is never enough, and it keeps moving. Uh, we have the experiences on the ground. We have um, engaged stakeholders on anything from uh, grazing farmers to uh, extractive industries and so on. And we have a very good proposal on the table from the Commission. Not perfect, but very good. Um, and by the way, it's an opportunity maybe also to thank you, uh, Stefan, also um, personally. Um, we, we know that you will be soon moving to, uh, to f further challenges. Um, but I think uh, you, know, you, you are leaving behind a, a very robust um, uh, proposal. Um, one of the questions before was uh, about, you know, uh, the, the kind of this, why do we need a birds directive? Is it because of the Brits? And obviously it's not, you know. Um, we need to think about uh, this as a building that we've started building quite a few years ago. Now, the nature of buildings is that you build the first floor and then you add the second floor and then the third floor. Um, the idea of blowing up the building and restarting with something new, I think this country has tried a regime that had that kind of logic, and usually it didn't build very beautiful buildings <laughs> at the end. So, um, so let's, stay, let's stay focused. Um, you know, we have an edifice where we've had the Birds Directive, then the Habitats Directive, then the Water Framework Directive, a bunch of other bells and whistles, and now there is this uh, next level that we need, which we need for the reasons that we've heard today, and we need to add it. Uh, but we need to get it right, and we need to get it fast. And to do that, we need, first of all, to get the politics right, and the politics are going to be complicated, and I guess we'll talk about it uh, in a moment. Uh, some people don't want this law to happen. Let's be very clear about it. There might not be uh, many in this room, but we have a big job in convincing European society that this needs to happen. And then there will be another big job in actually making it happen so that it doesn't stay on the table. And there, there will be very, very big challenges uh, where the biggest one, from my point of view, is really the logistics of it. If we want to do things that are not tiny, but that they are really big, then there is a question of how do you coordinate the different stakeholders and the landowners and different institutions and different uh, policies and channel the funding. And to do that, we need to start inventing new ways of doing things. Thank you. Thank you for your perspective on that. So now for the debate, I will kick it off with a few of mine questions and then we move 
to the questions submitted online. There are two already, and they're actually pretty explosive. So <laughs> let's start <laughs> with something still <coughs> explosive, but a little less. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. And I encourage you further to submit more questions. There will be plenty of time for them. Okay, Mikulash, let's start with you. Um, mm. You know, there's a war still raging in Ukraine, which has been driving various crises, and it has it had come only after the COVID-19 pandemic had peaked. So, um, to what extent are political priorities in Brussels now really focused on environment? Well, uh, of course, if you look into the, the, the top level summits of the uh, European Council, you will find the war and the energy crisis as the uh, top level issue because it's uh, obvious that it affects uh, literally the wallet of every citizen in Europe. I mean, this is something uh, which is very important in the uh, term to, uh, or in the, let's say, short term, we need to end up, uh, or we need to survive this winter to be precise without being frozen and without being uh, without starving that's that's the task for for now however uh, this winter will not be uh, uh, it will end at certain point of time and then we will again have the discussion about how to continue and nature is actually something which exists on this planet for quite some millions of years and it would be very nice should it uh, continue in existing for at least some millions of years uh, farther on uh, so generally, uh, we will need to, uh, to resolve also other issues, which are maybe not that much now stressed in the uh, TV uh, news, however, are also very important and uh, will affect our life in long-term perspective. Uh, for that reason, a lot of people still are working on this particular law, despite are not being like mentioned in the media, but still are working on that to uh, make it happen. So if you ask me, uh, is it, let's say, the top level headline things? It's not yet. <clears throat> but I mean, uh, from the long term perspective, it very much makes sense to work on it. Ariel, Stefan, anything to add on this? Well, just to add that, I mean, all of those crises are linked to each other. I mean, we know that, uh, you know, the COVID pandemic has been made a lot worse by air pollution. We know that the next pandemic is probably going to come from intensive agriculture. Um, had we done the right environmental policy in recent years around renewable energy and energy efficiency, maybe there wouldn't be a war in Ukraine, and certainly we would not be in the deep whatever where we, where we are today. So, you know, the reality is that those uh, interact with each other. And to bring it to nature restoration, just look at the kind of tragicomic situations where we had this summer, where we had an energy crunch, and then, you know, Germany at a certain point declares that they will go back to use coal, and then they couldn't use the coal because there was no water in the river to float the coal to the power plants, and the power plants, including the nuclear ones, had to be shut down because there was no water in the river to, uh, to, uh, cool, to cool them. Yeah. Had we had more water up in the pit bogs and, and so on, well, it would have been a bit better situation also for the narrow short-term energy issue. So it's not just an issue of the short-term uh, emergency that shouldn't distract us from the longer-term emergency, but even on the short-term emergencies, the faster we start dealing with the ecological problems and the more resilient we will be to this crisis and the next crisis. And unfortunately, you know, the cartoon we've seen before, I mean, the crisis will just arrive uh, you know, thick and, and, and fast. I may add, uh, I think there is a lot of uh, myths and actually fake news going around the proposal that we have proposed. And one of them is, for example, that this will uh, really uh, enhance uh, the food security crisis and it will stop uh, our capability to produce renewable energy and to actually face uh, the consequences of these crises. And I think a conference like we heard today 
helps very much in addressing those, uh, those wrong assumptions because we have heard it again and again, and I think we need to repeat it again and again, that the best, the best security against these crises are healthy, resilient ecosystems. And it is absolutely not true that uh, restoration is about taking everything out of production. We have heard examples of, uh, of close to nature forestry. I mean, this was invented by foresters from an economic perspective because they have realized that it's much more better to have many species you can choose from, to have much <coughs> more composition, to be less dependent on one species if there is a new crisis or beetle or whatever, all of your investments are gone, uh, that you actually have to invest much less in planting and pruning, but you can sell just the big wood. So there is full compatibility between restoring forests and having long-term sustainable economic income from forests. Same with agriculture. If you want to have produce vegetables and others, you need the pollinators, you need the landscape features, you need healthy soils, you need to restore ecosystem. And we heard so great examples uh, that, that, that actually it helps the local farmers to have a long-term future if they, if they have these kind of restoration measures that restore the grasslands, etc. So I, I, I really think that is a big myth that we need to counter, that restoration is about taking things out of production and having less of a sustainable uh, productive future. Same with renewable energy. There's, yes, there are trade-offs locally, but through integrated planning and through doing the right things, you can have more renewable energy production and more uh, uh, nature restoration going together. There are some great life projects where, for example, they have built up the transition lines and under this they recreated uh, grassland habitats and that is a perfect combination of renewable energy and restoration going hand in hand. There are many, many others uh, that, that, that we can learn from. When talking of the member states, there are basically two main issues coming up. That's the, you know, the ambition, the ambitious timelines of both submitting the nature, uh, the, na the national restoration plans, and then the funding. So let's go with the funding first. Um, we can probably all agree that the proposal is ambitious. And we can probably also agree that it is a valid concern by at least some member states that they will need sufficient resources. They should also be included in the national restoration plans, the sum. So um, how can the member states ensure they have the sufficient funding? Good question. <laughs> we wait for new financial tool from European Union. <laughs> um, but for sure, um, a very uh, strong financial tool is already existing. It's CAP, uh, Common Agriculture Policy, and we just need to uh, do it properly to, to uh, shift the aim of Common Agriculture Policy to, to the care of landscape and to biodiversity targets, so it's clear and it's already happening. Um, then, of course, we, we use live projects as, as strong best practice examples, and um, uh, we need to mobilize the green taxonomy and, and all this uh, money which are supposed to, to go to nature and to create some new economy. Uh, as well as uh, business is starting to be much involved in, in this topic and uh, create new funding for, for biodiversity, for uh, restoration adaptation measures. So I hope we handle that, but of course it's ambitious. Stefan, is there also any another role to be played by the European Commission? Well, first of all, I, I, I really contest this idea that there is not enough money available. I think we have a new budget that is one trillion euros over this financial period. Um, and I would recall, and we on top of that have next generation EU, which I think are 800 billion uh, euros uh, to, to be spent to recover from the economic and financial crisis that came from that. And all of that should 
30% um, of that should be done for climate mitigation and adaptation and 10% by the end of the financial period for biodiversity. This is a huge amount of money that should be available for exactly investing in restoring nature, for exactly what we want to do. So in principle, I think when you just look at the EU budget, there is enough money because we have seen how much these things cost and they're actually not so costly. So, uh, but sorry, but maybe so the, the question problem was, is it's that not about the amount, the problem but maybe is what the reorganizing. Do do? Yeah. Exactly, what yeah. do we do with that money? And, and how can we stop spending that money for issues that only have one uh, objective and rather divert that to issues that uh, help us in addressing this multiple crisis that we have. So investing in uh, restoring nature, in restoring people, and so we can address both the biodiversity and uh, the climate crisis and even create jobs by doing that or restoring when we have all these uh, regions in Europe that have been based on coal mining where we need a transition instead of transitioning into another industrial idea uh, or, or, or then tr we, that we transform them into living landscapes where we have a combination of modern uh, industry plus uh, nature and there are examples for that in the Ruhrgebiet and other parts of Europe uh, which really much more better living conditions for the people, more income generation. Uh, I think these are the kind of transitions that we should use all these instruments that are there in, in funding because as we have shown in our impact assessment, I think it was done uh, also shown by one, one uh, presentation that every euro invested in nature gets at least eight euros, if not much more, in return on ecosystem services, etc. Yes, Miklash. If I may just add, uh, yes, it was said that there is enough money uh, by means of share of the actual money that are in the budget. Uh, it's already like quite ambitious, uh, but when it comes to the absolute terms, it should be always remind it, that the European Union's budget is under normal circumstances just one, just something uh, like one percent of its GDP. I mean, if you compare it to, for those living in Czechia uh, with Czech Republic, Czech Republic budget is something like 35% of GDP. Should we compare, for example, with Spain? Spain uses in its budget something like 50% of its GDP. So, I mean, like, whenever you have heard that European Union is, so to say, socialistic, it's absolutely not the case because the money are just like ridiculous compared to budget of normal member state. What have we done during the COVID crisis was that we have really, for first time, used sort of like a common debt and get a little bit of money to actually mitigate the crisis itself. Now we are uh, effectively in the war in the Ukraine, and I think when we are in the war, I think it's justified to use that type of debt to actually mitigate the crisis or the problems. And I would honestly, just uh, speaking personally, I would consider that option because uh, maybe we are just counting the money, but the environmental impacts are something which are uh, not that easy to be counted into the money. But as you have heard, it's five times, uh, five times bigger impact of what you invest uh, on, on the outcome. So I would consider this option to be open. Now I think we have already warmed up, so now on to the explosive <laughs> questions I was already mentioning. Uh, sorry, I have a question concerning this particular topic oh, of okay. funding. No. Uh, so, uh, yeah, my name is Paolo Litera, I'm from Ross NGO, and I have experience as I presented from the field with uh, restoration of uh, habitats. Uh, uh, I would like to ask uh, concerning this discussion uh, of uh, funding and funding sources. So it was outlined that there are some mechanisms already existing and some budgets already existing. Uh, but uh, from my practical experience, for example, the structural funds or the operation programs, although there is a large bulk of money, uh, were not very effective in terms of practical conservation of uh, uh, habitats in nature. Uh, so, uh, and uh, in many ways also the agricultural policy may not be that, that effective if it's <coughs> not set properly. So I would like to ask, like, uh, how can we assure or how can we path the way so that these mechanisms can be uh, used properly and used effectively uh, for the real uh, restoration of habitats? Because I think this is a challenge and so Yep, I would like to ask something like this. 
I, I take it. <laughs> or Stefan, so... You want? Sorry? Um, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah uh, I think we, we need a lot of networking everywhere and any level. So it's again about science, about uh, uh, transferring the knowledge of science to implementation level, uh, to the uh, state fund for operation programs and, and to to control it much better. It's, of course, uh, it, it happens. Uh, uh, I'm uh, very sad about it that, that uh, many of projects are not uh, implemented in very good way, and uh, we have to do everything to improve it. I think that it's everybody's responsibilities, uh, responsibility in any level to, to help this change, the, to, to improve it. Yeah. Yeah, um, there's a lot to be said around it, but to, to narrow it on what we can do with the restoration law, uh, because a lot of those problems are really problems of governance at EU level, at national level, and, you know, a lot of our states are not functioning very well for, for a variety of reasons. But if we look at this law, I think there is a very strong case for um, doing what the Commission didn't do uh, in this law proposal, which is adding an article that creates an obligation for an EU co-funding of the restoration effort, so that with the next budget we can create a proper restoration fund. Um, we have seen the incredible impact of life, of the life uh, fund, with tiny, ridiculously negligible amounts of money, uh, you know, the life spends uh, more or less what uh, the CAP claims back on mistakes. So it's tiny. Anyone that has been involved in nature conservation in Europe knows what different it has done. Imagine if we had something that took that logic but made it a lot bigger. And I think this would play a huge role in also catalyzing the national funding in, in a variety of ways. So I think that's part of the answer in the law. Another part of it is when the law describes the, the planning and the governance, it really needs to say some very clear mm -hmm. things about the obligation for the member states to uh, reorient perverse subsidies. Uh, and about clarifying how they will fund the restoration so that they don't just make plans uh, in the air. The issue of reorienting funding is so important. I mean, when I go hiking on the drained pitlands of the Ardennes that I mentioned this morning as generating floods and so on, I still see people planting spruce, which will never be harvested. The, the old spruce are all dying around it, and they still plant spruce, and they plant it with public money. We could give them the money to plant better things, or even just to sit back and watch the, the native forest grow back. We could pay the same money to, you know, de-drain the land, but surely not. So uh, the, that's another thing where this law uh, can make a difference. And the last thing that where this law can make a difference, and it's again linked to how it describes the implementation, is thinking about new models for catalyzing action. Because what we see, I think, you know, the examples you have seen this morning happened because you were there with the LIFE project to talk to the farmers and talk to the administration and make things happen. If you do not have that local level entrepreneur that makes things happen, things just do not happen. Now, how do we create this kind of entrepreneurship uh, is a huge question, and I think is one where this law c could, could help. If I could react on that, I mean, first of all, I think the Commission is committed to co-fund this thing. So I'm not sure putting something that is already happening in a law adds a lot of value. Having said that, I, I think you really address a very important problem. And, and what, what I also myself don't understand is that we know that there are so many good examples out there that work, where um, environmental authorities work together with the agricultural authorities, where the, they work both together with the local NGOs and the local farmers in order to develop schemes 
that are win-win for everybody, where the farmers themselves had, uh, we called it result-based payment schemes, where the more biodiversity they had on their land, the more money they got from the cap, uh, and, and, and they control themselves, they are, they are involved themselves, they are engaged, and, and it works very well. Why did we not manage to, to make that the main thing that should be supported by the cap? I don't know, I have my theories, but uh, <laughs> I think it's linked to the fact that uh, who benefits from the current uh, architecture we have and who is deciding on it. And, and I think there are indeed some broader governance issues, but working together in trying to promote those uh, things that work for everybody and, and, and convince them through that the, 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 the decision makers that this is really what we have to go around. I also want to say that um, a nature fund is certainly something we, we need to think about, and, and it's being also agreed by the nature directors in the Strasbourg Declaration that this should be looked into, but we should not, there is a danger there that then, for example, those in charge of agricultural funding or operational programs in regional policy, that they then say, you have your fund, leave us alone, because that is our fund for agriculture. And we will not get there if we continue with these silo approaches. I think it has to become an inherent objective of the common agricultural policy and the funds, to give you one example, to promote those activities, as it has to become an inherent uh, DNA of uh, city developers, of uh, land use planners, of uh, those doing reconstruction of areas, to invest in those restoring uh, nature projects and, and not see this as something different. And, and I think that's the trade-off we will need to think about a lot in, on one hand, how we can strengthen things like life, which undoubtedly were, were essential, but also not lose the fact that we need to make biodiversity and nature restoration an inherent part of the wider policies we have in the EU. Let me ask one question from the uh, audience to this, yeah. Well, first, is it done? Yeah. So first, congratulations to the organizers. Well done. Practical, hands-on, as it should be. Great, great topic. My name is Michal Nikvasil, and I'm working for the European Commission, DG Climate Action, now in the service of the government for the, uh, the Czech government for the, the presidency. A few comments on this topic. On the small scale of life, sure, yeah? But let's not forget, and it was not mentioned, we have also the horizon, uh, ho the new horizon, 2020, mm -hmm. and the missions, yeah? A lot more, lot more money for instance, within the mission on climate change adaptation. Sadly, so far, no major Czech region expressed its interest. So maybe not always more money is fine, but we have instruments that we have not been using. Second, uh, second note or comment. The current situation actually, in my opinion, is very favorable for the implementation of the nature restoration law. When, if not now. Yeah, the invasion to Ukraine and the impacts of climate change have shown it clearly. Yeah? We doing conventional or industrial agriculture is super risky because chemical uh, fertilizers are not available or very expensive. Water is not available or very expensive, etc., etc. Forestry, monoculture, wow. What if it's much more expensive than any invest, most risky investment on the, uh, on the stock take, yeah? Drought, climate change impacts, drought, bark beetle, all the weather extremes, of course. And the reply, what is the reply? The reply is sustainable agriculture. It's sustainable forestry management. And this is exactly what the, and now coming to the common agriculture policy and the new strategic plans make room for. Since much more power is given to member states, it will be very different. In some countries, more room, in some, some less. But as of, and this I think we should say clearly, all across Europe to farmers and foresters, as of 1st of January, you guys who have said rightly that whenever you do something for nature on your land, in your forest, you are punished economically. You cannot say it anymore you should be rewarded or, or at least be on equal terms if you do a pond on your land, if you revitalize a water stream, if you do 
uh, resilient, resilient forest. And I think this message should be really spread yeah, uh, around. And with this, we'll be able to create opportunity. And of course, this will not spread to all the uh, uh, arable land and all the forests, but people will come with examples. And this is what matters, examples that will be shown to others how we can do agriculture, how we can do forestry, so that we help restore uh, the nature. And I'm sure like that will be picked up qu quickly by, uh, by many others. Thanks. Thank you, thank you for the comments. And please let re let's receive it just as comments as we don't have that much time left and we need to address other issues as well. And so before Pavel stated his questions, I was actually preparing to <laughs> ask Eva the one that really, it's, it's repeated, so we should address it. So, um, what stops member states from having so low ambitions that the legislation as a whole won't matter? That refers to the fact that a lot of the agenda is left to the member states, so. What stops uh, member states from what, ambitions? What stops member states from having so low ambitions with the nature restoration laws, with the bids that are left for the member states to, I don't know, the favorable reference area, for example. <laughs> so. What stops member states from having so low ambitions that the legislation as no. a whole won't matter, that it won't change anything? Um, I hope we, we will have high ambitions and uh, we, we will continue in the previous strategies because they are only boosted by, by uh, restoration law. So we are already bound to many of those issues and we just continue in them. So I, I cannot really reply. Why. It will depend on each member state. Uh, now we feel that they uh, comply with, with the aims of the restoration law. Maybe I will redirect it to RL for a minute because usually an NGO stops. <laughs> The state. So, um, and no, I, there are some safeguards left to NGOs. I think the, the, the I think the question is is a very valid one because uh, it's not a secret that the EU is very good at agreeing common rules and common objectives, and it's quite lousy at ensuring that those are actually implemented. Just look at things like the Birds and Habitats directives, where after 40 years, you've I mean, heard Vera earlier, you know, six Natura sites out of 3,000 and whatever are actually managed. It's a joke. And this is starting to become uh, a crisis point that is threatening, frankly, the existence of the EU and the social cohesion of the EU. Because it's not just with uh, biodiversity, it's not just with the environment, it's across the board. And it breeds cynicism, and it opens the door to populism when people see their ministers going to Brussels and making big promises and then coming back home and doing the opposite, and the European Commission kind of wriggles its hands and doesn't do much and so on. This is completely toxic. And we have started seeing the damage that it's, that it's doing. Now, those governments and those uh, members of parliament that care about preventing this continent from sliding into chaos as all those uh, uh, crises pile up and become more and more difficult to manage, they should think very carefully about how do we start agreeing rules that will actually be followed, not rules that will make us look good in the photo op and then we can start forgetting about them. And that's where things like, you know, what powers you'll give to the commission to control what the member states will do, because sure, you will do wonderful, no doubt about that. Are all the 27 member states going to do wonderful all the time? <clears throat> right? So if we want to be a club of democracies, we need the rule of law. And the rule of law is under attack everywhere. So, you know, 
in this specific case, we are writing a new law, you are writing a new law, make sure that that law is enforceable. And that passes partly through giving the Commission the possibility to say no to your plans, not to just politely comment on it like with the CAP, but to actually say no. Targets that allow the Commission to take you to court if you are not honestly pursuing them. Nobody likes being taken to court, but you know, it's like speeding tickets. You know, the city is safe to walk in if someone is policing the rules. And of course, when you get a fine, you hate it. But living in a place where the police doesn't give fines is not a, place, a good place to live. Access to justice, making sure that we as NGO can go to court mm -hmm. to enforce the law if in the hypothetical improbable situation in which you would not be doing your job as well as I think yeah. you will. <laughs> Mikolaj, you seemed you wanted to add something before yeah. Ariel, or? <laughs> uh, maybe just, just, just like uh, uh, confirm what was, what was said. I mean, like I've been participating in some, some negotiation between the parliament and the council of the member states. Generally, the pattern is always the same. The parliament comes there. There is, let's say, a list of ideas how to ensure what we want to achieve and what are the mechanisms to actually ensure that it will happen. And then the member states, uh, especially certain part of them which have like governments being f famous for doing that, always come there and try to water down <laughs> whatever you propose because it would be violation of national sovereignty, as it is often recalled. Uh, and at the end of the day, you very much end up in the situation when you have like a general like blah blah and no real like meat on the bone to to actually fulfill what was what was requested i mean it's a repeating pattern uh, that happens in almost like most uh, of the fields that the council is effectively like weakening all the uh, all the uh, measures that are supposed to resolve anything so i mean like that's a repetitive pattern and it happens yes if i may add um I think what will stop member states of reducing the ambition is you. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think it's the scientists continuing to put the right facts on the table. Our joint research center, they have actually looked at all the scientific evidence that is there about what is the relationship between nature restoration and food productivity. Clearly, scientists say it's a positive relation. So again, I, I repeat what I said before. It's. Um, the businesses. We have a European Business and Nature Summit next week where we will discuss with key CEOs on how they can themselves commit to become nature positive and what are the tools available. And we see more and more businesses. We see the World Economic Forum uh, saying this is one of the biggest crises towards uh, our global economy. So I think it's really uh, having also the private sector engaging more. It's the environmental NGOs continuing to do your, their job. And I think it's all those people on the ground to generate these sort of partnerships that we uh, start to get rid of these uh, silos that think that farming and nature conservation and restoration are opposite objectives, that forestry and nature conservation and restoration are opposite. I think one of uh, someone said that 99% uh, common agreement between those when you really look into that. And that is, I think, what will uh, make governments realize that it's not in anybody's interest to lower the ambition of the Commission proposal, on the contrary. Okay, one more online question. We will move a bit once again. I'm sorry. <laughs> and, but I think, Mikulaj, because it seemed you wanted to say something, so n now you'll get the floor, but with a slightly different question. But I would think it aims at you. Can we restore nature and solve the climate change when the system is dependent on exponential economic growth? and when global emissions and material consumption correlate with GDP. In other words, when the GDP is the measure of success of the society. Well, GDP is an important statistic, but it's just one single number. And there are a lot of other numbers that are actually relevant for our society, whatever it is regarding social impacts, regarding environmental impacts, and so on. 
uh, which we shall take into the account and currently our, uh, our let's say, uh, way of uh, creating budgets or auditing whether the budgets were spent properly are not taken into account. I mean, besides of, uh, besides of working on this industrial agenda, I'm working also in the budgetary control committee and we kind of like managed that not only like the budget, like the total total uh, re result of uh, spending money is being taken into account, but also a lot of other parameters. I mean, like we are asking, for example, the European institutions, how many solar panels are they going to, uh, or have they put on the uh, put, uh, on the roofs of the of the building uh, in the last year? I mean, like this is this is very like uh, concrete question about like how do they work on energy efficiency when we are talking about energy efficiency, of course. So I mean, like. Uh, uh, all together, yes, we should uh, we should think about like economic growth because at the end of the day, citizens are expecting to uh, have decent lives, and that's that's very much important. But it's not the only thing in this world. Anyone any comments on that? Maybe just very shortly. I think that you know the limits of GDP as a measure are well known. Uh, GDP was born to measure basically the taxable part of the economy in order to fund the war effort. Unfortunately, it's still a relevant question, but the idea that we've transformed that into the universal measure of everything is an absolute nonsense. And I think that even in you know the mainstream economists and so on have, have understood it now. Um, but what I find more interesting for this debate is that we clearly need to reinvent our economy. Uh, not just because of the economic crisis, but because of the changes to the world economy and so on. Um, the idea of moving to the circular economy, I think, has become uh, mainstream now. Um, most wise people understand the logic of you know, moving to circularity. We need the same uh, mental change around nature restoration. We need to start thinking about nature as an infrastructure, taking it as seriously as we take other uh, infrastructures. We need to start thinking about it as an economic opportunity, as a source of employment. At the moment, nature is still seen, unfortunately also in parts of the Commission, as an obstacle where the economy is concrete, with apologies to the friends from uh, Heidelberg, uh, you know, building stuff, is the economy, nature is an obstacle to building stuff. We need to get out of that logic, and, we, and I really hope that this law can help us start thinking about building nature, and building nature as an economic activity, as a way to revitalize regions, and so on and so forth. Stefan, another question, if I may. What is your take on how the negotiations on the nature restoration law are proceeding? Well, I think they are proceeding very well, thanks to the guidance of the, uh, of the uh, Czech presidency. I think some colleagues <laughs> in the room. Um, at the moment, we are mainly going through the text in the Council Working Party of Environment to clarify uh, a lot of questions that obviously the member states have. Um, and I think um, I'm, I'm pretty optimistic that it will be possible uh, for example, by the end of the uh, Swedish presidency for the Council to adopt its, uh, its, uh, its general approach. Um, obviously, there are some concern on the ambition of the proposals by some member states, some of the issues we discussed, how, how are we going to finance this, uh, um, how we can really make sure that it will happen, what are the instruments we have to, to make sure that we have more green spaces in urban areas, that we also have non-deterioration outside Natura 2000 sites. There are some concerns on, on some aspects of it. Overall, I think there is a strong commitment that indeed or a recognition that business as usual is not an option and that uh, we, we need such a law in order to, to get things done differently, but there will be discussions on, on the content. I think in the parliament, I mean, Cesar Luena uh, is the rapporteur and, and I think here all also there from what I heard that the work is starting. He was also 
also the rapporteur of the biodiversity strategy that the parliament very much welcomed. And I would actually uh, specify that when you look at the nature restoration law, it basically makes a lot of the targets and commitments we have in the biodiversity strategy become reality. Uh, in conjunction with other aspects, for example, the law on the sustainable, the proposal on the sustainable use of pesticides uh, regulation and many other aspects. But, but this law, if it's adopted, if it's implemented, will make it happen that we achieve the targets, many of the targets we have in the biodiversity strategy. So I would very much expect also uh, the parliament to, to, be, to, to, to really welcome the ambition uh, that, that is in the, in the commission proposal. But obviously, we will count on people like you to, to make this happen. And, and, but I'm quite confident that under the guidance of uh, Cesar Luena, that, that will process also very, very well. And when would you expect that arriving at any agreement could be possible? You can maybe give us an optimistic and a pessimistic scenario for the timelines. Well, as said, I, I think it should be possible for the Council to have a general approach by the end of the Swedish presidency, but you never know. This is, of course, we have to see how this works. And I also heard that it's the ambition of uh, the rapporteur to have uh, the parliament's uh, position on that also by the end of the summer of next year so that the trilogues can start uh, still uh, yeah at the second half of, of next year and if everything goes well uh, in theory the law could be adopted by the end of next year and then enter into force uh, in the beginning of uh, 2024 i think that is uh, a scenario that is possible but at the end, it's something from experience that is always very difficult mm. to predict what will really happen because it depends on a lot of things. Without political will from all sides, it will be difficult, this is clear. So it is really important that uh, there is a strong mobilization uh, of everybody in, to in order to generate that political will that, that will be necessary. Now we've heard in the panels in the first panels, as well as in this one, that the level of ambition, the overall level of ambition of the proposal is pretty high. But on the other hand, we also heard that it's not a top level priority right now among the few issues that are. So um, what would you expect? To what extent will you need to eventually step down on any of the factors included in the proposal? And what will still be enough? And I leave that up to you, who's gonna answer first. I would maybe yeah, start, flash, yeah. I wouldn't step down. <laughs> I wouldn't step down because I believe uh, there is something, in Czech it's called resortism, I'm not really sure how to uh, literally translate into English, but uh, very often it happens that the governments, they are parallel doing stuff in the, let's say, transport and in the environmental protection or, let's say, military or foreign policy and environmental protection. Yeah, those are uh, usually usually quite like, uh, like distanced fields. So I'm uh, pretty much aware of the fact that now everybody is focused on the foreign policy and is talking about the foreign policy but it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to stop on the environmental policy. You can do, you can do, and there is effectively nothing, nothing hindering you. Just please do it. And uh, from certain point of view, uh, I think it is, it is sometimes better, especially when you recognize that there are some people who are very much focused on, let's say, military spendings and foreign policy and stuff like that. Uh, it's better them, uh, to have them distracted, not to involved in the environmental protection, because then it's easier to work. Yeah, yeah, if I may, I mean, yeah, for the yeah. Commission, it is a political priority. And I will recall that when we were adopting the biodiversity strategy, which is very ambitious, I think we all agree on that, we had the COVID crisis. And there were voices out there that said, it's not now the moment with this COVID crisis to come up with a new ambitious biodiversity strategy. Nevertheless, the Commission was convinced in listening to science that told us that 
resilient ecosystems are essential to uh, also combat and to prevent those crises happening in the future. And I think all of us who were in a lockdown, uh, when the first time we were allowed to go back to nature, we realized how important nature is for our mental and physical health. And that was the argument for the Commission to nevertheless, a few months after, to say we come up with that proposal. And the same happened now. Yes, at the moment where we were about to adopt our proposal, you, the, the Ukraine uh, war uh, started and obviously uh, the first reaction of the Commission was uh, hang on, let's focus on that first and, and there were a lot of things to be done. But uh, two or three months later we came up with a proposal which I think you will all agree that was uh, very much the same ambitious than before the war had started. Um, so it showed that the Commission uh, is really thinking that the Green Deal will not be put into question by those crises, but on the contrary, it's even more important to continue with, uh, with implementing the Green Deal to not water down our climate, <coughs> biodiversity, circular economy, pollution, all the kinds of other elements of Green Deals. It remains the key priority of this Commission. This I can assure you. I'll, I'll just have a plea to banish the term ambition from uh, this kind of conservation. You know, uh, ambition is when someone wants to become a movie star, so he's ambitious. This stuff is about survival and, you know, what is enough for us to survive as a society. That's not an ambition. <laughs> uh, and, and I think, you know, this proposal uh, is adequate, you know, not ambitious, so, and, 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 and words uh, matter. Just to uh, have a word of, if you want, a kind of uh, s s self-criticism, um, I think that uh, we as uh, environmentalists, whether it's the NGOs or even scientists that uh, are involved in, in ecology and so on, we need to mobilize and mobilize a lot harder because uh, the people on the other side are mobilized. I mean, let's be very clear, it's not like everybody wants to solve the crisis. Some people are making piles of money out of the crisis and they are very happy to keep making money out of it until we are all dead. That's the reality. And those people have names and addresses in Brussels, they, they own whole buildings, you know, we won't name them now, everybody knows who they are. So. If we want this law to go through, then we need to get our act together and make sure that the public is breathing on the neck of the politicians, because ultimately that's what's going to make a difference. I think that as BirdLife and some of the other colleagues here, WWF and so on, we will be trying very hard, but we really need this to happen in the member states, not just in Brussels, but in the capitals. Eva, you seemed you wanted uh, to react yes, as well. Yes, um, biodiversity and climate crisis are existential threats, and as such, they need to be addressed. So, of course, um, I think it's not so much about nature. It will be probably quite happy without human. Uh, but it's about our survival, uh, and uh, we are under some transformative change, and by restoration law, we um, built a bridge towards more sustainable future, and it's an offer. And uh, of course, we need to attract more and more people to uh, get to real local solutions and to, um, uh, to uh, stop these unsustainable um, policies and, and so on. So uh, I hope this is possible. At least we are clear doing our best to try, at least try it. Uh, it's great for me to, to sit here and uh, to be part of something so positive uh, and transformative and peaceful as well. And at least it, uh, it helps our uh, um, psychical uh, resilience. So we have to do it and keep in it. Yeah. Arriving slowly in the very last minutes of this panel, we should probably address the marine ecosystems, since they tend to be <laughs> overlooked Neglected. a bit, at least <laughs> in the Czech Republic. <laughs> so, um, Ariel, we heard in one of the previous panels 
that nature restoration cannot succeed in the environment without change of the fishing policy. I think Vera Coelho addressed it pretty uh, clearly. So where should this change begin and who should do it? Well, I think Vera explained it very well. I mean, the way we have, uh, you know, if the law goes the way mm -hmm. it has come out of the commission, nothing will happen at sea, nothing. Just like nothing is happening with Natura 2000 at the moment. Because you are in this bizarre situation where if you want to restrict fishing, and if you don't restrict fishing, you don't do marine conservation, you don't even ensure a future to the fishermen. Because, <laughs> you know, if you want to fish, you need to have big old females that can lay the eggs. If you fish them all before they breed, they, you don't have it. So uh, today, for a member states to restrict fishing in a protected area, in a, in a restoration area, they need to ask the permission from all the other member states that are fishing in the area, who have zero incentive to say yes, and then they, they discuss it for 10 years, which is what has been happening, and nothing happens. Now, this creates a clear uh, nonsensical situation where you have one law that creates an obligation and another law that prevents this obligation from uh, being met, which is not good lawmaking. We have here the opportunity to put in, uh, in the restoration law an article that simply says, without changing anything in the CFP, we probably need to make changes to this, but it's another story, but simply that says, you know, if you need to restrict fishing in order to do uh, marine restoration, you go to the other member states, you negotiate with them those famous joint recommendations, but if within a year you do not reach a consensus, then you can act unilaterally, maybe with a commission control, just to ensure that you are not kind of doing anything dodgy as a member state, and off you go. And then, you know, the CFP stays there, but the, 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 the restoration law can still work and have impacts while using the tools of, of, of the CFP. It's actually fairly simple. Um, you know, Council and Parliament need to step in and the Commission needs to say yes. I mean, otherwise, half of the restoration law is still born. <coughs> Well, since we basically have no time left and there are still so many questions online and also here on my list, I would like to ask you as the very, very last task for today's conference, if you could give me just one brief take-home message. I know it's, <laughs> it's a hard discipline, a really hard one, but I want you to give you, you know, a chance to give us the last statement as we have no time to go through all the questions and there are really many more. So, Ariel, maybe we can start with you. My take home message is that we have all the building blocks that we need. Now we need to generate the political momentum and the political will. Great. Stefan? I would say that um, I would just say what <coughs> one of the undisputed most renowned polit uh, scientific bodies we have, which is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. In their report, that they, the last report that they issued in February, they said that we have a very, very small window that is rapidly narrowing in uh, addressing the climate crisis that we have, both when it comes to mitigation and adaptation, and one of the key tools in order to do that is to restore a uh, degraded ecosystem. So it's now or never, and we have a very short time, so please, Council and Parliament, don't drag this on forever. Uh, <laughs> adopt it quickly and make sure that it, is, it remains adequate, not to use the, name, the word ambition. Nikolaj, please, a lot of pressure on you. Uh, so the take home message would be, well, we have all the scientific evidence we need, so let's just make it happen. And Eva? <laughs> um, keep in networking and let's cooperate in, uh, together, res restore nature uh, for our survival. That's clear. Okay, so that was Ariel Brunner, Stefan Leiner, Mikuláš Pexa, Eva Wolfová. Thank you for joining me for the last panel. Thank you.
and thank you thank in you. the audience and also online. And I would now like to invite my colleague for today, Honza Duše, who will actually introduce you to the very, very last few minutes of this day. Yes, thank you very much. And I've got also hot news because uh, the resolution of, uh, on uh, nature uh, restoration, restoration law was just adopted by the Czech Senate a hour ago, so that's good news. And um, let me to invite here um, for as a, the last uh, uh, speaker, uh, Andreas, uh, and uh, to make closing remarks. So please, the floor is yours. Honza <laughs> asked me to summarize everything. I'm not going to make the mistake of standing. Um, I think the last remarks we had were, were the perfect ending. Um, nevertheless, maybe go back to review uh, the day um, just briefly. I won't take more than 10 minutes. Um, and before that, let me just say I'm very pleased to be here. I spent 10 wonderful years of my life in the Czech Republic in Prague, not too far away from here, in Shishkov. And uh, it's great to be back here. Um, and I've been informed, educated, and also inspired by today's uh, session. It's not very often that I get to, to sit and to learn uh, as, I, as I did today. Um, main conclusions. Um, we're in crisis. I'm thinking of uh, Yanitsa's picture of, of, the, of COVID, uh, recession, climate change, Ukraine, <laughs> before that, uh, climate change, and then, of course, the biodiversity collapse. Um, Rudy, or Greta, you can't nego negotiate with ecosystems. This is about survival, Ariel, Eva. We need transformational change. We have no time to wait. As, Mi as Ladislav Miko said, we do it because we need it, not because it is a political goal. And we need to keep that in mind as the frame for everything going forward. Uh, Commissioner Sinkovicius, I hope I got that right. In the face of challenges facing us, we need to move full speed ahead and not stop, but move full speed ahead. Can you put the light on? Makes me feel less alone. Um, we need to move, move full speed ahead also on the Green Deal. Um, and then um, maybe also worth mentioning uh, is this holistic approach that uh, Ladislav Miko mentioned, working at the landscape level, bringing together the different elements uh, the panel, the, the first panel, scientists, uh, became very clear. We have enough knowledge. We have enough data. Scientists can help to set the priorities and help understand the processes, and then they can also benefit from the feedback from the implementation of the projects. What was very clear also is restoration is a good uh, investment, at least a return on investment of eight euros, if not more, uh, per euro. Provides real value for money. Uh, it can also have. Uh, co-benefits, for example, carbon sequestration. We had some very convincing uh, um, uh, information about peatlands, especially, but also agricultural land, soil. At the same time, as, as Rob pointed out, it's not a panacea. Um, there are limits to that, and we have to focus on biodiversity and then the uh, advantages um, in terms of climate, um, uh, carbon sequ sequestration. Michael Hoshek gave us a, an overview of the restoration law. Um, and mentioned or pointed out the focus on habitats, not on sturgeons or bison, but on habitats, which of course will benefit from that focus on habitats, and on the majority of habitats that are not in good status um, today in, in the EU. Uh, the targets are ambitious but achievable, as we heard from Yanitsa. Uh, and uh, thanks, Rudy pointing out it's good that the proposal is here. It's an utterly, utterly important signal, and I think you're absolutely right on that. Um, there was a lot of emphasis on integration that is needed. Uh, Vera Kolho uh, mentioned uh, that the nature, nature restoration law will fail if it does not include fisheries in the common fisheries policy, and I think the same can be said for the common agricultural policy uh, and the forest strategy. We heard some, um, some um, progress on that front. But also beyond this, beyond forestry, beyond uh, agriculture, beyond fisheries, uh, we also have to think about the bigger picture, um, the circular economy, resource efficiency that was also mentioned. If we need less resources, we need less land, we need less 
nature. Um, that brings us also to engagement, the need to engage and to bring on board relevant stakeholders, including fishermen, including farmers and foresters. We have positive examples of, from agriculture, also business. Um, we need to look at the benefits for them or the incentives um, that they get. You know, so that it's, it's, it's a two-way street, it's not just a one-way street uh, a discussion. Um, but also we need to engage with stakeholders to, to win their trust. As, as Rob said, know your enemy and he will become your friend. I can say from my own experience that that is true. A basis here is, uh, I think, back to our point of departure, which is awareness and understanding and awareness of, and of our reliance on nature. For farming, for forestry, for business, we need to highlight our dependence on nature and the interdependencies. It's, it's not a trade-off between nature and agriculture, as we heard. Uh, it's both, and they need to be taken together. You can't negotiate with ecosystems. Again, Rob. The real risk for farming is the collapse of ecosystems, as, as Ariel pointed out. And as uh, the commissioner uh, mentioned, restoration of nature is an insurance policy. There was some discussion about need for funding. Is it enough? Too little? There is a lot, but there's big issues, of course, around how that is actually used, whether it's actually used for the right things. And then, of course, there's the question of uh, perverse use um, of, uh, uh, of money as well, which is then detrimental to nature. But also mentioned was not just resources, but maybe even bigger bottleneck, which is the lack of capacities, human, technical. We have to invest in education and training. So in conclusion, I guess my last six lines before I say some words of thanks. We are in crisis, code red. We need transformational change, including on nature. It can be done. We have what we need. It needs to be done now, together possible. That's my summary. Now some words of thanks. Um, so this discussion will continue, I think, hopefully for many of us and the field trip tomorrow, which I'm very much looking forward to. Um, but I'd like to take this opportunity to thank, again, the Czech Ministry of Environment and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, the National Museum, which has given us this wonderful, um, this wonderful uh, premises. Uh, first time I've been able to be here, where the Federal Parliament used to be and Radio Free Europe used to be as well. Um, also, Refugium and Cesko Moravsky Stierk as sponsors for their support for this event. I'd also like to thank our fellow organizers, uh, the Česka Společnost Onatologická, the Czech Society for Ornithology, including Zdenik Vermošek and his team, also BirdLife Europe. Uh, thanks, Ariel, um, and your colleagues uh, for your cooperation on this. Also, my colleagues from the WF European Policy Office. I'd also like to give special thanks to my Czech colleagues, Lenka Fritschova and our, uh, our Czech program manager, and Elžbeta Procházková, our agriculture ex expert, and Michaela Kuralova, our communications officer, for their work in organizing the conference. Um, Lenka and Elžbeta, I see you in the back. Can you just stand up for just a moment so people who know who you are? Because I'm going to say something. The applause goes to them, but also to the BirdLife colleagues very much, so it's uh, not limited. But the reason I wanted them to stand up is because um, some of you might be surprised that there are Czech pandas. Um, that is a species that, though not limited to China, has not been sighted here um, for or any time recently. So I guess I need to make a, a word of explanation, especially for those of you who will not be at the dinner t uh, this evening. Um, Indeed, to date, the pandas have not been native to, to the Czech Republic. Um, WFCE and our pre predecessor organization, uh, the WWF, the Annual Carpathian Program, we've been engaged here for more than 20 years, I think, um, but always working through various, uh, from time to time, and whenever we have worked here, it's always been through uh, local, uh, local partners, Cheso uh, Peveronica, Nuti Duha, Friends of the Earth, Czech Republic, uh, the uh, Czech Protected Areas Agency um, and others. Um, and on, on issues from introduction of Natura 2000 to identification of ecological corridors, spatial and transportation planning, etc. We're now stepping up our engagement uh, in the Czech Republic to a certain extent uh, with our small team 
two of which you see here, the other one is somewhere online, um, and, um, and a strategic partnership with Beleco, uh, the expert organization in nature conservation. So I just want to take this opportunity to also thank uh, Jana Moravtseva, she's not here I think, but also her, she's the director of Beleco and also her team at Beleco for the great cooperation. We're going to be focusing our activities in the Czech Republic on areas of priority for WWF, where we think we have a real added value. There are a lot of excellent organizations doing fantastic work in this, in this country. I think more in this country than anywhere else in the region, which is part of the reason why we have not been more active here so far. Uh, but there are some areas where I think we have some added, added value, and that's on policy, for example, this event today. Um, also on um, uh, plugging into uh, international projects and initiatives. It's a shame that the Czech Republic hasn't been engaged. Uh, but then it's also engaging with other sectors, especially the private sector. And relevant to this is uh, a conference that we will be organizing two weeks from now, on the 26th of October, also within the Czech presidency of the EU. Uh, we'll be organizing that together with our partners at Tesco, the retail uh, chain. Tomorrow's Living Planet report, spoiler alert, will um, also uh, underline yet again that our food and our agricultural systems are the greatest driver of biodiversity loss on our planet and also substantial contributors to climate change. So food is a key challenge. That event is going to be about sustainable food and agriculture systems, so I hope you can join us for that. Finally, in closing, I want to thank you all for your attendance, uh, for your active participation. Like I said, it's not very often that I get to just sit and learn and be informed and be inspired. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, but more especially, I want to thank you for your efforts uh, to address what we've been talking about, your efforts on behalf of nature and, as we heard from Eva, actually on behalf of, all, uh, of us all, our futures. Um, I ended my remarks this morning with the success story of the European bison, which, thanks to dedicated conservation efforts, also here in the Czech Republic, have returned from the brink of extinction. Fortunately, this conservation success story is not unique. There are many others like that. Um, and that they can give us courage and reason for optimism. So let's work together to bring more species back from the brink, more habitats back from the brink, Let's work together to restore nature, together possible. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andreas, for the summary of the day and for the closing speech. We've got two issues to share with you. Yeah, but the first one really just being, you know, a brief summary of what we tried to do today because it wasn't about coming up with any conclusions yet, but about bringing up ideas, new points of view, maybe arguments that could be used or maybe that could inspire people who are or will be anyhow involved with the nature restoration law proposals. So that's just the message we wanted to give you as the last one, and then one organizational detail for tomorrow. Yes, uh, you are all invited again to the field trip tomorrow. Uh, we hope that many of you will participate, and uh, uh, if you are interested in the agenda of the field trip and um, uh, issues connected with the field trip, it's on the paper with the agenda, uh, uh, and you can take it on uh, on the registration table. So please uh, use the uh, use the, um, uh, the instructions which are written on this on this paper. And that's all, I think. Yeah. Thank you for coming. Thanks to all of the organizers. Thanks, Jan, for <laughs> joining me today for this adventure. And have a beautiful rest of the day. Thank, thank you, Elishka. <laughs> thank you all. And thank restore you. now. Yeah. <laughs>